If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshack True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And Massel Powers. And if you are looking for a podcast that goes deep, completely comprehensive, exhaustive, and logical exploration of true crime and mysteries, you have come to the right place. Today we are taking a look at the extremely mysterious case of missing person, Emma Philippoff. And this was actually requested from a patron, and patrons do get priority. So if you're not a patron already, check out our patron page. You can check the description. And make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the podcast, feel free to also donate to our PayPal. And any questions, comments, theories, requests, or discussion of any kind, just leave them in the comments section. And you could also check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. All right, Maxwell, have you checked out the Fifth Estate episode on Emma Philippoff? It's actually quite extensive. Yeah, I saw it. It's pretty, it was pretty good. So... For those that don't know, Emma Philippoff is a Canadian woman who has been missing since November 28th, 2012, after last being seen officially from the initial case. We'll be going over updates and new sightings and all of that. So from the original story, she vanished from in front of the Empress Hotel in Victoria, British Columbia at the age of 26. And so it was pretty bizarre. Everything from uh, mental health issues to foul play has been speculated, as well as family issues. And in typical mind shock fashion, we will be examining every single avenue, leaving no stone unturned in this bizarre case in an attempt to find out what really happened to Emma Philippoff and checking off red herrings as well as other coincidences like many cases have. So the other interesting thing is that she was actually interviewed by police shortly before going missing. So between 7.15 p.m. and 8 p.m. on November 28, 2012, she was in the vicinity of the Empress Hotel. So the police were interviewing her after someone reported her strange behavior. Her van, a 1993 Mazda MPV, was found in the Chateau Victoria parking lot with almost all of her belongings in it, including her passport, library card, digital camera, clothes, a pillow, assorted ornaments, laptop, and recently borrowed library books. It is believed she used the van as storage. She spoke with Chateau Victoria staff at 7 a.m. on the morning of her disappearance. Okay, so we're going to do a quick overview before we dive deep. Philippoff actually arrived in Victoria in the fall of 2011 from Perth, Ontario. She was briefly employed at the Redfish Bluefish Seafood Restaurant in Victoria's Inner Harbor. And she worked there as a cook. Since the work was seasonal, Philippoff left the job on Halloween, October 31st, 2012. She assured co-workers she would be back in the spring. In what police believe was preparation to move back to Ontario, on November 21st, Philippoff hired a tow truck driver to move her Mazda from Sook to the Chateau Victoria parking garage. Unbeknownst to her family, Philippoff had stayed at the Sandy Merriman House Women's Shelter on and off since February. On November 23rd, Philippoff was captured on security footage at the Victoria YMCA, entering, then leaving, then entering multiple times, as if possibly avoiding someone on the outside. And we'll be going over that footage as well. In the days preceding her disappearance, Philippoff had phoned her mother in Ontario asking if she could come home. Each time, her tone would quickly change, and Emma would then ask her mother not to come. On the final call, her mother became aware that Emma had been staying at the Sandy Merriman house, and even though Emma had asked her not to come, she made plans to fly out immediately. Emma's last words to her mom were, I don't know how I can face you. 
Emma's mother arrived at Sandy Merriman House at about 11 p.m. on the 28th, three hours after Emma had been last seen by police at the Empress Hotel. You know what's really heartbreaking is if she had just missed her because Emma was in the area. Early on the day of November 28th, Filipov had been captured on a 7-Eleven store video on Government Street purchasing a prepaid cell phone. The video showed her hesitating in departing the store, seemingly checking the street outside. She returned to the 7-Eleven to buy a prepaid credit card for $200. Reportedly, she left the Sandy Merriman house at about 6 p.m. that day. Soon after, she hailed a taxi and was asked to be taken to the Victoria International Airport. However, she soon exited the taxi for lack of adequate fare, even though she had the $200 prepaid credit card. She also had a bunch of money in her bank account. We'll be going over the details of that ride in a moment as well. Also, it seems like she left her passport in the van, but... Anyway, minutes later, Filipov was seen walking barefoot in front of the Empress Hotel. An acquaintance of hers, Dennis Quay, called 911 to say a woman was in severe distress outside the hotel. Victoria police arrived, took Filipov's name, and spent 45 minutes speaking with her. Deciding that she was not a threat to herself or anyone else, they released her. You know, it's interesting, though, in watching the Fifth Estate episode on this it seems like police asked her if she was suicidal which is seems kind of strange because would a suicidal person admit they were suicidal they would quickly jump to deny i would think and then they also asked her if she was homicidal did you catch that how often do police just walk up to people and ask you you know are you feeling homicidal well they don't they don't say they don't say it like that but they say like are are you thinking about hurting hurting yourself well in the fifth well in the fifth estate in the fifth estate, they specific, they seem to have specifically said they asked her if she was homicidal. I don't know if they were paraphrasing, but that's what they said. Which struck me as kind of odd if they weren't paraphrasing, if they were simply saying the police asked her if she was homicidal. I don't know. That would be kind of strange. But yeah, you're right. Well, in the, in the, in the news, like they can't say, oh, they, they asked her if, they was, if she was going to hurt herself. Or like they want to be formal in the news, I think. Like you, you have never, you never say, you never hear on the news. Like um, the police asked if she's gonna hurt herself or others, but they did not. She denied that. Like she, the the news will always say if she was decided suicidal or homicidal. Like they have to be formal on the news. But the Fifth Estate wasn't quite the news. It's a documentary. But I mean, I guess, I guess, I I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. They might have not asked her like that, but that, also, that was the also, first. Also, also, I, I would say, uh, I would say, like suicidal people are like not in their right mindset, and they're kind of like screaming for help. And for the most part, I would say, I'm not, sh- not really. Sh- this is just my guess. It's not like research or anything. But I would say about like seventy percent would say that you know, you know, yeah, have you thought about hurting yourself? Yes, they would say like they would acknowledge it. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Because it's uh, they were they're not in the right mindset, so they are they're willing, they're they're internally they're screaming for help. So like finally someone's listening to them, and then they say, "Yeah, I'm thinking about it." You know. <laughs> yeah, I guess I've just seen too many where where I because most interactions probably they might say that yes, and then nothing ever happens with it. You know, they don't actually do anything, but. They well, I think I think I think if they say yes, I think the police is obligated to um, uh, what do you call it when you take the person, um, detain or detain, or take like, them take them to the hospital or something. Or yeah, yeah, that like yes. they're obligated to say that. So because if they yeah, I can go, see that. Yeah, yeah, police, it's a legal. The police will be yeah, obligated yeah, to. it's a legal obligation. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, so no one reported until the recent report and new witness, which we will discuss. Until that new witness came out, no one reported seeing Emma since 8 p.m. that night. Later that evening, police met Filipov's mother at Sandy Merriman House. By midnight, Emma was classified as a missing person. That's pretty good. I don't know what the Canadian laws versus U.S. laws are, but she got her classified as a missing person within hours. I mean, that's really good because in the U.S., she's an adult. So in the U.S., wouldn't they need 24 hours or something like that? 
I don't know. Uh, is that how it goes? Well, usually you have to be missing for 24 hours if you're an adult, as far as I know. Mm. You can't be reported missing. And sometimes they even do that for non-adults. But, uh, or 17, I, I don't remember. I remember certain cases where the police just did not want to do it until a certain amount of period, period of time had gone by. So, so uh, the Amber, the quick response Amber alert only, only uh, applies to non-adults. So if you're an adult, like they wait for like 48 hours or some shit. I think it's 28, uh, 24 hours, I think. Mm. Yeah, it should be 24 uh, hours. Wow. Okay. <sighs> That's interesting. I mean, well, it, it's funny if we, if we take on the Amber alert system for the adults, the, like the overwhelm and uh do you know what i mean <laughs> of the yeah. system is just gonna get messed up <laughs> uh, yeah but but it'll save a few lives i guess but you know it would probably save more than a few because the first 48 hours are the critical hours so even if, if you got a 24 hour head start on that i would say it'd probably be more than half of the cases i would say twice they'd have twice the success rate at least if not more and also if like let's say uh, i've gotten amber alerts on my phone um what if like i get adult alerts too and it's like constant <laughs> yeah man i think and, i think who cares about who cares about i mean okay well what, what, what i'm saying is like if it's a if it's a constant thing people start to ignore it i'm just saying i don't know we can move on though yeah i know but isn't it worth it for the people that could be um i i'd like to say yes i'm just saying like i'm thinking of all sides right here you know yeah yeah it's worth it for everyone's uh you know nuisance and to save a few lives I'll put up with it, I guess. <laughs> that cow kind of suck. <laughs> yeah. So originally, you know what? What other? What? What? This seems to be a blunder by police. Police reported that Emma was with friends several blocks away on Burdett Avenue between Blanchard and Quadra Streets, but apparently that was not true. So, but then they left it on the police website for a while, despite Shelley's request, Shelley's her mother, that it be removed. So it's kind of weird. I'll go over some more specifics with that, but that's what was initially reported, but it appears that was either false or something. But investigators explored more than 200 leads, turning up minimal information. Most evidence indicates she was planning to return home to Ottawa, but there is no proof that she ever left Victoria. The cell phone she bought had never been activated. Filipov's credit card was allegedly found on the side of the road near the Juan de Fuca Community Center, north of where she disappeared. It was found by a stranger whose use of the card to purchase cigarettes was tracked by police. Filipov wrote copious prose about her time in Victoria. None of it indicated that she was being stalked. Even though some of it indicated she was depressed, experts who appeared on the Fifth Estate said the writing did not have the hallmarks of suicidal ideation. According to Filipov's mother, however, the Sandy Merman staff claimed that Emma required both physical and medical intervention. And there were also some speculation that the family might be involved, and we will be going over that as well. In March 2016, Filipov's mother and brother were charged with money laundering as well as drug and weapons offenses after an OPP investigation. Shelley Filipov insisted the charges had nothing to do with the disappearance of Emma, saying the one has nothing to do with the other. In November 2016, all charges were dropped against Shelley Filipov, clearing her of any involvement. And I believe that's because the brother pled guilty. And part of the deal was if he pled guilty, uh, Shelley would not be charged. So what do you make of that? Because from what I read online, some people kind of brush that off and say these were they kind of went into some criminal activities to try to afford to pay to continue to search for Emma. Because if you were the parent of a missing person, if your child was missing, regardless of their age, you'd do anything you'd do anything to try to continue the search right so i don't know i mean she did say one has nothing to do with the other i'm not sure what she was implying there but it seems like to me that's not that shady unless you can prove that the family was involved with this illicit drug activity years and years prior so i don't know what did you make what do you make of that um i think it was separate like yeah 
It's so you think like, you think like the way she said it? I I um. Do you think they were trying but, to raise but, money? But it's a good point. It's a good point. Like, oh, okay, that's a good point too. But um, but you're saying like it could have been happening years before, and if that is true, then she could have been involved in that. Well, not not Emma involved in that. Like Emma might have been too scared to come home because if she knew her mother was some kind of drug dealer involved with bad people, especially if that had been going on during their childhood. I didn't get that impression. To me, it seemed like the brother may have possibly been into this stuff by himself, and the mo- and he might still be innocent too. He might have just done that to clear his mom because it was a big mess and he couldn't get out of it. I mean, we've gone over how the justice system works. I mean, the Canadian system, I'm sure, has its own intricacies, but it seems like it's fairly common to make that kind of plea deal. However, if if they really were just raising money any way they could to try to get more money to search for Emma, I mean, can you hold that against them? I don't know. I mean, it's that's a little different. So anyway, uh, in the summer of 2018, a witness named William came forward with new information about encountering a woman the morning after Philippoff's disappearance. The woman matched her general description and demeanor. The report resulted in the organization of a search of the View Royal Area of Victoria in December 2018. The search turned up no additional clues, but another search is planned for 2019. Victoria Media drew information from Kimberly Bordage's podcast, The Search for Emma Philippa. Before this, the leads had been tenuous. The Campbell River Courier Islander newspaper reported in May 2014 that Gastown, Vancouver business owners Joel and Lori Sellen witnessed a man in their store throwing out a $25,000 missing persons reward poster for Philippoff. The pair reported that the man said, it's one of those missing persons posters, except she's not missing. She's my girlfriend and she ran away because she hates her parents. The owners immediately called the police. Although security video captured an image of the man, he has yet to be identified. All right. So based on just this initial overview, what is your opinion of what happened to Emma Filipov? So obviously she had that stalker with when we'll be going over coincidences dealing with him. And apparently she could have had another stalker. She was distraught. She had. She could have had mental issues. She could have had a psychotic break. She could have committed suicide, or as one of the experts on the Fifth Estate said, pseudocide. So basically, she wanted to run away, possibly making it look like she either committed suicide or whatever. What What's your initial impression of this case? A lot of clues lead to mental illness, paranoia, um, just the way she looked outside, and like it could have been just paranoia, not necessarily people actually following her. Well, you do know, you do remember from the Fifth Estate that one guy did admit to stalking her. So, well, I, I remember that letter, but uh, but wasn't that wasn't that past though? Like, wasn't that wasn't that uh, before all of the paranoia? Uh, like, well, was it, what yeah, did yes, write but her? but he could have been stalking her again because he clearly had some kind of an obsession with her. Uh, I thought it was like like uh, I thought she he just lost interest or something. I have to see the timeline on that. Well, the timeline's irrelevant because he stalked her at one point in the past. So would he do so again? I mean, it's all. Wait, did, didn't, he, didn't he stalk her from across the country? Like he was in the east and then he like. Yeah, he went. Yeah, I mean, we'll get into him specifically, but just generally, if if someone does that, they can do it again. You know, so it's it's mostly about whether or not you believe you believe him. That's what it comes down to. Yeah, so. I guess so. I don't know. Like, um, so I. I don't know. I'm, I'm leaning towards mental illness, and then, and then second, that that the guy, and then third, this twenty five thousand dollar poster guy. So like three. Those are my three. I guess. I mean, it's, it's, you know, but I'm leaning towards para, uh, mental illness, and then second, the 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 dude that was talking to her, and then third, this. Actually, I, I would put this this uh, poster guy second, and then the third, the stalker dude. Very interesting. My, uh, here's my take on it. So her writings were pretty interesting. I mean, she was definitely talented in a lot of ways. And it also seems like she was just a genuinely very good person, very, very, with a lot of empathy. So it seems like she was always trying to help people and people took advantage of her as her 
her parents kind of stated in the fifth estate where that could get her into bad situations, also have a mistrust for people, which is why she could have been growing paranoid, possibly. I'm not 100%. I'm not sold on the psychotic break theory. It seems like too easy. I mean, not that that's impossible, but it seems like it's almost like a too easy explanation and an excuse and writing off all these other things. It just, it seems kind of strange to just completely write it off as that. And the thing that's that's kind of like throwing me off as far as like the uh, the psychotic break and the, or the mental illness is that her writing is pretty um, coherent. It's yeah. not jumbled up. It's not like um, it doesn't show signs of ah, the the incoherent mental illness, but it does show a little bit of paranoia. So well, it, well, is it paranoia? Is it really paranoia if someone's stalking her though? Uh, yeah, yeah, good point. Um, but but if you're if you're looking at the the psychotic theory, then I don't know. Um, uh, then is that? <laughs> but you know, it could be the stalker dude. I don't know. Like I said, like I'm pretty. Uh, well, here's the other thing, not to fall for black and white fallacies. Let's say she was having mental issues and having a psychotic break. Why wouldn't someone take advantage of a person like that? Yeah, that's true. Uh, she could have been having a psychotic break and someone stalked her. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, or maybe she was having a psychotic break because she had been stalked already. That's just true. Or or she had tendencies of a mental illness and the yeah. stalking, the yeah. stalking pushed her over the edge. Oh, yeah, yeah. exacerbated it, yes. So we're going to dive deep and explore this case. We're going to go over things not gone over on other podcasts or documentaries because that's what we do on Mind Shock in an attempt to get a complete picture and explore every avenue because there's a couple of uh, details of this case that are very, very suspicious. And it's it's pretty weird. It's pretty weird because... I mean, even even the story about the guy that said she's she ran away because she hates her parents. He also shouted something like, "She's with me." Emma ran away. She's with him. I mean, the, the accounts, depending on where you look, it's uh, it's kind of weird. I mean, obviously, there's people out there with mental issues, and you know, the other thing that's 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 a little weird about this case. She's very chameleon-like. If you look at a lot of her pictures, she can look very different in different pictures. And then it seemed like she had a decent amount of money. She was very talented. She was very smart. And she could have pretty much done a lot of things, but she wasn't doing them. Now, initially, when I first watched The Fifth Estate and I first started researching this case, what kind of jumped out at me is that it almost seems like... Like, she didn't have a cell phone. She didn't really seem to like the materialistic world and this ego-driven, everybody taking advantage of everybody. So she seemed to have some bad relationships in the past, which a lot of people do. It seems like a lot of people kind of feel the same way she does. It's just they don't end up going missing. They end up either, you know, settling into some kind of life or switching it up or whatever they end up, or not, or just, you know whatever living at a sh- living their days out in a shelter or something they don't go missing so it's not it's not we don't necessarily re-examine this the same way but is it a lot of things that she did were they really that strange her mother said there was no history of drug use or mental illness or anything like that so obviously that doesn't mean there couldn't have been within the past year or so but she did have a job until a couple weeks prior it seemed like the loss of a job and the other thing that jumped out at me is the her van being towed and them not they the the whole van situation because she was either living out of her van sometimes at the shelter or with friends. I mean, when she was younger, based on her writing, I mean, her writings are are very interesting. I thought they were very good, very talented, very um, just uh, I don't know, like like a non materialistic, superficial person. She was deep. She was deep. Let's put it that way, and. It seems like she could have been doing almost anything like she had been to China before. I mean, she it's she she led an interesting life. Very smart, very talented. What do you make of the fact that she was basically either living on the streets or at a shelter instead of because she's 26 now. So that's not quite, you know, 2021. I mean, she's been an adult for a number of years that 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 aspect of it is it kind of I find it a little strange because she has money. And 
Uh, I'll go over the details or financial details in a little bit once we get into the real nitty gritty of the case. But that just these things just kind of jumped out at me. And it's almost like she didn't want to settle into a materialistic, ego driven type world. So she was just living on the fringes. And yeah. I don't I don't understand the, where the shame is coming from because um, it seemed like from the documentary she was ashamed of something either like lack of success or or uh, I forgot what, what what was she what was she ashamed about because she can't she couldn't face her mom it wasn't I don't drugs think, or anything I don't think it was ever specified I mean it seems like she had a lot of secrets her dad said she never really talked about her pain her pain was private I mean I don't think they really got into it which we'll be getting into the family dynamic some people and, online yeah, theorize. And, some people online theorized that she was either abused at home or there were just major issues. It seemed like they started during the divorce and then she said she kind of, her father kind of uh, confided in her and that made her mother mad. And then it just created a whole bunch of problems where she just didn't like the family situation. So we don't really know if this is just a normal kid being resentful of divorcing parents and not understanding of a situation because it could be as simple as that, especially someone who's very sensitive. And it could just be simply as that, something as simple as that. It might have not even been any kind of real abuse, just, you know, harsh words here and there. And maybe a kind of disillusionment with what they thought their life would be like. Yeah, it's hard to see. And, and the mom was like so caring and loving. Um, I guess... I guess uh, being in front of a camera is something else. I mean, uh, well, there were a few been different. But. Yeah, there were a few statements I found a little bit strange from the mother. For example, she said, "If I could do it, something about doing it over." It seemed like she was ref. Like there was this subtext that they just didn't have the best relationship in the past. And again, for all the you know, for all the people that never went missing. We can say the same thing about them. Not everybody has a perfect relationship with their kid, especially when they're a teenager. Because as soon as she turned 18, she seemed to have wanted to leave, leave the small town. She was adventurous. You know, she studied in China. You know, it's, 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 it's hard to say. Is it just simple disillusionment when your parents get divorced? Or, or was it something more? Did she feel just something severely lacking? I mean, it's so hard to say because... I mean, I think everybody goes through cycles when they feel like this, even when nothing is really wrong. You know, if you're going through a mundane routine in a small town, I mean, you know what I mean? Or she might have had a lot of people let her down from bad relationships or friendships and even her parents' disappointments, you know, the divorce or maybe other situations where she felt like, you know, they didn't live up to her idea of them. So she might have just been disillusioned with a lot of people in general, with society, but it's it's really hard to say, like you said, it's hard to say, but th this case is interesting because all these things kind of jump out at me and it seems like a lot of people can relate to her because they kind of feel the same thing she feels to a certain degree. I mean, I know I did in certain respects where, I mean, it seems like she chose to live on the fringes of society where a lot of people don't choose to do that. They have no choice. They don't have degrees. They don't have money. They don't have jobs. She had these things. And a whole lot of talent, you know, as a writer, it's just she, she, it seems like she chose to live on the fringes. Now, whether that was due to mental illness or not, I, I, I think that's just too easy of an answer. I mean, even if she, there were some certain mental predisposition, even though if there might've been some small signs, I mean, I don't know. I'm just, I think I, I always hesitate, you know, just like in the Elisa Lamb case, I always hesitate to just go up oh, psychotic break, nothing to see here. She either, whatever, she ran away, she's living homeless. You know, there's no reason to investigate it. I don't think it's that simple. What do you think about that? Yeah, I don't think it's that simple. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of just making guesses and from all the information, but yeah, I really don't know. <laughs> What we also have to see, like normally a woman's shelter instead of a homeless shelter is specifically because these women were abused by men. So if she had a stalker, it would make sense she would go to a woman's shelter, right? The other thing that really jumped out at me is she liked to read in the library in the children's section. Now, to me, that's probably the safest place in the library because, you know, librarians would find it kind of sketchy if there are these strange men in the children's section, you know, especially if they don't have a kid. So that seems like a really safe place for her. And she spent a lot of time reading 
in the children's section. So immediately that jumped out at me. She does not feel safe. And I see that. She's, she was smart enough to get into that little cocoon there. Yeah. And the other thing that jumped out at me, it just really kind of, it's like a punch in the gut is the whole situation with the van. Like it seemed like she had a hard time maintaining the van or keeping it. And we'll get into the details with that too. But that seemed to me just, again, I'm, I'm just, I guess you could call it a hunch. It seems like all of this insanity spiraled from the van. And I will explain that as we get into all of the exact details. But yeah, it's... The, the other thing is supposedly in the days prior to her going missing, certain friends have said that she grew increasingly off and paranoid. So it seemed like she was fine for a while. And then leading up to her disappearance, she wasn't. So and all the issues with the taxis and it appears it's it's strange because I don't know. Like, it seems like it probably could be some kind of a combination of mental issues plus stalker. So we don't know what's real. We don't know what isn't. But it's not all mental illness and it's not all stalker related. But I don't know. Maybe she had no mental illness at all. Maybe, you know, it's she would she was just the way that she was. It wasn't specifically mental illness. And yeah. All right. So let's examine this in more detail. So just some quick background before we get to the timeline. Emma was born January 6, 1986, near Perth, Ontario. Her family consisted of two brothers, one sister, a mom who was a popular teacher, and a father who was a part-time artist. She was described by her mother as shy, quietly happy, and content with cascading laughter. Contrary to her athletic siblings, she excelled in the arts and chose dancing instead of sports. There was never one competitive bone in her body. From a very young age, she had a smile that moved mountains and the heart and sensibility of a poet, which could be light and charming on the outside, but very secretive and even sad on the inside. She made a habit of keeping all her cards close to the vest. Her parents' divorce was not only painful, but became a hardship because her mom, Shelly, literally lost it and would not accept that her husband had left for her for a younger woman. She had suffered a mental breakdown that lasted three years and even attacked her ex with a knife. Sadly, Emma was the one who had to call the cops on her mother. So there's a little bit of info on some more background. This is from The Trouble with Justice dot com the ballad of emma so this information is information that is not usually posted specifically this incident where she attacked her ex with a knife emma had to call the cops on her own mother that must have been troubling in the midst of the divorce her father confided in emma and she felt compelled to support him which caused lasting friction with her mother you know what's weird though did you get all that maxwell um no <laughs> Her mother had a mental breakdown after the divorce with her father, which lasted three years, and she even attacked him with a knife. Damn. And Emma was the one who had to call the police after that incident. Damn. Uh, so I can see some weird thing going on with the dad. Wait, is he, uh, is he still alive? Or... Uh, as far as I know, but you know what's interesting is it's always her mother who's searching for her instead of the father. Isn't that a little backwards? Because if the father is the one, because it says here too, in the midst of the divorce, the father confided in Emma and she supported him, which caused more friction with her mother. That's weird. Wait, who's, who said that? This is, for, this is information from the troublewithjustice.com. That's just the information Damn. here. So, yeah, it, on the fifth estate, they mentioned it too, that the father kind of confided in Emma and that caused issues with the mother. What's also kind of weird is if the father's the one, well, okay, we don't know why they divorced. So if the mother had some kind of other issues which caused the divorce and the father left and then went for a younger woman or whatever, or if he was cheating beforehand, but it seems like if he was cheating beforehand and Emma knew about it, I don't know if she would take his side there. I don't know. I don't know these dynamics. But if she felt it was her mother's fault, that could cause issues. And then if her mother, if there is a history of mental illness, 
again, is is a mental breakdown really mental illness though? Like if you have a nervous breakdown, is that the same thing as mental illness or you, cause you're just having trouble handling a life situation. Is that the same thing? That's not quite the same thing as paranoid schizophrenia or anything like that. I mean, that's you having an, I mean, a lot of people have, have kind of mental breakdowns, so to speak for a hard period in their life. And then they never have an issue ever again. It was just the stress of a certain period of their life. It wasn't an ongoing mental illness. Yeah. People go through some temporary insanity. Not even necessarily temporary insanity. You're you just kind of shut down. You don't have weird paranoid delusions necessarily. You just kind of shut down for a certain period of your life. But yeah, so this is the background we have here, which it is kind of bizarre. We also don't know what kind of fights they had or what, what kind of led to all this. And we also don't have a lot of information on her two brothers. I actually thought she only had one brother, but it's mentioned here she has two. So one of them was possibly involved in drugs or something, and maybe not. He could be innocent. We really don't know. We really don't know about any of that. So, and she also has a sister. But, but what, what I was saying, though, is it strange that because she was so close to the father, why is her mother doing all the legwork trying to find her? She's always the one flying out. Why isn't she talking to the father? Yeah, it's kind of weird. And why? I don't know. I, or I don't is know it the mother? Or is it the mother trying to make amends somehow? But we don't know. So, okay, going on to what this says, Emma was a listener, but felt that nobody was there for her, which probably was because her secret nature did not allow others to penetrate her shell easily. Always the free spirit, she left home at 16 to live with a friend's family because she would not accept curfews and rules. This is another detail we did not have before. So she, she left the country when she was eight, or she left her town when she was 18, but it says here she left her actual house at 16 to live with a friend's family. When she realized that her friend's mother also had rules, she moved out and lived with a plutonic boyfriend who was 10 years older than she was. Uh, how does that work? A platonic boyfriend? I mean, wouldn't that just be a male friend? <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not 100% sure. Wait, who, was, who, was, who was labeled that? She moved out from her friend's house because her, friend, her friend's mother also had rules. She moved in with a platonic boyfriend that was 10 years older. She quit regular school and attended a special program where she excelled. Her good grades allowed her to get grants to study culinary arts in Campbell River and to attend photojournalism school in Ontario. She spent a short time teaching English in China and went to live in Nova Scotia for a while to be with her sister. It was the beginning of her adventures. She was eager to see the world and to leave Lanark County behind. She loved her family and was close to her little brother. She helped raise and care for, but she needed to spread her wings and fly. Culinary arts in Campbell River. She studied in Campbell River, British Columbia, and ended up working at a local pub. We know that she had a steady boyfriend during her stay and that the relationship became complicated. I am surprised that nothing was ever said on the subject. Her childhood friend said that Emma attracted the best and the worst. Her kind and generous nature made it hard for her to discriminate against anyone. And at times, it could be a curse and a blessing. She also strangely stated that as a young woman, her good looks made her the object of pursuits that hindered her quest for personal growth. She went as far as calling it a life-ruining thing. Which is kind of weird because her mom also mentioned that on the fifth estate that it's kind of like a curse for her to have been born that beautiful. I don't know. It's, does is that seem kind of weird for somebody to say? I don't know. I guess, um, yeah. And as nice as she is, it could be a curse if you if you're not if you're not assertive and you know rejecting. I guess. I personally do not think that Emma's attractiveness was at the root of her problems, or that young men do not face the same hurdles. Her personality and woes had nothing to do with feminist rhetoric 
but way more with sense and sensibility and a budding mental disorder. Maybe it explains why we hardly hear of her romantic relationships once she arrived in Victoria, even if I believe that it could be one of the most important missing links. She went back to Perth for a short while after leaving Campbell River and eventually moved on to Victoria Island. Emma was a nature lover and she was known to walk for hours in the forest barefoot and to avoid nightclubs or being part of the urban world. I mean, that might shed some light on why she wasn't even wearing her sneakers the last time or one of the last times she was seen because she was barefoot. Victoria and Michaela. When Emma landed in Victoria, she had arranged to stay with an old friend called Michaela and had a vague plan, nothing too precise, but at least something to hang her hat on. Michaela was a law student who at the time lived with her boyfriend. She had offered Emma shelter for a few months and she ended up staying with them from October until December 2011. She also eventually lived in an apartment in the same building. That's when Michaela and her boyfriend noticed the change in Emma. She would declare that she was drawn to Victoria because it was the center of something important. She had no clue what, but believed that it was meant to be. During that period, she did not look for work and spent most of her time walking with very little sleep. They also noticed that she did not eat very much. Her friend became worried because she walked for hours and compulsively picked up leaves along the way to redistribute them. She would come home with rocks and other nature's artifacts that she would lay on the table and seemed intent on rearranging in a creative way. Now, does this strike you as mental illness or see, or just someone... I mean, because kids do stuff like that all the time, too. I mean, just... Collect leaves, rocks, and a. I mean, that's kind. Of, isn't that kind of more of an abstract artist behavior instead of just mental illness? What do you think? Yeah, it's possible. Um, yeah, some of the best art I've seen on TV is made out of garbage. <laughs> so you're into the abstract know. art. Um, yeah, because I've seen them, and it's amazing what they can do. So she could be doing that, or you know, that's her tendency. Michaela noticed that Emma seemed to feel more compelled than enthused to go on these long strolls. What do you make of that? So I don't, I'm not 100% sure what she means by that, but apparently she was kind of compulsive about the strolls, like almost stressed out, I gotta go on my stroll. I mean, is that what she means? Instead of kind of carefree, lackadaisically, and fun-lovingly going on the strolls. I suppose that might be a little bit more mentally alarming. One night, Emma shared a poem with them, and as she was reading it, she was shaking and crying. It was about her being the moon, them being the sun, and their connection to the cosmos. And it was related to a change. Emma was upset after her friend said that she did not really get her point. That's when Michaela talked to a few mental health specialists and tried to get Emma to consult, but she refused. She even communicated with Emma's father, James, to tell him how worried she was. He offered his daughter a plane ticket home, but did not seem too alarmed by this troubling situation. All right, here's another thing about Emma's father. So from the Fifth Estate, did he seem a little too calm? A little too relaxed. I mean, that's the thing that I noticed about him. What did you, I mean, that could just be his personality. I'm not saying, I'm, I'm not saying I know what any of that means. It's just, he could just be a super calm and relaxed guy, but he really did not seem like the mother seems pretty stressed out for whatever, you know, for various reasons, obviously her daughter's missing. Maybe she felt that that rocky relationship contributed to that, which it might've, whereas the father just seems so relaxed. I mean, maybe he just, I don't know does some drugs or whatever, he's an artist, but what did, what did you think about that? Um, I don't know. I've been giving a lot of permission with some seemingly inconsistent behavior as far as, like, just from reviewing, like, past events, like in the, the, the shootings, like, where this dad, where this dad comes up on stage smiling and laughing and then all of a sudden he cries, but it's, I don't know. I've been giving a lot of, like, 
leeway for a lot of b- bizarre seemingly um, I don't think it's I mean I don't think it's that but I mean I I wasn't implying it, it was that it was that bizarre he just seems like a very relaxed individual I'm not really I'm not saying that means anything because if anything this Michaela's testimony here that the father's not too alarmed if he kind of just views Emma because he did make this one statement that I thought was very strange he said he's kind of at peace with it or he kind of accepts it if it was her choice to basically disappear live on her own now he's also an artist and he's he seems I, I don't know. It's almost like him and Emma are kind of like fate will have its way kind of people where it's kind of like they just feel, I mean, if you're a father, would you really, I don't know, wouldn't you want to see your daughter? It's kind of weird. Like he said, he's at peace with it or he accepts it if it was her choice and he just hopes it was her choice. But he also said it as if maybe she committed suicide. Maybe she ran away. He just hopes it was her choice. I mean, that's a very uh, out, I mean, I don't, I guess out there is one way to say it. I mean, it's, it's almost like, I mean, what do you think about that? Um, I don't know. It's probably just a relaxed dude just knowing how to handle things. I or, don't know. Maybe, or maybe a lot of drugs. I don't know. But um, it's possible. I, I don't, I actually don't remember the interview, so I have to look at it again. He basically just said he hopes it was her choice, which obviously you don't want somebody killing your your kid. But wouldn't it be better if if they didn't commit suicide? I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm not that I'm saying he didn't think that. Obviously, I'm sure he agrees with that. But it's just I don't know if I've ever seen a missing persons case where suicide was on the table. And uh, the father said, you know, I accept it or whatever, as long as it was her choice. I mean, it just it seems like odd phrasing to me. I don't know. I see, I see what you mean. It's just just the phrasing of it. But so when Michaela moved to the Philippines for work, she basically had to leave Emma behind. She could never imagine what would become of her good friend while she was away. When she came back to Victoria in October 2012, she emailed Emma, but had no clue she was now living in a shelter. Julian Hoard. So this was the stalker guy. When Emma was still in Perth, she encountered a French guy named Julian Quard, who became her walking companion. And by the way, just in case we didn't clarify, and for people who are not familiar with the geography of Canada, so Perth is, co- is close to Montreal on the, on the east coast of Canada. So when she moved out to Campbell River, that's completely across the country. That's the other side of Canada. So we're going from Montreal, which is close to the uh, Atlantic Ocean, all the way to Campbell River and Victoria, which are on the Pacific on the complete other side. So that's the Vancouver, Seattle area. So she basically left. She went as far from home as possible in Canada. (laughs) So just to clarify. Okay, so back to Julian Hoard, who became her walking companion. They had met at a music festival and started hanging out for a while, canoeing, walking, mostly at night, and basically going along with Emma's spur-of-the-moment lifestyle. From the very beginning, it was clear that Julian was infatuated. Emma was beautiful, sensitive, talented, and mostly very unusual. She would bring her ukulele and continually strum the same chord when they would walk. She never asked any personal questions and seemed to live in the moment. So again, factoring in these, uh, these, I guess you'd call them traits of her personality, this, to people who aren't like that, they could see that as mental illness when it's not mental illness. This is just a unique individual. Would you agree with that, Maxwell? That what? What I just said? Uh, I, I missed it. So, (laughs) basically, Julian said that she was very unusual. For example, she would bring her ukulele and continually strum the same chord when they would walk. She never asked any personal questions and seemed to live in the moment. That's cool. So he he played the same chords and she she, she didn't care? She was the one who brought the ukulele and strummed the same chord when they would walk. Uh, Okay, and then she never asked any questions of him. And she always lived in the moment. So I'm just that's, saying... That's really cool. She was I know. Really she seems like she had a really great personality, very unique personality. 
And the average person might confuse this unique personality with mental illness. So if we're factoring in how unique she is as an individual, which is not mental illness, that's her uniqueness, maybe even trying to conform to, a, to the standards of society, that, that's what caused some issues, that caused some internal struggle that a lot of people have as well. But I'm just saying, I think it's too easy to write this off as mental illness, especially given the fact that she was such a unique individual. Agree or disagree? I get it. That's cool. Makes sense. Julian was from Quebec, which is close to Montreal, so that's on the East Coast once again. I, I forget. Some people might be very un unfamiliar with uh, Canada's geography, <laughs> but he stayed in Perth for two years. After one of their long walks where he noticed that she wore the same pants every time, she put her head on his shoulder and he kissed her. She then held his hand. He was on cloud nine. But the day after, she realized that it was a mistake and told him in no uncertain terms that she did not want to see him again or pursue a relationship because she was leaving town and did not want to get attached to anyone. Her reaction was abrupt and took Julian by surprise. He called her a few times to try to make sense of it, but she had her dad tell him to stop calling. His reasoning was that they could simply remain friends. That was it for Julian. Strangely, she called him again and declared that she did not like the way she handled the situation and wanted to pay him a visit for a chat. She did, and after a 30-minute conversation, they parted as friends, and he felt better about it. Case closed. Even though Julian was accused of chasing Emma, it was she who showed up again at his door and asked him to go for a walk. Also, I think we got to be careful on how confirmed some of this is. I mean, I'm assuming this was confirmed either by Emma somewhere or possibly by her father, if this was corroborated. Because obviously, if Julian just said this, I mean, <laughs> that's not enough to take on faith. Okay, so Emma made the rules. He was surprised, but decided to go along. After he dared asking her why she was wearing the same pants every time they met, she turned cold and told him that she would finish the walk on her own. As to be expected, he felt bad and decided to leave a note with a friend of Emma who worked at a cafe she frequented to apologize for making the comment. It would be uncovered later that she was very sensitive and even ritualistic about some of her possessions. She would become defensive and even try to flee if anyone questioned her on what was perceived at the time as her idiosyncrasy. Of course we know that it was the manifestation of a deeper problem. Do you agree or disagree that this is a manifestation of mental illness as opposed to just someone's personality? To me, this, I mean, it really doesn't seem like mental illness. It's just something like different people value different things. Some people are OCD about certain things. Does that make them mentally ill? I mean, I guess it's called obsessive compulsive disorder. But still, I mean, compared to who? I mean, it all depends on what baseline you're using. Is this enough to convince you she's mentally ill or becoming mentally ill? What do you think? Um, I mean, it's not enough, but, you know, you have, um, you have some clues, but, I mean, you can't really conclude that she's mentally ill. But it's possible that she was. Yeah, I mean, yes, that's a possibility, but I wouldn't declare that just from this information. But anyway... Yeah. And so the story went. I resent the way the show Fifth Estate on Emma's disappearance portrayed Julian. They claim that he followed her to Victoria a few months after she left, when in fact he moved there 14 months later after carefully considering several other options where he could ride his bike and manage to secure a job and some living arrangement. He did not have a car, and Victoria offered the opportunity to ride his bike, walk, and paddle all year. As he said on the show, maybe on an unconscious level, he was hoping to see her again, but his decision was made according to personal considerations. Even if Shelley likes to speculate otherwise, Julian, who had been sh pretty straightforward during the saga, reiterated that all he knew was that Emma was on the West Coast. So apparently he didn't know that she was in Victoria. He never kept in touch with Emma and had no way of knowing if she was now married or involved in a relationship. They made him look and sound quite sinister when 
He was simply a good guy with a big crush, certainly not a bunny boiler. Meeting Emma in Victoria. One fine day, Julian saw Emma across the street in Victoria and went to say hello. He said that she was happy to see him and gave him a hug. Her smile and warm welcome gave him the confidence to go ask her for a bite after work, but she declined. He told her where he worked and invited her to visit him if she felt like it. It is important to note that he did not go looking for her. He was taking a lunch break from work when she happened to pass by. He made a point of not asking her where she lived or worked because he did not want to sound pushy. There was a music festival coming up, and against his better judgment, he sent Emma's father a Facebook message asking him to transmit the invitation on his behalf. To reassure him, he told him not to worry because he did not intend to stalk her like in Ontario. So apparently he admitted to stalking her in Ontario. That was a big mistake that would come back to haunt him later when the unread message would be uncovered after Emma's disappearance. Being French, he had used the word stock without a clear understanding of its meaning. This created a false perception of Julian that seems to persist to this day. Stalker, a person who harasses another person as a former lover in an aggressive, often threatening, and illegal manner. It is pretty clear that Julian is not the only one to have confused the meaning of the word stalker. The next two times he would see Emma on the street, she would be withdrawn and not interested in engaging in any conversation. The opposite of the smiling girl he had encountered earlier. During an encounter, she even seemed confused as who she was. Again, this is, if this is coming from him, Ah, uh, I don't know. Unbeknownst to him, she was starting to show clear signs of mental illness. This this article seems a bit biased. I mean, clear signs of mental I mean, if that's true, I suppose not knowing who you are is a clear sign. But the last time he saw her was on the morning of November 28th, 2012. Coincidentally, the day she disappeared. Is that too much of a coincidence for you, Maxwell? Um, I, I miss what you're saying. Maxwell Army. <laughs> so he ran into her several times. You got that part? Yeah, Julian, right? Yeah, the last time he saw her was on the morning of November 28th. That coincidentally is she disappeared that night. Oh, okay. Is that too much of a coincidence for you? Um... Usually you don't that's, find it. Usually you don't find anything coincidental or strange. That's been a theme on Mindshock. <laughs> I don't know if that's because you don't remember all the details, so you don't find it strange because you don't keep all the other details in mind. But well, it's definitely something to look into. I mean, what ha what happened that day? He was in the bus going to a government building to get his health card when he spotted her on the sidewalk. He was not even sure if it was her because she was wearing a big coat with a furry hood and her hair was like a lion's mane. She was carrying many bags and looked lost. He got off the bus to go see her and because he could not see her face unless he walked in front of her, he decided to go to his appointment. When he came out, he was surprised to see that the girl was still standing there and decided to go check. After recognizing her, he asked if she needed to talk, but she shook her head no. He promised himself right then and there that if he saw her again, he would not bother talking to her. He had no clue that it would be the last time he would ever see Emma. He had no way of knowing that she was in crisis. You know what's weird? I mean, yeah, I guess it's kind of weird. I mean, I wonder what his intuition really said about that, because... Did he really think that maybe she just didn't like him, so she was acting strange because of that? Even, um, yeah, even, I guess I can see that happen. I mean, he's he's like, uh, yeah, that's ah, uh, that's rough. Yeah, because <laughs> it's it's almost kind of like, oh, man, that's that's kind of hard to read because if she's like really pushing you off, I mean, 
but it, it was kind of weird that like he he went to some apartment and came out like two hours later and she was still standing there a government building yeah and how how long was that it how didn't did say it says he got Cause, off because he said he was surprised that she was still standing there so that means it must have been like an hour or two at least I mean, he just was going to get a health card, so we don't know. I mean, it could have been as little as 30 minutes, but I mean, that's... I'm, I'm giving it two hours just because it's a government building. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. I mean, it, yeah, it definitely wasn't five minutes because it was like if it was like five, ten minutes, you wouldn't be surprised, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was definitely a decent amount of time that you would not expect someone to still be standing there. But yeah, so what's weird is she gave him a, a warm welcome when she first saw him in Victoria, when he first saw her in Victoria, but she did decline to go eat with him. Ah, oh, man, that's rough, man. <laughs> but the next couple of times he said she was confused and she didn't know who she was. Although, if he really didn't like him, I mean, I don't know. He could be lying because we have to take his word for that warm welcome the first time. We have to take his word for her, her not knowing who she was. We have to take his word for all these things. Wait, she, 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 she said that she didn't know who she was? Oh, man. Julian said that she appeared to not know who she was. She was withdrawn or lost. Wait, is Julian a, a girl or a guy? <laughs> oh, man, Max Alarmy. Julian no, is you're saying talking. she. Yes, Julian is talking about Emma. Julian is so, saying Julian uh, is, is the stalker guy. Or... Uh, a French guy who might not know what the word stalker is. Julian is the same guy we've been talking about this whole time, Maxwell. We've only been wait, talking he's not, about... He, wait, he's not, the, he's not the letter guy, is he? Is he? The guy that sent the email to the father, yes. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. shit. This is Julian. Oh, man. Maxwell, you're slipping. Wait, uh, we've only been talking about... Wait, so, so about he, wasn't, he wasn't really, like, he... He accidentally kind of, like, ran into her, right? Or she was he, like, kind of stalking her? Well, we don't know, because as I just said, we have to take his word for all of this. Huh. So That's weird. He, he said he saw Emma several times after the first time in Victoria. He said, well, you know, okay, so going back so to- no, So no CCTV on this one, on the streets? No, as far as I know, there's no footage of Julian talking to Emma, as far as I know. So here's the thing, though. I will mention this. When I watched The Fifth Estate, I immediately did not suspect him, just intuition-based, because he did not have to come forward. He even took a lie detector test that he was cleared of. Now, we know that doesn't really mean anything, but if you're guilty, are you going to volunteer a lie detector test? If you're innocent, you might not volunteer to take it. That's true. But if you're guilty, would you volunteer to take it? Unless you know you're a pretty good sociopath, psychopath that could pass it, but... That's so weird. Why did they still? So this, this, it's a psychological thing to offer this test. It seems like because because it's not allowable, right, in the court or correct. But however, so is this a psychological tactic for no, the police officers? Well, they want it because it could still be accurate, but they just have to. They have to use it. They can go. They can try to find other evidence based on the test, but the test itself is not admissible. But that doesn't mean they can't get really good information and solve a case based on the information contained in the test, in the lie detector test. It basically just shows whether or not someone's stressed out or not. So apparently he's calm enough to where he's either telling the truth or he's some kind of sociopath with no emotions that doesn't seem that for whatever, whether he's innocent or guilty of doing something to her, whatever. But it's kind of interesting he saw her on the day she went missing. But anyway, my point was, when they said you just happened to go to Victoria where she was, and he was like, yeah, it's just a coincidence. The way he said that was, I thought it was very unique because I've, I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say that. Yeah, it just believe it or not, it's just a coincidence. But he said it with a kind of calm conviction where he had almost no worry that it would be taken wrong as if, unless he's a sociopath, unless he's some kind of genius sociopath who can pull that off, I have to lean towards it really was a coincidence. And every case usually has at least one. So I've been mentioning this recently. I think I mentioned this on the Mora podcast as well. 
almost every case, like like researchers and detectives have said that every case usually has one thing that doesn't quite fit or one weird coincidence or one red herring that's really nagging because it seems to add up, but it doesn't. If I had to guess, I, this again, this is just my interpretation of Julian. It really seems that there'd be no reason for him to go above and beyond. It seems like he really cared for her and he was just doing what he could to help the case. That's my impression. Obviously, I'm not saying he shouldn't be investigated further. I think everything should be investigated because he could possibly be some kind of a genius sociopath that could possibly pass lie detectors no problem and deliver these answers this the way he does. But initial impression, what did you think of him? Did he seem super shady or did he seem semi normal and innocent? I you know, I seriously don't remember the interviews and stuff, so I Well it's a good thing I, you brushed up for this podcast. <laughs> Um, I just, oh no, I, I, a little bit, because I think I remember him explaining the letter or something, but he was, uh, yeah, I don't know, it's just weird. After finding out that Emma was considered missing, Julian did not have to tell the authorities that he saw her at all, but he did. At first, he thought it was the 27th, but after checking his schedule, he realized it was the 28th. He saw her early in the morning, and there were several sightings of her during the day and the evening, so there was nothing fishy about their encounter. He did not own a car and lived in a room he rented in a house owned by an adult. He had no game and no opportunity to take Emma or do her any harm. Well, again, this is kind of a biased article because we don't know that for sure. I mean, he could have taken somebody else's car. He could have abducted her in an alley. We really I'm not saying any of these are true. I don't think they're true. But I mean, you know, to say with 100% certainty, that's a little strange. But to this day, the court of public opinion and the media are looming large over the guy. Emma calls home. Emma did not own a cell phone and did not give her family any specific address. When she sent an email, it was optimistic and poetic. This is how they knew her to be, so they never questioned if she was doing well or not. Contrary to what they said on the Fifth Estate, Emma was in regular contact with her mom. The idea that it had been a long time since their last exchange was a misleading statement. While in Victoria, she lived on boats, slept in the forest, and ended up staying at a shelter for women at risk, for months. It was called the Sandy Merriman House. Maybe it was to save money to go on a trip to Japan with her father, or maybe it was because she was lost and nobody in her circle knew about it. Emma had almost $3,000 in the bank and owned an older Mazda van that she parked in Sook. I don't know if that's pronounced Sook or Sooky or Sook. Sook. On November 21st, she hired a tow truck to retrieve it and parked it downtown Victoria at a parkade. She told the driver that she was going back home to surprise her family and could not wait to see the snow. Do you think she was kind of going in and out of mental lucidity where she, she was kind of perfectly normal for parts of the day and other parts of the day not? Mm. Because I don't know. It's uh, how, was her, how was her diet? Was she like into like health and stuff? Or? Some people say she really didn't eat much at all. So we really don't know. But apparently she's, uh, from what I read, nothing stood out. So possibly an average diet, but not eating much. So some people do theorize that malnutrition could have caused some mental, uh, mental illness as well, which is true. That does, that does cause mental problems. November in Victoria can get very dark and dreary with the rain. Emma was wondering how she would survive the darkness on her own. According to her writings, she felt alone and quite depressed. A few days before her disappearance, she called her mom unexpectedly late at night and told her to come and get her. She was crying in a st and in a state of despair. But then the day after, she would call and tell her mom not to come. She did that for a few days, and finally her mom, Shelly, decided to come anyway, after calling back the number of Sandy Merriman that her daughter had used to call her. 
She thought it was the name of a friend, but was in for a shock when she realized it was a shelter. The staff would not tell her anything about her daughter because of privacy laws. So Shelly had to come to check on her daughter. Shelly arrives in Victoria. When her mom arrived in Victoria and headed to the shelter, she was told by the staff that Emma had not claimed her bed that night. She was spooked because the staff told her that her mom was coming. To this day, Shelly insists that she did not tell them she was flying to Victoria. Uh-oh, we got another inconsistency here. The staff told her that her mom was coming? Maybe they just assumed she was coming because she's called back. I don't know. After leaving the shelter, Emma was spotted several times. Wait, wait, wait. so, so, so she, the mom actually guessed that she was there because the, the staff couldn't tell her whether she was there or not. But I think, is that what you're telling me? Like, uh, no. Mom... <laughs> oh, man. Max, no, cause she was, because there was, they, she just came, because they're not allowed to say that she's there because of privacy laws. And then she said she's coming anyway. And then well, she no. said, to, no, 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 no. Shelly said that she did not tell them she was coming. Wait, which one's Shelly? Shelly is the mother. Oh, uh, okay. She's Emma's mother. So Shelly said what? She's what? <laughs> Shelly says she's not coming. I just went over Shelley. this four times. Okay. Say so Shelly says she's coming. No, she did not say she was coming. Oh, uh, okay. But she just decided to just come. But the staff said to the, the Emma that she was coming, even Correct. though she, Shelly didn't say anything. Yes, finally got it. Yes. So, uh... No, so apparently... So, so she, was, staff, she was guessing that she was coming anyway. Apparently... The staff told Emma that her mom was coming, even though her mom didn't say she was coming. So that might have spooked her to not claim her bed that night. Because she so was the, the staff had really good intuitions about Shelly. Possibly, if that's true, I don't know. Because they might have assumed she was coming. But I, think that's, I think that's what happened was during a conversation, she was sort of asking, is there, is there a girl there named Emma? And then she's they, like, they said, um, well, we're not allowed to have private, like, because of privacy laws. And then based on the intonation and just the, the stammering or whatever, Possibly. Yes. she just decided I'm coming. Possibly. Yes. And then the staff was like, she can't say anything because she can neither, uh, approve or deny or whatever. Right. I don't know. That's what I'm, that's what I'm guessing. Anyway. After leaving the shelter, Emma was spotted several times. People called the cops on a couple of occasions to report how weird she was. And when she made an, met an acquaintance from the library, he decided to call 911 after spending 30 minutes with her because he felt she was in some kind of distress. Not the normal Emma he had spent time looking at books with. You know what's weird? She keeps talking about how alone she is. It seems like she has friends. She has people that care about her. Or at least to some degree, maybe she felt like it was superficial. Maybe that, yeah, maybe. But it's not like nobody ever knew her and she had no acquaintances and she never went on walks with anybody and she didn't know anybody. This isn't a person that's maximum isolated from what it seems like. Would you agree or disagree? Agreed. She was paranoid and afraid to walk under some specific construction. When he saw the cops show up, he left thinking she was okay. What he did not know is that they would leave after talking to her because she had not shown signs of extreme distress. She told them that she had things to sort out and would be going to a friend's place. Her mother was very upset about this, but being from Vancouver, I know how many people roam the streets and the cops can only take care of the most extreme cases. Sandy Merriman. At first, Shelly thought it was just a matter of time before she would encounter Emma. She went back to the shelter, talked to the police, and did her due diligence. But there was no sign of Emma. When the police got involved, she went back to the shelter, and that's when she found out about her daughter's deteriorating condition in the recent weeks. The staff of the Sandy Merriman had called the police when Emma started putting furniture 
and de electrical devices outside because she thought they were talking to her. She was living with the curtains drawn and showed signs of paranoia. They told the staff to call back if it got worse, but they never did. They even told her mom that towards the end, they were afraid of Emma. She had undergone a total reversal and was not the girl they knew when she arrived who would chat with them and be friendly. One thing Shelley also found out is that her daughter had given up coffee, cigarettes, and many types of food and was hardly eating. So it's kind of unclear if she just went super healthy or just cut back on everything. She found her van and in it were her passport, computer, cameras, and personal effects. Okay, just to clarify one thing, I'm not sure if they said that they thought that Emma thought the furniture was talking to her. I believe the exact quote was that they were loud. So some people theorize that it's artist. I mean, I don't know. This might be a stretch. Artistically, saying something is loud, it kind of means it's kind of attracts a lot of attention. It's too bright. It doesn't kind of fit the atmosphere. So like if there was like a neon couch in a in a dark room, you could say, oh, that's too loud. So it's kind of unclear exactly what was meant by that or how it was interpreted. I don't know. But just a quick clarification. She was caught on camera twice on the 28th going to a 7-Eleven to buy a $200 credit card, and later on, a prepaid cell phone. She kept peering through the door as if someone was watching her, probably in, a throw, in the throes of an episode of Paranoia. They're kind of pulling a Maxwell probably in the throes of an episode of Paranoia. What if she really does have a stalker, though? What if she has another stalker? I mean, it's not uncommon for predators to kind of Pick. Can you give me the reasons for the cell and the, if it, if it was a stalker, like the, or I mean, reasons for the a, what? If those are the reasons for the cell phone and the credit card, if or she is was there, planning, is there, or is that even connected? If she was planning to travel, she might be getting because if she wouldn't have access to a landline, if she's going to be on the road to get away from her stalker, who knows? Oh wait, isn't this a? Did they mention that it was her first cell phone or something? Yeah, she never had a cell phone apparently. Ah. Huh. I found that interesting, actually. Well, yeah, because it's 2012, and it isn't, yeah, but as I mentioned before, it seemed like she didn't really want to be part of an ego-driven, materialistic society. She was very artistic, very unique personality. I don't see that as mental illness. I mean, there's plenty of people who live off the grid with no cell phones. Are they all <laughs> actually, mental? actually, the cell phones are making us mentally ill. <laughs> yeah, anyways. yes, yes, very true. But it's anyway, proven, by the way, like you know, all these social media just diminishes your mental capacity. Your oh, focus. yeah. I've seen I've seen a lot of studies on that. Yes. Yes. Very scary stuff. Scary stuff. But this isn't quite the podcast for that. Yeah. So I'm just saying to say probably in the throes of an episode of paranoia, let's say even if she is mentally slipping or having mental issues, a lot of predators prey on vulnerable women who are in this situation. They're either living on the streets, living out of their car, living at a shelter. And if they see them around the streets at all, a lot and they see that they don't have a man with them or they see that they don't have family, those are the types of women they might target. So I would say if she is having some mental issues, that would increase her chances of being stalked or harmed, not decrease. So just the way I'm kind of looking at it. Shelly also found out that after learning of her arrival, her daughter had taken a cab at 6.10 p.m. to go to the airport. But when the driver told her the fare was $60, she reneged and asked to be brought back at her initial point of departure. Okay, so this is for me, that's the number one most troubling thing at this point. If she has a stalker, okay, she's going to walk in and out of that YMCA because there's a, there's a security video where she's walking in and out multiple times. And... Yeah, so that to me, that's not that made. Nothing is major until this cab ride. This cab ride is is a big red flag for me. So apparently, she learns. So they told her that her mother was arriving, even though her mother said she wasn't. Now, maybe she did really say that she was arriving. So you know, if that's the case, that's just Shelley either misremembering or saying that she wasn't to kind of take the blame off her. If if Emma kind of went through this these actions because if emma's freaked out she wants to go to the airport 
why would she go back just because it's sixty dollars? Because two points. One, if she has a debit card, which I'm not sure she does, but she has three thousand dollars in her bank account. So if she has a debit card, okay, boom. If she doesn't, she has a she has a two hundred dollar credit card. She just got it, so she couldn't have forgotten that quick unless she really is that mentally gone. But, I mean, it seems not because she's going to the airport. What do you make of this? She doesn't want to pay the $60, so she asked to be brought back to her exact point of departure as well, which is strange. Or maybe not strange if she wants to go back to the... Well, it is strange because she could go to the... I mean, I don't know. What do you make of that? About the uh, $60? About the entire, well, actually, hold on. There's more to the cab situation. Once there, she asked him if she could remain in the cab and questioned what the sounds coming from his receiver were. Okay, so what do you make of this whole cab ride situation? She's asking about the cab noise, then she's probably hearing voices from that cab thing or something. But it was. It was his radio. It was, it's not like it was off and she was hearing it. She was, oh, so she was asking about the content, not necessarily. It's unclear. I mean, we're, we're going to dive a little deeper in a moment. This is just, uh, this is the secondary overview. We'll get even deeper with all these situations. But just initial impression with the cab ride situation. So she, once he, she has a $200 card, he says it's $60. Unless she thinks the plane ticket is going to be that much more expensive. I don't know. But uh, apparently she finds out her mom is coming. So she wants to go to the airport. However, it's a $60 fare, and she's like, no, take me back to where you picked me up. And then she asks, can I stay in the cab for a while? She wants to stay in the cab. And then she asks him about whatever, noises from the receiver, radio, whatever. But what do you make of the whole situation of her wanting to go to the airport and then being taken back to where she was picked up? Um, wait, what do I think about when she was... Uh, can you ask that question again? I just said it four times. Oh, uh, shit. Uh... I missed it. <laughs> oh, man. What do you make of her getting a cab, wanting to get a cab to the airport? As, so they're on their way to the airport, and the cab driver's like, it's going to be 60 bucks. She has a $200 prepaid card, but she says, oh, that's too much. Take me back. So well, she then, said take me back because I thought she just hopped out of the cab. I, no, that's the no, last I, I, heard. Said, I just said it four times. She said, take me back to the spot you picked me up at. Uh, Actually, I probably said it five why, times. Why the hell would she say that? For? I know. That's what I'm asking. That's what I'm asking you why this whole thing. And then she that's, asked. kind of weird because. Then she, then she asks, she, then she asks she, to remain in the, in, the, in the cab for a while, which is also strange. She just wants to hang out in the cab. Did, did he eventually like kick her out or something? Or no? I believe she left of her own accord, but I'll, I'll get into that account later when we specifically talk about it. But just in general, this is the first red flag. So I was just asking what you make of it. So number seven, seventh time asking the question, what do you make of it? Um, I think she just didn't want to spend the $200 credit card and didn't want to spend any more money. But she must have known it was going to cost something to get to the airport. Like She probably never... Um, she hasn't taken a cab in a long time, I guess. So you think she, she thought? Okay, so you think she thought it was going to be like five, ten bucks, and that's what she was counting on. Wait, what? What was that? What was the exact fare? Sixty bucks. Yep. And her prepaid credit card is two hundred. And if she doesn't have a debit card, she might have a debit card, which her. And, bank, said, and, she, said, and she said she had a lot of uh, three thousand money. She has three thousand dollars in her bank account. And you're saying that she probably didn't have a, or or you're guessing whether or not she's, I don't, she didn't have it. I don't know whether or not she uh, had a card. Uh, that's weird. But hmm. she had a two hundred dollar prepaid card in her hand or on her person. So at this time, yeah, I don't know what to make of it. But let's say you're right. Let's say she just she thought it would be super cheap and it wasn't. Why did she want to be dropped off exactly where she was picked up? Because, okay, she doesn't want to go back to the house. She doesn't, like, where does she want to go? She wants to be back, brought back to the exact point he picked her up at. And, and where was it that she was picked up? She was picked up near the shelter, near the Sandy Merriman shelter. And she, so she apparently changed her mind. She told him she couldn't afford the $60 fare. 
and asked and was asked to be dropped off exactly where she was picked up. So why would she want to be dropped off back near the shelter if that's where her mom is going? And then she asked to sit in the cab for a while. The driver observes her behaving strangely. She becomes anxious and paranoid. I'm guessing these are his words. When she hears the dispatch radio, she stares at it and asks, why is there noise coming out of that? She pays. Oh, here we go. She has a debit card. She does have a debit card. She pays the fare with her debit card and quickly exits the cab. So she was, I guess she wasn't planning to use the $200 prepaid card. So if she has her debit card, then it doesn't make sense because that means she's planning to use the debit card, whatever the, whatever the price of a ticket costs, even if it's a couple hundred dollars, even if it's a thousand dollars, if she made her decision to go on an airplane, what's another $60? Because she has a debit card, and that's what she used to pay whatever the fare was. If it was $60 to the airport and back, I mean, it must have ran at least, I don't know, it doesn't say here what the fare was, but it may be five, ten bucks, whatever it was, to drive back and forth and for her to sit in the cab. Yeah, that's kind of weird. That's all you got? Uh, um, uh, I don't know, it's kind of weird. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that's all you got, all right. Well, I don't know. What, what, what do you think of it? To me, like I said, to me, that's the first red flag that I can't make sense of it. I can make sense of her changing her mind in general in the middle of the cab ride. Now, why? Uh, I, can, I, can, I can see that in a high stress situation. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. So maybe the $60 just triggered her, okay, well, the airplane's going to be this much and this much or something else. We don't know what's going on through her brain. We, we don't know, but that it doesn't, I don't find that strange. For her to want to be dropped off in the exact same spot, that's a problem for me for a number of reasons. One, if she doesn't want to run into her mother or if she does and she does want, actually, hold on a second. If she changed her mind and she did want to see her mother, then that does make sense. I mean, I don't know why the exact same spot, though. Wouldn't she want to go to the actual house if she wants? So that doesn't quite add up either. But to stay in the cab makes me think she really was worried about a stalker because she doesn't want to be alone. She wants to be in the safety of the cab. But why would she go back to that exact same spot then? Like, there's a few it's things. Probably like that. It's probably like that OCD that kicked in in a high-stress uh, state kind of like being oh, that actually, like, that actually okay i can see that okay all right it's like being being in a sense of order like like you want things in the same pattern as you did them because like she wears the same pants all the time to go walk okay all yeah right. well okay. 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 because to to interrupt the pattern it's kind of like you lose like control so you want to go back to the same pattern backwards. okay no, no no you made sense of it actually you made you made sense of it that's actually not quite as bad then but it's still it's still the first red flag okay she obviously did not intend to fly to Perth and was trying to flee after learning of her mother's upcoming visit. Once her mom would see her, she would have to face the seriousness of her condition. Okay, I'm, seeing, I'm sensing a lot of bias in this article because does someone who's mentally ill really know they're mentally ill? I'm not sure if she's mentally ill, she would even realize it because I, I don't know. Her actions displayed disorganized thinking and elogia struggle to give even brief answers. The cops said that at first she would only shake her head. She was also caught on video at the YWCA on November 20th, so this is eight days prior, as she was coming and going six times in a short period of time as if in a state of confusion. It did not look or sound good. Well, as a rebuttal on that front, if, the, if she was afraid of somebody on the street, then wouldn't she be, and if she still saw them there or thought they were still there, she might be going back in because she was scared. So I'm not sure I would just completely write that off as mental illness. Follow the money. The money in her bank account remains untouched to this day, and the cell phone she purchased was never activated. On the other hand, on December 5th, they found a man who was using her prepaid credit card to buy cigarettes on Sook Road. According to the police, the man told them he had found the card near the Juan de Fuca Recreation Center, about 20 kilometers from the harbor where Emma was last seen. 
And another interesting and coincidental factor, I was mapping out the distances. So from the, from the Empress Hotel in downtown Victoria, it's exactly 2.9 miles from where this new witness, which we'll be going over in a moment, picked up Emma. This guy gave her a ride. And it's exactly 2.9 miles from where he dropped her off and from where this prepaid card was found. Like, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, if you, if you look at it on maps, the exact travel distance along the road is 2.9 miles in both instances. So from the shelter to the, the cab ride stop? From the hotel then... where she was last seen talking to police oh, to, and then... to where she got picked up by this new witness who we'll be going over, it's 2.9 miles. Now, from where the witness dropped her off, to where this prepaid card was found is exactly 2.9 miles. Oh, I see. Just a coincidence, right, Maxwell? Was it a triangulation or like just straight line or what? Actually, mm, uh, it was. It was just. It's an offset. It's just offset. But so the man eventually reached out to Emma's mom three times to tell her that he did not give the cops that location. He was drunk at the time that he did not know where he picked up the card or if Emma had given it to him. Okay, so that's kind of weird. This man who was suffering from severe alcoholism waited for a week to use the card. I'm sorry, but when was the last time a drunk found a credit card and held onto it for a week? It sounds like he was trying to disassociate himself from the date of her disappearance. Not necessarily. If you're a drunk guy who doesn't know where you are half the time, you might have even forgotten that card was in your pocket, right? I mean, I forget. I, I'm not an alcoholic, and I'm not drunk and wasted all the time, but sometimes I forget what I have in my pocket. <laughs> I don't know. It is difficult to fathom why the Fifth Estate made such a big deal about Julian Hard, but totally ignored the only person who was in direct possession of evidence. Instead, they focused on the possibility of Emma being foxy enough to fool everyone and avoided the subject altogether. Logically, if Emma wanted to disappear and it was all a ruse, she would have never called her mom several times to come get her, and she would have not attracted the attention of the police or feigned being paranoid. How on earth could they come up with this type of logic? And again, this article is quite biased because if she does have mental issues, or she could have simply changed her mind, I mean, that's. Not really that weird. I don't know. According to some of her friends, she was harassed by a guy she had met in Campbell River. What happened to this lead? Why the obsession with Ward, but nothing about all her other relationships of the male and female persuasion? Ward and the other point of interest both passed the polygraph test. And even if I do not really put much stock in this technology, it is more telling if you pass than if you fail. There could be so many reasons to fail because it detects physical signs of discomfort that could be brought on by different triggers, even if you are not lying. But if you pass, you are either telling the truth, a sociopath, or you do not remember what happened. The red flag should have been that even if the man who found the credit card passed the polygraph test and was seemingly cleared after questioning, any test or interview would be meaningless if he was drunk to the point of no recollection. A good hypnotherapist might have been able to determine if it was all a song and dance or maybe help him remember some important details. A witness saw Emma walk with an older man on the afternoon of November 28th. That's an interesting lead. Another one on December 2nd. Are you paying attention, Maxwell? This one is very disturbing. On uh, November 2nd, what? A woman who was taking photographs in the Inner Harbor reported seeing a young woman leaning against a wall smoking a cigarette. However, if we're taking the accounts of her friends that she kind of gave up cigarettes and co coffee, who knows? She came over and offered advice on the camera operation and how to frame the parliament buildings in the background. The woman said that she was not acting in an odd manner, but asked her to repeat her name, Emma Filipov, three times, which she did. So keep in mind, this is December 2nd now. 
So this is numerous days after Emma went missing. So if Emma went missing on the 28th, so this would be the 29th, the 30th, the 1st, the 2nd. This would be four days later, this sighting, if legitimate. So anyway, the woman said that she was not acting in an odd manner, but asked her to repeat her name, Emma Filipov, three times, which she did. The woman found that a little peculiar, but it wasn't until a couple days later that she was watching the news and the Emma missing story came on. So what do you think? Do you think that this sighting was legitimate, that she, Emma just helped? Now, Emma did do photojournalism, so she, she does know her cameras and photography. Uh, so that is an interesting link there. But the woman said that she asked her to repeat her name three times, as if to remember her name, Emma Filipov. But other than, other than that, there was nothing strange or odd about her manner. What do you make of that? I, I, I was kind of like... Uh... Days and out on that, but uh, so the lady asked her. Well, I just said it three times, not once. But... All right, so Emma said to her, "My name is Emma Filipov. My name is Emma Filipov. My name is Emma Filipov." No, she did three it three times. No, she did what it. Did she, what did she say? She asked the woman to repeat her name. So basically, she's saying, "Say my name, Emma Filipov, three times," and the woman did. Damn, that's that's pretty good. That's pretty commanding. Other than that, the woman said she did not act strange. So she helped her take the photograph and frame the shot. So the lady took the photograph? The lady was taking photographs of the Inner Harbor, not of Emma. So she's taking photographs okay. of the parliament buildings, of government buildings. Emma okay. gave her advice on how to frame the shots. Emma did photojournalism as well. Oh, uh, okay. So she was giving advice to the lady taking photographs of the And she buildings. just said, repeat my name, Emma Philippoff, say Emma Philippoff three times. And she did. And apparently that was the end of that. That was weird. Yeah. So the woman found it a little peculiar, but until a few days later, when she was watching the news, she saw the Emma missing story come on. So she didn't know that she was a missing woman. So this is four days after the 28th. Yeah. That's so weird. So, well, this is this guy's analysis. I do not want to call her a liar, but Emma did not smoke since quite a while. Now, once again, people with mental issues or even just stressed out, even if they haven't smoked in a while, they might start again if they're stressed out, right? Like, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that always down. happens. Like a, yeah. like a, like a, a 10-year quit, ten year quitted smoker person. And then a stressful um, situation comes up. They yeah, start yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. She could not have looked normal after weeks of semi-psychosis. Well, again, if she's going in and out of psychosis, that could have been a normal period. Who knows? When last seen, she could only shake her head and would hardly communicate and showed signs of extreme paranoia and confusion. That someone seemingly normal would ask you to repeat her name three times does not mesh. I do not know what to think of this one, and this is why they called it an unconfirmed sighting. The lead that was not... Another strange element of this case is the emphasis on the photo of a guy who went into a shop in Gastown, Vancouver, and said that Emma was his girlfriend. So Vancouver is roughly 100 miles north of Victoria. So it's uh, close to four-hour drive time. So not super, super close. So this guy that went into a shop in Gastown, Vancouver and said that Emma was his girlfriend and did not want to be found because she hated her parents. This guy is more than likely another zonky from the area. Zonky. Does that kind of mean like bozo or crazy weirdo? I haven't heard the term zonky before. Have you heard zonky? First time. Must be Canadian slang. So apparently zonky is the adjective of zonked. So someone who's zonked out or weird, odd, eccentric. I guess that makes sense. There are a lot of people walking around in Vancouver with untreated mental illness, addictions, and crazy stories to spill. It is right by downtown East Side, and anyone who takes a walk there or has lived in the area will kind of dismiss this story. Not that it should not have been pursued, but does it deserve this type of attention? Why is there no information at all about previous boyfriends or male encounters co-workers, homeless people she would chat with, etc., and such emphasis on the likes of Julian and an insignificant guy shredding a poster in Gastown. After all, it is logical to think that if she needed help, she would have turned to someone familiar like she did when she called her mom. The elusive Emma. 
According to her mother, mental illness runs on both sides of Emma's family. You have to admire Shelley for her candor. After reading the thousands of letters and journals left by her daughter in her van, she realized that M was suffering from serious mental deterioration and had been depressed and troubled for a very long time and did not want to bother anyone with her pain. She realized the extent of her despair, but too late. On her computer, they found a note from dead Emma. And I, they went over this on Fifth Estate, if you remember. To everyone from dead Emma, Hello, I figure someone will be on this computer at some point and will read this. Okay, so I'm dead, floating about on energy or not, watching dying stars, reviving stars, and dreaming milky dreams and shadow dancing on your timelines or whatever. Good luck, every heart. I love you, M. So they concluded it really wasn't indicative of suicide because there was no real intention of any kind of action or anything like that, or even really a call for help. It was mostly just written almost some kind of abstract, poetic. What do you make of that? Um, I don't know. I miss what you said. Maxwell Army. Um, do you remember yeah. the poem they went over from Dead Emma? Nah. What were you doing the past minute while I was reading it? Uh, I didn't know you were reading a poem. I just said on the computer they found a note from... I was probably Stephanie. thinking about something else. <laughs> Are you ready to listen to it? Because we're doing a podcast? Uh, I, well, I'm trying to listen to it, but I... To everyone from Dead Emma. Hello. I figure someone will be on this computer at some point and will read this. Okay, so I'm dead. Floating about on energy or not, watching dying stars, reviving stars, and dreaming milky dreams and shadow dancing on your timelines or whatever. Good luck, every heart. I love you, M. Oh, yeah, I remember that on the TV uh, yeah. the documentary. That was pretty yeah. cool. So they were well, actually they pretty smart and. Yeah, well, they concluded it wasn't indicative of suicide because there was no intention to harm herself. There was no real cry for help. It was just kind of this poetic, artistic note. Also, yeah, it was it was poetic and artistic or whatever. And it's also like uh, it can can also. I mean, she could have written that as an almost like a like a, almost like a journal to look upon, or even when she dies at ninety, like it, it's like it's so. Yeah, we don't. Uh, there's no, there's no indication of any yes. uh, immediate harm to her. I get, yes, I agree. I agree. Her mood fluctuated like the wind, and she could have written it on a bad day, or simply because she knew that one day someone would find her computer and it would mean that she was dead. Mind you, I tend to agree with Julian Huard, who remarked that Emma was so private that the idea of anyone reading what was on her computer would definitely be because she was walking towards a certain death, physical or otherwise. One of the fifth estate experts concluded that the dead Emma's note did not sound like a regular suicide letter. Sorry, but none of her emails ever sounded like regular communication. I suspect that dead Emma was often contemplating ending it, and at other times, happy Emma was enthused about life. She was ill, so keeping her head above water must have been more and more grueling. As she said herself, she was missing from her own life. I mean, that's kind of poetic to even say something like that. I've never really heard people say, I'm missing from my own life. I mean, there's the, there's the old, I guess, cliche saying, you're just watching life pass you by and you're not doing much. But to be missing from your own life, I mean, that's kind of deep. Yeah. Shelley remained in BC for a few months and visited friends and acquaintances or anyone who could have seen or talked to Emma. Emma had worked in a seasonal restaurant called Redfish Bluefish, and they were expecting her back for the reopening, but she never showed. It was like she had evaporated into thin air. A team of divers scored the harbor but found nothing. Billboards were erected on main roads and a reward of $25,000 was offered but to no avail. What's in the cards? 
This case has become an enigma, and many have talked about it around the water cooler or participated in physical searches or investigative activities. As they say, you find out how important you are by how long they look for you if you are missing. This quest seems eternal. Because I had nothing new to add but my humble opinion about the case, I decided to consult Pamela Valmont from Australia, who does forensic numerology criminal profiling. That's pretty interesting, and had never heard of the case before. I only gave her Emma's name and date of birth and the date of her disappearance. So Emma Filipoff, 5441 for the letters, 6933-97666 for the last name. So that equals 14, master 55, whatever that means, 69 out of 6, or 69 slash 6, 30 slash 3, soul, 39 slash 3. EMM plus 1 is 5 plus 13 plus 13 plus 1, 32 slash 5. AEM plus 6 it equals 1 plus 5 plus 13 plus 6, 25 slash 7. MAE plus 1986 equals 13 plus 1 plus 5 plus 24, 43 slash 7. Cycle, age 26 in 2012. 2012 birthday, 26 plus. 2038 equals 13 slash 4 death cycle. Mediated throughout the master 38 slash 11 between her birthday on January 6, 2012 and May 6, 2012. This is when the illness struck. Most probably in the month of January between January 6th and February 6th. She was then in a personal 12 slash 3 year. 6 plus 1 plus 20, 12 equals 12 slash 3. Ruling the throat. And when you add the number 1 for the first month, you get the number 13 slash 4. So death month in a death cycle mediated through the illness ruling the goiter. I think she had a goiter problem initially, which progressed to Hashimoto's disease. Disease, I think she was suffering a thyroid storm. In all likelihood left untreated, she would have lapsed into a coma and died eventually. Prior to that, she would have been so disoriented that she would not have been capable of taking care of herself or her financial affairs. It is possible dementia and extreme paranoia ensued prior to death. As I said, hopefully someone rescued her and got her medical aid. But it is a small hope, really, isn't it? Goiter, 769295 equals master 38 slash 11. On the face of it, she does have the potential to totally remake her life and may have made a decision to change direction entirely. Life lesson 31 slash 4 and soul number of 30 slash 3 indicating independent lady who fits well into the male business-dominated world. She would have been drawn to Australia and the UK. In November 2012, she was having a reversal in friends and fortune. 12 slash 3 year, throat problems, possibly thyroid, which can cause mental illness. On her birthday in 2013, she entered the death year, 13 slash 4, but she had already vanished by then. Can be a dangerous year for suicide and terminal or life-threatening illness, but equally it can be a remake or break year. Do or die, and she may have decided to begin again far away. In November 2012, she was in her soul cycle at that time, dominated by the numbers 42 slash 6 and 8. The former indicates a love relationship and either marriage or commitment and a new home, resulting or negatively divorce and separation and moving out of the coupled relationship. Eight means it could have been with a person of either sex. Best to look into who she was seeing at the time and where that person is right now. I think that will give you the answer you seek. I have found another number, which means that she also had connections to the USA. So she may have disappeared with someone who is American, Australian, or British by birth. Wow, that really narrows it down. Since those are the largest number of people in Canada, I think, are from those areas. I am absolutely sure she was in some kind of relationship or thought she was anyway at the time of her disappearance. And this has led 
to her sudden departure from the scene. She may have called that person to come and get her. Clearly, she was thinking of leaving the country or the city at least. I can't find any concrete evidence of foul play. Another number I have found in the chart clearly indicates the likelihood of thyroid disease like Hashimoto's. And if this was not diagnosed, I'd say that was the cause of her mental illness. If it was, okay, I would say that if she has come to harm, it did not happen immediately, but after her birthday on January 6, 2013. This suggests she may have gone voluntarily with the person she left the scene with rather than an abductor. However, given her parlous circumstances, that person she left with may have feigned friendship, of course, to take advantage of her condition. If she did have Hashimoto's, as I suspect, without medical intervention, she would die within days, weeks, or months. Sounds like she was in a pretty bad way. She should have been admitted to a hospital for tests. Anyone who tried to help her may have found themselves with a dead body on their hands in pretty quick time. They may have been afraid to come forward. Hopefully, best scenario is she found medical help in time, but if so, it is strange that no doctor or hospital has come forward to announce they had treated her. Iodine deficiency caused by no salt intake is fatal, and many people, in fact, most people do not realize that. What was the season at the time, November, it would have been cold by then. If she fell down unconscious in the woods, she would freeze to death overnight. Falling into a coma suddenly is what people with Hashimoto's do. Can you find out if she was losing hair at all? Falling or thinning hair, dry skin, feeling unnaturally cold, and putting on extra layers of clothing when others are quite warm would not have been noticed in November, though it would have been in summertime. Losing weight is another symptom. She could have died after January 2013. Clearly, she was not far off that year numerologically, so the illness was becoming more and more serious by November 2012. My diagnosis is she developed severe thyroid disease and that caused her illness in the first place. Can you find out from her mom if she was ever tested for that illness? That is very important in determining what might have become her fate. She could have fallen into a coma and died somewhere, which is what happens with Hashimoto's disease if it is not diagnosed in time. It sounds like she was having thyroid crisis at the time of her disappearance. All the symptoms are there. Manic, hallucinations, and yes, vegan diet without any salt containing iodine will definitely cause Hashimoto's disease. This disease and the mortality rate from it is the very reason salt is now required to contain iodine. Without iodine, cretinism in babies and severe mental illness is the result. Master 38-11 on her chart means she was is in the firing line for this disease. A walk in the woods. I found Pamela Valmont reading interesting, especially knowing now that Emma was suffering from a severe mental breakdown when she vanished. Again, we don't know if that had something to do with a stalker. I wondered if they checked her health card and who she had visited during the recent months. Was there a case of a Jane Doe in Seattle in any of their hospitals? Was her story published in the U.S. and especially in neighboring cities? In theory, it would have been easy for Emma to slip away with someone to the U.S. or deep into the country and off the grid. But practically speaking, and considering her mental health on November 28th, she was too much in dire need of help and health care to be able to do so. Especially after listening to the very sad interview with Mika, who was Emma's roommate for three months and witnessed her descent into despair and mental illness. It is possible that Emma who could walk manically for eight hours at a time, went deep into the woods until the point of exhaustion and passed out and passed at one with nature. I prefer to think that she quit her life and with the help of a kind soul, found a new path away from her worries. I doubt very much that she could have joined the homeless drug addicts at Vancouver downtown east side. She would have been spotted on the ferry and her inescapable health problems would have made her too vulnerable and noticeable. She would have eventually been noticed and picked up or brought to a hospital. I know that area very well, and it is not that anonymous. Plus, $25,000 is a lot of money, so someone would have made a call. Until the mystery is resolved, we are left with Emma and her poem. There is promise. Are you ready, Maxwell? Yeah. This is her poem. There is promise of flight, and I lay in fear. In fear somehow, somewhere. Sometime, fear crept in. She's missing. 
I am missing. Almost sounds like a split personality or something. Yeah. That's weird. Can you repeat that again? That's that's like I, I'm trying to analyze that. Not, not not necessarily because I didn't hear it, but I don't know. Wait, where where was this found? This was part of her computer. Or yeah, I'm I'm assuming or her letters from before. There is promise of flight, and I lay in fear, in fear somehow, somewhere, sometime. Fear crept in. She's missing. I am missing. She's missing. I am missing. I'm wondering if she's referring to I as kind of like this ego thing, like the the I, the I ness of her. She's missing. I am missing. I don't know. I am missing. Hmm. She is missing. I am missing. What did you What did you think of the numerology expert and their reading? Um, I don't know. It's kind of confusing, but you know. <laughs> I met a numerology person and that... she, had a, I, she had a thyroid disorder. Was that confirmed or something? No, that was a numerology expert saying that. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, was it like... As far as I she... know, no. Otherwise, I would have said it was. If there's any information, I would have already given it to you. Uh, okay. Well, I guess it's okay. I mean, I don't know what to say to that. I mean, it's... But I did meet a numerology expert in real life, and he, he got pretty close to, <laughs> oh, man, a few things about me. And, and I try to analyze and be objective about it. Like, damn, it's kind of, I don't know, it's weird. <laughs> so, yeah. All right, so it seems like she may have been uh, suffering from mental I issues, possibly relating to Hashimoto's as this numerology expert's thinks that she might have been but what's also interesting she leaves the door open to she might have escaped and redid her life in which case uh she probably chose somewhere far away but we don't know but yeah this is definitely gonna have to be a multi-parter because there's still plenty to go over and the new leads that we didn't get to but once again if you enjoyed this podcast you can donate to our paypal just check the link in the description make sure you subscribe to the channel hit the bell for notifications if you like the podcast hit the like button feel free to share it across social media platforms and you can also like our Facebook page, check us out, Twitter, Reddit, Patreon. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. And Massel Powers. We'll catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Emma Philippoff series, Emma Philippoff Part 2, Tracing Her Steps. I am your host, Bruce McGuire. I'm Maxwell Powell. And we are going to go through an in-depth timeline, trying to trace all of her steps up to her disappearance, in typical mind shock fashion, leaving no stone unturned. As always, if you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the podcast, hit the like button. Feel free to share it across social media platforms. Make sure to follow and like our Facebook page for exclusive updates and releases. And you can also check us out on Twitter, Reddit, and Patreon. And Patrons do get priority for case requests. All right, Maxwell, so now that you've had quite some time since our first episode to think about what happened to Emma Filipov. Do you have a leading theory? I do not. Uh, I might need a review on Emma Filipov. I know she went missing. She had a van that she lived in a couple days or something like that. And then, and then this, I, I don't remember. Yeah, the circumstances, the circumstances of the van and many other things in this case are all very bizarre. It's, uh, the more, I, the more I dove into the case, there does seem to be some shady element surrounding her life. And again, as we've talked about in the first episode, if she was having personal or mental problems and was vulnerable, doesn't that increase the chance that she would be the victim of some kind of uh, predator instead of decrease? Because now if, if she's not, people always say, 
in in the true crime community, there's there's a lot a lot of online chatter about people that wander off and die because they're in some kind of mental haze or conditioning. W- wouldn't that make it more likely that you know some kind of shady individual would take advantage of them because they don't even know what's going on? <laughs> It's just, it's, it's really mind-boggling, mind-shocking, if you will, for people to just completely write off any and all possible nefarious activity because someone may have been having mental issues. And we've looked at this. It's very possible she's not having mental issues. She's just an eccentric individual. And again, we really don't know. Maybe she was, maybe she wasn't. It's impossible to really give 100% definitive certainty to it. So let's get into it. Let's retrace her steps. So quick overview. We're going to go from fall 2011 to November 28th, 2012. So she moved from Perth, Ontario to Victoria, British Columbia. This is from helpfindemmaphilipoff.com. Emma always wanted to live out west and made the move to Victoria in the fall of 2011. She was 25 at the time and had no home or job lined up. Her plan was to figure things out once she arrived. She told a friend she had a feeling something amazing was going to happen in Victoria. Life in Victoria. Emma lived with a childhood friend and friend's partner for a few months after her arrival, eventually moving to another unit in the same building. In the winter of 2011, she found employment as a barista at a cafe, but the job did not last long. After two or three months in Victoria, Emma developed a more transient lifestyle, moving in with another friend for a few months, living at Hotel 760, where she also worked cleaning rooms, staying on two, possibly three boats, sleeping in the woods, and sometimes sleeping in a tree. From February to November 2012, she also stayed in the attic of the Sandy Merriman Women's Shelter on a rotating basis, usually for a month at a time. She obtained a seasonal job at the Inner Harbor Seafood Eatery, Redfish Bluefish, where she was employed during the busy months in 2012 until October 31st. She was expected to return to the job in February 2013. Another interesting point here. It's she did not get fired. She didn't necessarily quit with no intention to go back. It was a little bit of a temp job when they were seasonally more busy. So she did have technically another a job lined up. This is not somebody with no hope wandering the streets as sometimes it's presented. You following, Maxwell? Gotcha. And we touched upon that in the previous episode as well, but I thought it was another point to reiterate because some people really get stuck on their theory or they just think, again, without knowing what happened, it's impossible to say what's more or less likely. And even if you could say what was more or less likely, what does that have to do with the truth? How would you know a less likely scenario didn't happen here? Likelihood can only be measured when comparing to other scenarios with the same amount of information. But the amount of information, not only is it different in every case, some of these pieces are unverifiable, and then we don't even know. We have some unknown unknowns. We have, and then, of course, known unknowns. There's so many variables missing, it's impossible to say what's more or less likely. And even if you could, that doesn't mean one thing didn't happen versus another thing. All right. During her time in Victoria, Emma communicated with family and friends back home through cryptic, poetic, upbeat emails and the occasional phone call on the holidays. Her loved ones were unaware that she was living in a shelter. Emma could often be found reading in the children's section of the library or quietly meditating in the sun. She enjoyed spending time with members of the homeless community with boat owners and artists down at the Inner Harbor, and with street performers around town. The many friends and acquaintances she made in different circles describe her in such terms as free-spirited, creative, adventurous, giving, soft-spoken, private, independent, trusting, flighty, highly sensitive to people, and very brave to sleep alone in the woods. She is very kind and likes caring for people, especially the elderly, children, and pets. She is a skilled chef, photographer, and artist. She loves to write and maintains several journals and a blog. She prefers nature to city life, 
favors walking barefoot, loves travel and adventure, adores her family and friends, and is known to have an aversion to convention, intrusive questions, social media, cell phones, spending money, and playing any role in the establishment. <laughs> you know, when, when it's phrased like that, it, it almost paints her as more sane than the insane people who choose all those other things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting. While her beauty and friendly nature attracted the attention of many in Victoria, she only dated one person that year. The brief relationship ended after three months on a mutually positive note. She was reported to have enjoyed drinking and socializing with friends. She always offered a listening ear to others and freely shared her laughter and joy for life, but was not prone to sharing any inner thoughts or struggles. She told people how much she loved her family, but rarely talked about them. Huh. You think there's a clue there, Maxwell? About her not talking about family? Well, her freely talking about how much she loved her family, but not actually talking about the individuals themselves. Uh, not really. No, she's probably just private. Friends said by summer of 2012, Emma was in search of a more pure lifestyle. She quit binge drinking in June and also cut out cigarettes, coffee, and sugar. Some say she had occasionally smoked marijuana. Others report never seeing her take any kind of drug. She is vegan and said to have been experimenting with different combinations of food. Grains of rice, popcorn, pieces of fish. By late summer, she was eating less and less and drinking copious amounts of water daily. A friend who also worked on the waterfront said she grew very thin and described her as becoming monk-like in her social and eating habits. She appeared to have trouble adapting to the changing seasons, and by beginning of fall, she seemed very unsure about where to go and what to do with herself in the upcoming winter months. Shortly before her disappearance, she began to distance herself from others, becoming fearful, withdrawn, and paranoid. All right, so that's the background. Now let's get into her van because the van is is bizarre. And I've often stated uh, in the previous episode that it's a lot of the trouble seemed to possibly have started with the van. It could have started a chain reaction when her van was towed. So in June or July of 2012, Emma purchased a van with the intention of living in it and traveling around the island. Staff from a storage facility remember her beaming with joy the day she moved her personal effects from locker to the van. She was thrilled to be reunited with her belongings and looked forward to the independence the vehicle would provide her. However, in time, the hopeful purchase proved to be a financial burden and hindrance to the freedom she sought. The van had to be towed three times shortly before Emma vanished, and she had been asking around for the name of an inexpensive mechanic. So that's an, another interesting piece of information I don't believe we went over in episode one, that she was asking for an inexpensive mechanic. Okay, travel plan. All right, we'll come back to the van in a moment. We're just going down all this background information. Travel plans. Emma talked to many people about her desire to travel and seemed to be preparing for some kind of move. In mid-November, she told a friend she was leaving Victoria and possibly heading to Salt Spring Island or Tofino, British Columbia. Friends recall her other plans, sailing on a boat to Mexico heading to San Juan with a man she barely knew, moving to California, moving to Costa Rica, traveling to Japan with her father, that's one that's come up a bunch of times, living off the grid somewhere in the woods, visiting an aunt in Lanceville, British Columbia, and surprising her family by going back home to Perth, Ontario. Okay, so that's a wide range of travel plans. How do we parse through these plans to see what's, uh, what seems to be more or less likely? What jumps out to me is going to San Juan with a man she barely knew. I wonder where they got that piece of information. Okay. Does that seem a little bit strange or uh, potentially dangerous to you, Maxwell? That she got picked up by a stranger? 
Uh, no, not at all. That people were sharing her plans, and she said one of them was to go to San Juan with a man she barely knew. Not a stranger, so it's an acquaintance of some kind. So either this acquaintance offered to go to San Juan, or if she had just met him once or twice or three times, they just randomly talked about it. That's what I just said two times now. <laughs> um, uh, it's okay. I, I don't know. You got to trust people. Was that Maxwell's advice to the world? I don't think that's good advice, Maxwell. We're, we're doing a missing persons podcast. <laughs> um, I don't know, because I've done the same. I don't know. Just, uh, well, maybe be, you might not be a random predator's number one target to, <laughs> to kidnap and put, you know, like. <laughs> yeah, I know. I guess for like a pretty girl, it's different, but. All right. So no further thoughts from Maxwell. Early warning signs. Entries in Emma's journal suggest she had been privately suffering with mental health issues as early as the age of 11. For years, her secretive and quiet nature enabled her to hide her inner turmoil from family and friends. You know what's weird, though? Like, we went through her poems on the previous episode, we, and, and going through some of her writings, and, and the analysis on the Fifth Estate also, it did not seem like she was suicidal, and they were, there was... You know, obviously different experts would agree interpreting those poems and language. Is it possible? She's just simply eccentric. People label this mental illness because it's not like everybody else. So that's, that might be premature and even inaccurate. Because if she's not normal, and by normal, the definition being average, that doesn't mean she has a mental illness to the point where she can't live life I mean, we don't know. Maybe she did, maybe she didn't. But I don't know if we can just base that off journal entries. And especially, like, starting at age 11, what does that mean? I mean, people, humans are still developing if she's, if that was just her, her nature of being eccentric or whatnot, being different than most people, and it was manifesting early, and it had nothing to do with being non-functional. Because she seemed to have been, again, some people say her mental health issues declined. And if that was the case, that's different. But, and we, we went over the one, the one theory by, I don't know if it was a tarot reading or a psychic reading, that she might have been developing Hashimoto's disease or a thyroid condition due to her diet experimentation, which could have led to some issues. Obviously, no body was found. So it's, it's very, the whole case is, is very, very difficult. So much information. But in the winter of 2011, a childhood friend and roommate in Victoria saw warning signs when she observed Emma often obsessively arranging patterns using objects such as feathers, shells, rocks, and food. Sometimes she insisted others participate in these compulsive rituals. Her friend contacted Emma's father, James, out of concern after she woke one night to find Emma outside in a euphoric state high on the grass and stars. Emma was very upset to learn James has been, had been contacted and declined his offer to fly her home. She insisted she would be fine on her own. Her parents were divorced and her father failed to inform Emma's mother, Shelley, about the incident. Shelley had stated she would have flown out immediately had she been aware of what was going on. According to three friends in British Columbia, Emma had been experiencing ongoing stress related to feeling harassed by someone she had a bad experience with years prior in Campbell River, British Columbia, where she studied culinary arts in 2008-2009. She did not provide details, nor did she reveal his identity to her friends and in her journal. That's pretty interesting, though. So, yes, we talked about this individual briefly in the first episode as well. So she either had a stalker or some kind of individual that she was involved with. You would, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird. What, why do you think she didn't name him, mention him to anybody, or write him down in her private journal, which I guess she either wasn't expecting anybody to read, or if she was expecting people to read it, she didn't want to name him because maybe maybe she believed she was partly responsible or some other thing that may or may not have been true, but it may have led her to not write his name. What are the reasons she might have not named him? Uh, it could be just random. I mean, because I, I sometimes write journals and 
I forget to put things in. Yeah, but not everybody's for, as forgetful as you, Maxwell. Like normally, people would write the, at least the first name, right? If they don't want, if they don't want the individual to face any legal ramifications, you would at least either put the first name or a nickname, right? I'm talking just like putting in the journal, the events or whatever. But she did put, but she did put the events. She just didn't put his name. Ah, uh, no kidding. Yeah, do you pay attention at all, man? <laughs> I didn't know. Oh, that's cool. Um, well, that's weird. All right, I get it. Well, um, she didn't say she. I don't know if she provide. She did the exact details. She's someone. So three friends in British Columbia said that Emma had been experiencing ongoing stress related to feeling harassed by someone she had a bad experience with years prior in Campbell River. That's kind of weird. If that's if that was several years prior, 2008, 2009, that's not that many years, two years, two and a half years, three years. She did not provide details, nor did she re reveal his identity to her friends and in her journal. Yeah, it's weird the way that's phrased. Maybe there were no details in the journal, but she, it says she did not provide details, nor did she reveal his identity to her friends and in her journal. So maybe she didn't write it in her journal, but she apparently three friends said the same thing, that there was ongoing stress related to feeling harassed by someone, by this someone that she had a relationship with in 2008, 2009. Okay. Or actually, no, it says, man, this is not phrased well. Years prior in Campbell River, Campbell River was where she studied culinary arts in 2008, 2009. I guess we assume that was during that time period. All right. A roommate recalls Emma expressing the need to avoid social situations where she had to interact with men. The reason she chose not to stay in co-ed shelters. Those who knew her in Victoria say Emma seemed friendly, articulate, playful, clever, and sociable. However, by early November of 2012, she had grown distant and friends noticed a dramatic change in her behavior and personality. She refused invitations to go on adventures canceled a trip to Mexico with a friend at the last minute. Okay, that's a new detail. So apparently there was a, a trip to Mexico. And again, people who say she didn't have any friends or whatnot, apparently she had a lot of friends. Just going through all of this history and details available, she had a lot of friends and acquaintances, it seems. And she was going to go on to Mexico with a friend, and she's a world traveler. She canceled last minute. That does that seem out of character, Maxwell? Especially if there is someone shady in this area, wouldn't she want to get away? But when was that? When was that? As far as with the timeline and when she went missing, it says by early November. And, and when, when did she? When did she go missing? <laughs> Good thing you're doing a podcast on Emma Philippon. <laughs> what do you mean? She went missing November 28th, 2012. So as I just stated a moment ago, in early November, so she went missing on, 28, on the 28th. In early November, she had grown distant and friends noticed a dramatic change in her behavior and personality. She refused invitations to go on adventures, canceled a trip to Mexico with a friend at the last minute, and generally seemed frightened to go anywhere that wasn't the pier or the shelter. So, yeah, that, that is a little strange. So this, was, this trip was early November. I guess early, if it was canceled last minute, it could, have, it, could have, uh, it could have happened anywhere from early November to, I guess, mid-November to, I guess, several days before she vanished. We don't know. But that month, roughly that month, does that give you the information you need to give forth your input? Or did you just <laughs> ask that for no reason like you usually do? I'll, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to see, like, the state of mind like how like because you're saying that she had a lot of friends i mean and, and she like if she because i don't remember the details but like if she went missing the day before and she was about to go out with friends it's kind of like uh i don't know it's kind of weird i'm trying to see her state of mind so it's been a month so she, her so it's been a month that she's been in that state where she's kind of like a couple weeks yeah it. yeah early november so it'd be at a couple weeks yeah so it's not like six months, you know. Right. Like, yes. Yeah. So yeah, and they said it's like dramatic change. So like, how how often did they see her? Did they see her like two months before that? And did, was it just that time? Like, so a month before that she was perfectly fine, and then and then 
and they saw her again for that when they invited her out, and then she... Well, we also have to call into question the friend's ability to even notice changes, because if her normal eccentric personality is like this, where she's sometimes she's one way, sometimes she's another way, because some people are like that, so unless you were with that person every day for months and months and months, if they have some kind of normal mood swing cycle or something that appears to be mood swings, if that's their normal personality and they caught her on a downturn and then they just happened to not hang out with her when she was on an upturn, that could account for it. Also, we have to examine if someone harmed her and if, if it was one of the friends, are they putting out false narratives? Because the mentally disturbed suicide angle, I mean, obviously that's that's a go-to to murderers covering their tracks, right? Yeah. But we don't know how many people were involved. If it was just one friend, it would seem unlikely that other friends would say the same thing, so we really don't know. But on the other hand, it's again, it's difficult. If some of these friends are homeless people or transients or whatnot, some of them might not give reliable testimony or they might be described some of them might not be articulate where maybe they were just they were, they were phrasing it as there was this one incident but somehow the phrasing it came out where whoever was asking him the questions was led to believe it was numerous incidents and then they ascribed that to a change in personality we really don't know we have to examine every single possibility here so, again, you want to finish your thought relating to the last-minute canceled trip to Mexico, because the question I was asking is if she's a world traveler, one, she would want to go. Two, if she felt like she was being harassed or stalked in that area, wouldn't she want to go to Mexico? Or three, uh, that's a good point. Or three, was she paranoid with the friend that she was going with? Either justly so or unjustly so. Like, if that friend was involved with someone else who she was wary of, she might have just not wanted to deal with that friend in the first place, even though she might have wanted to go to Mexico. We don't know any of these variables. These are all missing variables. But this is mind shock, and we have to go through all of them. So, are you going to finish your thought or no? Now that you uh, know, you know when she was, went missing... I'm mostly, I'm mostly curious about, like, I'm trying to see just her state, usually, when I ask those questions. Well, now that you know... Uh, now it's been a month. Well, that trip could have been a week. The trip could have been a week prior to disappearance. We don't know. We just know that between early November and November twenty eighth, several things happened. Change in personality. And, and and you said, and I guess they they were planning it. They wait. They were they were pre planned, and she just she wanted to go, and then she canceled last minute. Right. That's what it says. And so the planning was like. I guess a month before. I'm guessing, maybe. I yeah. mean, if it's it seems so like that it means, would, that means she's still she's yeah, still in the right state of mind. It seems like it would be at least a few weeks, anywhere between a few weeks to a few months, right? People plan people plan trips a few months ahead, especially with expensive airfare or whatnot. She might have planned that trip six months prior, but she chose to cancel it last minute in November. Not she didn't cancel it in October or September if it was planned many months ahead, which we don't know. You need to come out with a working memory supplement. It'd be like uh, <laughs> Maxwell Plus. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good one. But now that you have all this information in mind, now what? What are you going to do with it, Maxwell? If the trip was planned I, several months ahead, like it normal, like most trips are, I don't know if I would say one month. It seems like people who, I mean, it, it could have been a month. It could, what difference does it make? If it was a month or six months, she didn't choose to cancel it until that window between early November and November 28th? I don't know. I was just curious. You have no thought? Well, I can't really gather, like, any, so, like, uh, I can't really, um, I don't know. I need more information. <laughs> just trying but to get is, to know the girl. But there is no more information. We're just discussing different theories. I didn't ask you for a diff Obviously, I know you don't know exactly what happened, but this is a, this is a true crime podcast where we're discussing possibilities. I just laid out three pos I just laid out three points relating to the canceled trip. I'll lay them out again. One, if she's a world traveler, she likes adventure and travel. She would probably want to go on the trip to Mexico. Two, if she fears she has a stalker or somebody harassing her, she's wary of people in that area. She would want to go to Mexico, get away, at least for a bit, right? Three, unless that friend that she was going with 
there was an either an issue or she either justly or falsely believed that that friend was associated with someone else that she was wary of, so she'd rather just not deal with the friend in general. We don't know. But those are the three points of information that would help. Now, regardless of any of those that are true, you have absolutely no thoughts. I'm asking for the fifth time, I guess, relating well, to the decision. Well, it's, well, you've covered a lot. I'm just saying it's probably just uh, canceling something it could be a sign of like depression. I mean, if she's really looking forward to it and she's she's really depressed, she doesn't really feel like doing anything. That's a good point. That's a good point. If she was depressed, she, she might have done that, yes. Okay. So it seems like she, she was frightened to go anywhere that wasn't the pier or the shelter. So the shelter, that makes sense. But the pier, the pier, is that really the safest place? I don't know. That's kind of weird also. About two weeks before she vanished, one friend recalled driving by the shelter and saw Emma looking cold and wet, standing motionless, staring blankly at a murder of crows nearby. I, I think that should be probably stated as... She could have just been staring at crows nearby. I mean, I know a, a, a flock of crows is called a murder, but that it seems like that probably, that word, I don't know if I would use it in a missing persons case. But anyway, so a friend drove by the shelter, saw Emma looking cold and wet, standing motionless, staring blankly at crows nearby. What do you think about that? Um, I missed it. I said it twice. Just the last part. Said it twice back to back. She was cold and wet, standing motionless, staring blankly at crows nearby. Oh, shit. That's kind of cool. Why would you say that was cool? I don't know. It looked like a movie scene. <laughs> you know, I don't... See, that's kind of weird. Like, when you... I don't know if you do this, but some people... I mean, I've seen people zoned out, staring blankly. I mean, it depends on how long. If they're doing it for an hour, that's pretty disturbing. If she was doing it for, like, one minute, I don't know. I've seen people do that. I don't think there's anything wrong with them. I've seen, you know, homeless people do that. I've seen businessmen, you know, on, on a commute, like, they're just standing in the street. Sometimes they're just staring at something zoned out. And I'm sure I've done that, too. I almost, do it all the time. Almost. <laughs> I would imagine you would, Maxwell. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I don't know. Is that the brain just, like, taking a micro break from life? Or or she might have been fascinated by the by the crows. I mean, it is... I don't know. I don't know. Usually, what usually, usually zoning out is kind of like uh, internalizing uh, the thought process. Like, you're internally processing. Um, you're inside your head, pretty much, to, just to put it simply. So without knowing if she was there doing that for five hours, I mean, that would be that would be alarming. But if she was doing it for a minute or two, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure what, what we could draw from that. Around this same time, shelter staff and residents also started to notice signs of paranoia and depression. She kept her curtains drawn at all times and was discovered frantically moving furniture from the shelter out to the curb and across the street because she claimed they were making too much noise and saying things to her. Just as she had done in Ontario before moving to Victoria, Emma began selling, donating, and even throwing away her personal belongings. This, be this behavior led shelter staff to suspect she might be suicidal and or suffering from mental illness. Unable to contact her parents due to privacy laws, they called police to request a mental health check. Staff explained the situation over the phone and police, rather than visit the shelter to assess Emma, told staff to call back if they noticed any more odd behavior. Staff did not call back. That's alarming. During this time, a concerned roommate encouraged Emma to spend less time at the shelter by taking out a membership at the YMCA and visiting the library as often as she could. She also strongly advised Emma to call her mother. So I don't believe we've discussed this individual. So this was a roommate that said this to Emma. You make anything of that, Maxwell, or did you not? Or did you miss that also? Um, uh, yeah, 
Yeah, I missed it. Oh, man, your brain is unusually off today. <laughs> Emma made a series of tearful phone calls to her mother starting on the night of November 23rd. Shelly assured her each time they spoke that she would make the necessary arrangements for her to come home. Emma consistently called back the next day, insisting she would stay in Victoria to work things out on her own. This cycle of changing her mind occurred four times over the next four days. During one of these phone calls, Emma told Shelly she did not know how she could face her. A close acquaintance reported seeing a very anxious Emma by the harbor a day or two before she vanished. When he asked their circle of friends what was wrong, they explained she was concerned about her mother arriving in Victoria. Emma's final call to her mother was made on the morning of the 28th. She said, don't come, mom, not today. Shelley said there was a noticeable change in Emma's voice, which greatly concerned her. Again, Shelley's, the, Shelley's the mom? Yes. Against the advice of family members who wanted to respect Emma's need for independence, Shelley put everything on hold and took a flight out later that same afternoon. With a history of mental illness in the family, her mother was very worried and felt Emma needed her. You can't argue with a mother's intuition. According to witnesses, Emma returned to the shelter at around 6 p.m. that evening and it was informed by staff at Sandy Merriman that her mother was on her way. She became visibly upset and anxious and quickly stormed out of the shelter. Another resident tried to pursue her outside but was unable to catch up with her. It is unclear how staff knew Shelley was on her way as she did not tell them she was coming. That was another bizarre point we discussed on episode one. She, Shelly arrived at the shelter at around 11 p.m. and learned that Emma did not claim her bed that night. Shortly after midnight, shelter staff called police to report Emma as a missing person. This whole thing is just so sad because her mom must have just missed her by just a few hours. And how differently this could have all turned out if the staff did not tell her that her mother was coming. Uh, it, it's a very tough situation because obviously you want to value an adult's privacy. But here's the thing, though. This same staff called police for a mental health check. So clearly they're not 100 percent certain that this individual is 100 percent well to the point where their wishes, for example, to not have their mother arrive. Because we don't know the history, too, because the staff doesn't know if the mother was abusive or if it's not a real mother or whatever there could be infinite situations where they're not necessarily going to call be calling the mother and tell her to come but how did they know she was coming yeah so if she if she didn't know that she was coming she the mom would have arrived if the staff didn't inform well the mom was arriving no matter what oh because uh, but the staff informed her and informed means- emma the staff informed emma but but yeah, yeah, and- but shelly never told them she was coming so she was coming your question was kind of hilarious if the staff hadn't told emma then the mom would not have arrived <laughs> wait um i meant like the mom i mean emma would not have left i meant oh possibly not yeah correct possibly not but here's the thing though why not okay, again the need for privacy needs to be respected why not also call the police if they knew the mom was coming why not also have the police there just in case because if the mom if she really doesn't want the mom there and the police are there like there should have been some kind of more of an effort to help her especially given the fact that they were concerned because they were concerned enough to call police and request a mental health check police didn't seem to care and they said just to call back, and then the staff never called back. Now, either that could be one of two reasons. One, they didn't think the police were going to do anything, so why would they waste time dealing with them if they didn't want to help? Or two, they just figured, I guess, Emma wasn't that unwell because she just continued to function. I don't know. But yes, it just the whole thing is just so sad because the mom just barely missed her. All right, so... Yeah, so after midnight, the shelter staff called police to report Emma missing person. All right, so let's go through the exact timeline and sightings. Tuesday, November 20th at the YMCA, Emma visits the YMCA located down the street from the shelter to take out a membership. So she just became a member on November 20th. Is that coincidental because it's relatively close to the date of her disappearance? So was there someone there 
that could have spotted her or some kind of an issue could have happened. We don't know. Surveillance video shows her entering and exiting the building four times within a 14-minute period. Okay, this is a piece of information we didn't have before. She's going to take out a membership, so now I think it's even less suspicious that she's coming and going four times because can she not make up her mind whether or not she wants to become a member? What do I mean by that? Exactly what I said. So the friend at the shelter, one of the roommates at the shelter told her that she should she could take out a membership at the YMCA so she wouldn't spend so much time at the shelter. So she's, from the information presented here, November 20th, the date the YMCA footage is from, that's the date that she's going to take out a membership. Okay. So if she can't decide, like if she goes in, takes a look around, walks out, she's like, eh, I don't know if I want to be a member. Well, maybe I should give it another look. And she goes and does it again. <laughs> surveillance video. We looked at the surveillance video in the episode one. Surveillance video shows her entering and exiting the building four times within a 14 minute period. She seems to be nervously peering out the glass doors as though waiting for or hiding from someone or something outside she pauses for approximately one minute each time as she exits and enters the building finally exiting for the last time and turning right some believe she was holding something in her hands such as a cell phone or an ipod others suspect she is simply fidgeting yeah the footage is strange it definitely again factoring that footage with the other convenience store footage it's it seems like she did think someone was after her, and is it I got I gotta see that footage again. Is it paranoia if somebody's really out to get you, or is it just awareness? Okay, Wednesday, November twenty first, the van is towed. Emma arranges to have a tow truck driver pick her up from Sandy Merriman Shelter and drive to Sook, British Columbia, to tow her red Mazda MPV back to the 700 block of Birded Ave in Victoria. She is upbeat during the ride and talks about her plan to surprise her family by moving back home to Perth, Ontario. The driver recalls her looking up at the snow in the mountains, telling him she couldn't wait to go home where she could see the sun and snow. Friday, November 23rd, first call to her mom. Emma calls Shelly in tears around midnight, says she wants to come home. For Emma to reach out for help is unusual, so Shelly assures her all arrangements will be made for her to fly home immediately. Are you booking the flight? Emma asks anxiously. She won't say what is bothering her, but tells her mother she is safe. Okay, is that just appeasing her mother, or is it that's because it's true? She's physically safe, but there is something bothering her. We don't know. Saturday, November 24th, Emma changes her mind. Emma calls back hours later, advising Shelly not to come and that she will stay and figure things out for herself. Shelly is worried and can sense something is terribly wrong, but reluctantly respects Emma's wishes and cancels the flight. Change of plan. Later that same night, Emma calls again to say she wants to come home but is overwhelmed and needs Shelly to travel to Victoria to help her pack all of her belongings. Shelly immediately books a flight. So what does that tell us? Because this is, this is a mysterious detail. So originally, she wants the flight booked so she could fly home. However, now a day later, Saturday, November 24th, she said she tells her mom that she needs her mom's help to pack. Okay, does that mean there's no critical danger? If there's critical danger, you you would why would you take all these countless belongings, right? You would just go. Right. So, is there no critical danger, no critical life-threatening danger, just some issues? And then she's overwhelmed. She wants her mom to come help her pack because she doesn't want to leave her stuff. Now, obviously, many people in many situations, they don't realize how critical an issue is. So if it, whether it's a stalker or whatever situation that we don't know about, if that person really or whatever the situation is, if it's dangerous to her, if it is life threatening, but she doesn't realize it, then she might be she's going to be more concerned about her belongings. Again, we really don't know. Okay, Sunday, November 25th, another change of plan. Emma phones her mother in the morning. So from the previous night, this is now the morning she has changed her mind again. 
She sounds calm and more confident during this call, but there is still a sadness in her voice. Shelly agrees not to come, but doesn't unpack. So does this mean Shelly is anticipating another call? That she changed her mind yet again if she's going back and forth? Okay, Van is towed again. Because of parking enforcement, Emma has no choice but to arrange for her van to be towed again from Burdett Ave to a parking lot at the Chateau Victoria Hotel. So, yeah, this whole situation with the van and all these different towings and her need for a mechanic, I'm sure that's troublesome for the mind, especially if that's packed on to another situation like a stalker or something else. Tuesday, November 27th, growing concerns. Shelly grows increasingly concerned and decides to dial the number on her call display, thinking Sandy Merriman might be the name of a friend Emma is staying with. She speaks to a staff member and is shocked to learn that Emma has been living in the woman's shelter on and off since the winter of 2011. So about a year. Notice on the van. Staff from the Chateau Victoria put a notice on Emma's van to have it towed on Tuesday, November 27th. So now her van's going to need to be towed again. Okay. Emma calls her mom later that night, Tuesday, November 27th. Emma calls her mother again in tears, asking for help to come home. Shelly immediately makes arrangements to fly out the next day. I mean, this whole case is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so rough. So just another quick note on the towing. So it was towed to the Chateau Victoria November 21st. It was towed from Burdette Street to Chateau Victoria, November 25th. November 27th, the staff notice. On November 28th, the day of her disappearance at 7 a.m., she went to the Chateau Victoria and asked to have one more day to arrange the towing, which was granted. Now, I'm not sure how all of that goes down, because if you're parked somewhere, do you have to be friends with the people, or were they just that nice because she seemed like she was homeless or staying at a shelter or whatever? But she asked... Again, in retracing her steps that day, I think it's very important to examine every avenue because we don't know what happened. So at 7 a.m., she's at the Chateau Victoria asking for one more day to arrange towing. That extra day is granted. On November 29th, her van was towed by always towing to their lot at the request of the hotel. So the police was located the van in the always towing lot. And it was identified by VIN number. And this is information from the Victoria Police Department. You followed all that, Maxwell? Sort of. Uh, 27th, um, <clears throat> he, she got the car towed. Uh, no, she did not. <laughs> On the 27th... <laughs> I said this is the third time going over now. The notice on the van was put there on the 27th. On the 28th, the morning of her disappearance, of the date of her disappearance, she went to the Chateau Victoria at 7 a.m. and told them to, and asked for an extra day to arrange towing. And that extra day was granted. Follow? Yeah, yeah, I got it. That's on the cool. 20, so now on the 29th, so this is the day she disappears on the evening of the 28th. On the 29th, nothing to do with her. Always towing tows the vehicle. That's messed up. Yeah, well, it's unclear. If they said they were supposed to tow it, I guess either if they, there's a notice for towing on the 27th. Does that mean they're going to tow it on the 27th or the 28th? But she goes on the 28th at 7 a.m. to get one more day. So it appears, I guess, one more day is 24 hours. Because on the 29th, the following day, it is towed. It doesn't say what time it's towed, but it's towed. So either 7 a.m. anywhere onward after 7 a.m., that's 24 hours from her request. All right, did you follow that time around? Yeah, <clears throat> 24 hours, yeah. <laughs> that wasn't the point of all that, but okay. So, now we move on to Wednesday, November 28th, the day of her disappearance. At 4.30 a.m., Emma phones Shelly and changes her mind again. Don't come, Mom, not today. Shelly tells Emma she won't fly out to Victoria, but against the advice of the family, takes the first flight out that afternoon. Okay, that's 4.30 a.m. There's the call. Emma calls her mom at 4.30 a.m. And some of these calls apparently are late night calls. So this is a frantic, 
This is a frantic couple of days because she's calling super late at night, calling super early in the morning, changing her mind back and forth. Okay, that's 4.30. 7 a.m., she's at the Chateau Victoria. And apparently they say, the staff did say that she was very upset about the notice on her vehicle. 8.23 a.m. Emma is captured on video surveillance at the 7-Eleven store at the corner of Douglas and Humboldt Streets, where she uses her debit card to purchase $200 prepaid credit card. She is wearing a beige winter jacket, camouflage pants, and her hair is tied up in a bun. She is carrying several bags over her shoulder, including her orange purse. She lingers in the store by the doors, nervously peering out the window. So, again, this is all with, with all this new information. So she also has a bank account with money in it. She has her mother arranging her flight. Does that mean it's all paid for? Why does she need the $200 prepaid card and she has all this stuff with her? Is she planning on leaving the area because she's afraid her mother is coming? Or is she, plan is she getting ready for the trip? Because at 4.30 a.m., she's telling her mom not to come. Shelly tells Emma she won't come, unless for whatever reason she's lying about that, and she said she's coming no matter what, which upset Emma, and for whatever reason, the mom did not want to share that with anybody. Do you think that's a possibility? Yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm leaning towards that did not happen, because it seems like the mom would really want to do everything possible to help find her daughter, and that's a critical detail. If she's telling the mom not to come, and the mom insisting that she's coming anyway, that's going to be very... That's going to be rough emotionally. So is Emma fleeing here because she's suspecting that she's coming? But I don't think so because I think the mom. W I don't think the mom would would hide that critical detail. And then also at seven a.m. she's going to the Shadow Victoria to ask for one more day. So she's afraid that her mother is flying out immediately. She doesn't have another day unless she suspects that the mother is not going to fly out for another day. I don't know. This is it's strange and. Is she still paranoid that somebody is following her or whatnot at the 7-Eleven store? All factors to keep in consideration. 10 a.m. While riding the bus, Julian Huard sees Emma on Pandora Street across from the Alex Golden Hall. He disembarks a few stops early to talk to Emma who is standing on the edge of the sidewalk one step away from the road. She is wearing a puffy, light-colored coat, her hoodie pulled up over her head, and hair flowing out in disarray. She is carrying plastic bags in each hand with more bags over her shoulder and across her chest. He observes her from the back and profile but cannot see her face, so he decides to go register for his health card as planned and returns to find Emma still there, standing motionless on the corner. He steps onto the street in front of her and peers into her hoodie to ask if she needs help, and Emma slowly shakes her head as if to say no. He observes her for a short while until he decides then and there he is done with Emma. She won't accept help when offered. Okay, now obviously we went over Julian Ward, very suspicious individual. The endless coincidences of him just happening to move all the way out across the country to Victoria. Again, not the most, not the biggest coincidence because Victoria is a big city. It's not like it's a small little hamlet in the middle of nowhere. That would be probably a bridge too far. But even Victoria, it is coincidental. And this story, we haven't heard this exact detail of his account. He specifically disembarks a few stops early to talk to Emma. But if he doesn't know it's Emma, because it says that he observed her from the back and profile without seeing her face. So I guess he suspected it was her from her clothes, if he had seen her previously, and that's what she was wearing. What do you make of this Julian Huard character? We discussed him pretty at length in the first episode. It's, it's very bizarre, but at the same time... Well, it's, it's, easy, it's easy to spot someone you know, like even from far away, like if you, even if it's turned around. I think you can tell just by the way the body moves and the body shape. Well, he's saying that she's just standing there, so there's no movement. That's fine too. You can still like, you can you can know someone's like body type and dress. <clears throat> and then the other the other curious thing, he is done with Emma. Like he's that pissed off at her. Like she's obviously troubled. She doesn't accept help at that moment, but he could offer help again. I mean, it's it's. Is his, are his statements betraying him? But at the same time, if he really was shady and guilty, would he be going all of the, out of his way to admit all these little details? It's it's very bizarre. 
he had, yeah, I don't know. We have, we're going to revisit him again later. All right, so that was 10 a.m. Is Also, is it a coincidence that he happens to see her just hours before her disappearance? Again, if we look at FBI statistics, when someone goes mi- when a woman goes missing, it's usually the significant other or an ex-boyfriend. Boyfriend, ex-boyfriend, husband, ex-husband. Or some kind of uh, somebody interested in the girl who they know, who's known to them. So, factor in, keeping that in mind... Should we let this Julian Hard off the hook? Obviously, he's he is very bizarre, and he's offering a lot more than he could. It almost as if he's going out of his way to help when he doesn't need to. All right, how many coincidences are we willing to accept? That we don't know. All right, noon. Some people think Emma visited the library sometime around noon. So I guess these would be unconfirmed sightings. Early afternoon, a friend colleague. Unknown what that means. I guess somebody she might have worked with. Sees Emma sometime in the early afternoon near Our Place Soup Kitchen on Pandora Street. Her hair is tucked into her jacket. She says she isn't feeling well at all and can't talk. He asks if she needs a hug, but she retreats with an uncharacteristic, horrified look on her face. So this is in an unsubstantiated time in the early afternoon. At 1 p.m., there's a witness who spotted Emma looking vacant-eyed, slowly shuffling along on Pandora Street. She isn't wearing a hat, and her hair looks as it has been freshly washed, as opposed to earlier that morning. She is carrying several white plastic bags, an orange satchel, and is wearing camouflage pants and a white fleece jacket. The witness later reports the sighting to police, and eventually hears back from the police department who take the full report. So this does seem to possibly add up with the early afternoon sighting at the soup kitchen on Pandora Street. The other interesting thing is that she says she isn't feeling well at all, not well at all, and can't talk. And she gets scared when he asks if she needs a hug. Okay. All right. This is not this is not looking good. We also don't really have other days to compare to, which also prevents us from having being able to gather as much insight because is this day a lot different than her typical day? We don't really know. Afternoon, two people report seeing Emma on Douglas Street sometime in the afternoon. They were so concerned by Emma's strange behavior of walking back and forth in the street looking confused and lost. They immediately called the police who took the report. However, it is unclear if they followed up. This was the first 911 call made that day. The witnesses recall her wearing shoes, though they later learned from others who saw Emma that day wandering barefoot in the street. Okay, so there seems to be quite a few witnesses who are saying that Emma seems to be very uh, confused throughout this day. And out of it, confused and lost. Another witness reports seeing Emma walking downtown that afternoon with an older man. No description of the man was provided. Okay, is this other sighting also credible? We don't know. We don't have times on these. These are all just sometime in the afternoon. And if a lot of these people that are giving these eyewitness statements, if they're homeless or transient type people, they don't necessarily keep track of the time to the, you know, as much as someone who's going through a working day or a school day, because I guess they don't have to. I don't know. So we don't really have time periods here. A man who visited the Rock Bay shelter claims he saw Emma there at some point that afternoon. No details are provided. This is a shelter Emma refused to stay in as it was co-ed. So again, that would point to a lesser likelihood that it was her at that shelter, that this sighting is legitimate, unless she's that confused and lost and she's not thinking clearly and she might not even realize that she had refused to stay there earlier or if this older man she's with made her feel safe or whatever, we don't know. 4 to 6 p.m., Emma is sighted by the same person at two different locations. She first crosses their path as they exit the main Douglas Street doors of the Bay Center. She is shuffling, moving slowly northward on the west side of Douglas Street, her long mane of hair flowing out the side of her hood. 
About 45 minutes later, they are in a car, stopped at the corner of Douglas and Finlayson Streets, when, to their surprise, they see Emma crossing the street in front of them. She glances their way and gives a sad smile. They really want to help, but fear she might question their intentions. They go to Victoria PD headquarters to report the sightings on November 30th. Police take their contact information, but never call back to get the full report. This is not good, Maxwell. This seems like a credible sighting. Huh. They don't even... Why not get the full report? I don't know. It's, it's weird. Okay. 5.54 p.m., Emma uses her debit card to purchase a prepaid cell phone at the same 7-Eleven where she purchased the prepaid credit card. Video surveillance shows her paying for the phone, then she lingers in the store by the doors, nervously peering outside as if she is afraid to leave or is avoiding someone. The cell phone she purchased has never been activated. 6 p.m., Emma goes to the Sandy Merriman shelter. Witnesses at the shelter report Emma becoming very anxious and upset when told by a staff member that her mother is on the way. She storms out the front door. One resident tries to run after her, but quickly loses sight. She reports Emma having mixed feelings of relief and fear about her mother's arrival. I'm unsure how she... So was Emma at first relieved, and then all of a sudden she changed her mind and got mad and stormed out? We don't really know. She hey, said, like, that's so weird. Like, she... Who was making that judgment? A witness at the shelter. That's pretty detailed, relieved, and... <laughs> and... <laughs> Yeah, it is. I don't know how she came to that, unless that person made up the account. Someone's covering up something. Or not. Or she just believed that that's what it was after hearing other information. Who knows? You know how witnesses can attribute or misattribute certain things based on other information that's given to them? So we really don't know. Though Shelly spoke with staff on the phone the day before, she did not tell them she was heading to Victoria. You know what's weird? If the staff assumed she was just because she had called to find out about it. So they were like, oh, she's probably coming. And then that's what they told Emma. Not that they knew she was coming for sure, but we don't know. 6.10 p.m., a driver with ABC Taxi picks Emma up near the shelter. She asks him to take her to the airport, but suddenly changes her mind. Even though she had $2,000 to $3,000 in her bank account, she tells him she can't afford the $60 fare and asks to be dropped off exactly where she was picked up. Here's the other thing about the money, though, that I don't know if this is discussed thoroughly. If she's in a certain state of mind, she might not even remember she has that money in her bank account because if she's frantic, emotionally distraught, and just completely out of it, she might have even forgot about her prepaid credit card she might, have, she might just not have that in mind and be, she's just so frantic mentally. If she doesn't have $60 cash, she might think she doesn't have it or who knows. Or she really did just say that just to be whatever. But she asked to be dropped off exactly where she was picked up. I don't know. What do we make of that? Because oh, it's just, it's, that, that detail is weird to me because if she's afraid of somebody that's following her, okay, so if someone saw her get picked up, wouldn't she want to be dropped off somewhere else unless she feels safe near the shelter, but then her mother's coming to the shelter, or at least she thinks she might be. So why go back? We really don't know. When they arrive, she asks if she can sit in his cab for a while. The driver observes her behaving strangely. She becomes anxious and paranoid when she hears the dispatch radio. She stares at it and asks, why is there noise coming out of that? Does she, she think that her mother would be in danger? Is that is that what it, one of the theories? Like, uh, she thinks her mother would be in danger by coming there. Yeah, like so. I've actually, her. I've actually never heard that, but that's that's a really interesting theory. That's I didn't think of that. Because, like, relieved and feared, like relieved she's coming, but now she's coming. Maybe the person that's gonna hurt Emma is also gonna hurt the mother or something like that. Hmm. I had not thought of that. And, and and that's why she left to protect the mom or some shit like that. But if the mom is coming to the shelter and the person's stalking her, wouldn't she still be? I mean, how would her leaving make the mom safe? Unless, wow, I just had a really dark thought. Unless she confronted the individual because the individual doesn't want anything with her mom. So in her mind, if she sacrificed herself for the mother, that that would be pretty dark. 
Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Like, it's like a flank, not flank. Is it flanking? No, not flanking. Um, like, uh, yeah, just guiding the the perpetrators somewhere else. Misdirecting or direct directing? Yeah, 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 yeah. directing. I guess. I don't. I don't know. None of this. None of this really makes any sense. Because if that was her goal, why not just leave in the tap? Why go back to that spot? I don't know. And why just sit in the cab for a while? I don't know. I don't think. I mean, it's it's hard to. It's hard. Obviously, we don't know what she was thinking or why. So we can only examine this. The information that we have here. So she pays the fare with her debt. So she thinks that the rate. She asks why the dispatch radio. Why is there noise coming out of that? So I don't I don't know. She pays the fare with her debit card and quickly exits the cab. 6:15 p.m. Dennis Quay, an acquaintance of Emma, sees her standing barefoot on a corner, looking disoriented, paranoid, and seemingly unable to cross the street. He asks if she is looking for someone or if someone is following her. She doesn't say much and keeps looking all around her. She asks him to walk with her for a bit, but becomes increasingly uncomfortable with his questions and concern and decides to walk on her own. At approximately 7 p.m., he enters a nearby restaurant to call police and waits until they arrive. He observes them talking with Emma for a while, then leaves, assuming she is safely in their care. This is at 6.15 p.m., shortly after the uh, ta- minutes after the taxi ride. Uh, this is, yeah, this is really rough. It seems like she really could be suffering from some kind of health issue, not necessarily a mental health issue, but if it's something nutritional or she's got some severe brain fog going on, like a, a physiological lack of nutrition, not necessarily, again, some kind of genetic mental disease, although obviously we don't know, but yeah, it's, it's pretty bizarre. If, let, so she was supposedly drinking copious amounts of water, but what if she didn't drink water that day? Is it possible she could have been delirious, dehydrated, malnutritioned at that point, and not able to physically function or think clearly? Those are good points. 7.17 p.m., police locate Emma barefoot and clutching her shoes by the Empress Hotel on Government Street, and two officers assess her for 45 minutes. According to police notes, at no time did Emma engage in a dialogue, but rather answered with one word, or nodded her head. It was almost 30 minutes before she even spoke and and then only gave her name at their insistence. Okay, if someone is in the most extreme state of delirium, dehydration, malnutrition, are they going to be capable of saying their name? I guess they would. But if she is able to give her name, if she is able to nod in response to questions, Oh, uh, it's rough. But then, then again, this is at seven seventeen p.m. So within the next few hours, if her condition got even worse than that, yeah, we we don't know. Okay, she refused to put her shoes back on and said she was just taking a walk and planned to meet with a friend. Again, we don't know if that's true or not. If it is true, we need to know who that friend is. By eight p.m., police decide she is not a threat to herself or anyone else and watch her walk away. This is the last confirmed sighting of Emma. The identities of the two officers are protected by privacy laws. Wait, are they really? Aren't they public servants? Isn't this public? That's that's weird. That's really weird for... Well, this is Canada. Wait, this is Canada. This is Canada. I guess they have different laws. Yeah, in the U.S., I believe all all police officers are always named. Uh, Okay, so details of the conversation have not been released. Shelley sent a Freedom of Information request on May 19th, 2015 which was denied by the Victoria PD without a reason given. What do you make of that, Maxwell? Is it say, say that one more time. Shelley sent a freedom of information request. So she wants to know the names of the officers, or at the very least, the details of the conversation. She wants the police notes from this 45-minute officer assessment when the officer spoke to her. So Shelly is Shelly is Emma's mother. Do you remember who Emma is? Yeah, yeah, but uh, did they refuse to give her? That's what I just said. The freedom of information request was denied without reason. They didn't even cite a reason for the denial. That's messed up. 
Yes. Yeah, so are they simply protecting? They just don't want to look bad because they failed Emma and now she's missing and who knows what happened to her? Or is there something much deeper going on? There are some serious mind shocks coming. It's a conspiracy. There are some mind shocks coming, Maxwell, and you're not going to be ready for them. You're not going to be ready. But before we get to them, let's finish the day. 11 p.m., Shelly arrives at the shelter, learns Emma did not claim her bed. The shelter calls police immediately to report Emma missing. Midnight, police sh arrive at the shelter shortly after midnight to take the report. Emma is declared a missing person. Well, at least at least they had her declared as a missing person. In the U.S., I mean, I guess there's endangered individuals and there's all these weird laws, but this is a couple hours after the police spoke to her and they do declare her a missing person at that time. Okay. So, that is the timeline. Those are her steps retraced. So, obviously, we do have a gap. So, we have a gap between... Between 10 a.m. and noon, so this is the Julian Horde sighting, and then some people think they saw Emma at the library, so those are not confirmed. So here's another thing. Some people theorize that she used the computer, the internet at the library, to find out tow information at around this time. So the other thing we don't know, so some people, again, there's some very, very skilled researchers online. And they've come up with quite a few theories, including that Emma actually, because Emma was picked up at 6.10 p.m. at the Harvard Air Terminal and asked him to take her to the airport. So because we don't know where Emma was planning on flying to, because she was heading to the Victoria Airport. This is confirmed by her mother, that she was heading to the Victoria Airport. So if some of these sightings in the afternoon were false and she was, uh, she was trying to get to the airport at a different time as well, and then she came back and didn't. So her passport is in her van, which she did not retrieve. What does that tell you, Maxwell? Her passport was not in her van? Is that her passport was in her van. It was not on her person because uh, they found it in her van. Uh, that's messed up. So, yeah, I don't know if to think of that. All right, here's the other thing. So, some of the theories on why she was buying the prepaid card, so this card was purchased at 8.23 a.m., if she needed to pay to get her van out of, uh, out of, for the tow or the van, so if they only accept credit card or cash, she would need to get that prepaid card, which is why she got it. I don't know what she was using with, but there are transportation issues, of course. Okay, so another interesting point, if we can believe this, this, uh, this new witness, this is the, the witness that came forward in 2018, 5 a.m., November 29, 2012, a man was on his way to work at a new job, already running a little late, when he saw a young woman darting back and forth on the side of the road. She seemed to be in distress, so he pulled over and she got into his vehicle around 1264 Exquimalt Road, Victoria. He noticed she was shoeless and soaking wet and seemed as though she had been walking all night. Her demeanor suddenly shifted to calm and content once she stepped inside his car and asked if he could take her to Colwood to visit a girlfriend. Since he didn't want to be even more late in his first week of training, he told her he could only bring her a little closer to Colwood. They had been driving for around five minutes when he stopped to drop her off at the intersection of Craig Flower and Admirals next to a Legion and a 24-hour gas station. The moment she exited the car, her behavior suddenly shifted back to paranoid and erratic as she darted back and forth in the street before finally taking off in the direction of Colwood. So again, when we're discussing her physical state, she seems to know the direction. If this is true, she's, she knows the direction of Colwood. She can still talk. She can still, she's not completely gone here, so she can still function. Okay, he didn't realize who he picked up that morning until long after the incident took place and came forward almost six years later in June 2018. He contacted the Victoria PD, who told him to contact Crime Stoppers about his interaction with Emma nine hours after she was last seen talking to police by the Empress Hotel. That's kind of weird. The police don't want a full report from him. They just want him to contact Crime Stoppers? 
Don't they want to see what? Don't they want to find out what happened to Emma? It's weird. When he realized there was no follow up to his tip, he got in touch with Emma's mother, Shelley, and a longtime advocate in the search for Emma named Kimberly Bordage, who interviewed him at length and released a podcast on November 2nd, 2018, called The Search for Emma Filipov. Episode 1 indie details her in-depth timeline of the week leading up to Emma's disappearance, which includes never-before-released information, while the second half highlights her interview with the new witness, William, followed by details regarding the new canine search effort. Okay. So, this new witness... If this is the last confirmed sighting, that'd be 5 a.m. So this would be going in Colwood, 5.15 a.m., November 29th. Okay, there's, there are other issues with this, with the tow, because it was tow, it was impounded and towed from the Chateau Victoria lot, but it was found back in their lot. Because it looks like where did they was this done for free? Or was someone else was someone trying to hide their connection to Emma and put the van back in the Chateau Victoria lot? Also, there's a bus that would get her to the Juan de Fuca Center where the card was found. It's it's it takes about 31 minutes. Huh. So some people also are puzzled why she didn't take a bus from downtown directly to the ferry, which would have been cheaper than the cab and faster than the transit bus or the coach. The bus terminal is not far from Empress, where she was last spotted. So the bus ride to the ferry airport is an hour. The cab would have been faster and more private, but different options. The coach goes directly to the ferry, no stops. And so I don't know if the police did a real investigation, but they, it, it does not look like they did because it has the CCTV footage. So we're, in 20, we're at the end of 2012 here. So there is CCTV footage all over the place, right? Um, yeah, I would say that. I mean, definitely at bus terminals, at public transportation terminals. Did they check any of these terminals to see if she had taken a different bus or taken a bus. And then there's also another airport. So the YVR, if she wanted to catch a plane, there were different options. And she could also get to a train station. Pacific Coach Lines has the, uh, is the coach. And it's near the Empress. So they go to BC Ferries and it's less than $15. She could also take a train to downtown Vancouver. But of course, if she's not thinking clearly, so and other people chimed in that there's a float plane airport in the inner harbor, a five minute walk. So you, she could get to somewhere else from there. Other people also point out that why did she purchase a cell phone randomly, a prepaid cell phone? Was it to call 911 in case of emergency because she was afraid of her stalker, if there was one? I could see that. But and, and also she like she did have a cell phone, right? Yeah, but she didn't want one. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, like that's what I mean. Like, she would only get a cell phone for emergency. Exactly. Now, is it coincidental that all of this is going down on the last day that she spotted? Because, like, why not get why not get a cell phone for nine one one purposes a week before, two weeks before, a month before, three months before? It happened yeah, all yeah, that yeah. I guess, day. Yeah. Like, so she's she's uh, she's she's worried. Yeah. The the van. I keep going back to the van situation though. There's something off about the whole van situation in the towing do you suspect the tow drivers i don't know i don't necessarily suspect anyone may it could have been the staff at the hotel and not nothing to do with it i'm just saying there's but something for some, weird. for some reason i was just thinking about the tow truck drivers because uh like when you're if you're a full-time tow truck driver like you kind of get bored and uh and this is what i'm guessing and i'm guessing since you meet so many people and sometimes you'll come across like attractive people that you like and like i'm guessing like they would probably like fantasize like how would they do things you know what I mean? <laughs> like they they would like pre-plan stuff <laughs> or fantasize about things yeah po it's possible i'm just, I'm just but, guessing <laughs> it's possible but the I, I i get yeah i just keep going back to the van though so she arrives at the chateau victoria and her van is actually gone because the van got towed the night before or the morning of her leaving 
so she needs the van back. So who paid for all this? We really... Uh, so if her van was impounded towed from the Chateau Victoria lot, which she discussed with staff morning 28, but it was found back in the lot following her disappearance. So was it not really towed? They told her it was towed. It wasn't towed. I, I just, I don't like the whole tow situation. All right, so Shelly did, uh, did contact the tow truck driver, Maxwell. This is what she stated online, March 24th, 2015. I was in contact with the tow truck driver and we spoke at length. He told me that when Emma saw the snow in the mountaintops that she said she couldn't wait to get back home and surprise her family. Okay. So there was no doubt in his mind as to her plans. She stated them clearly and coherently. So it seems like she didn't really suspect the uh, tow truck driver. She spoke with him at length and... Hmm. So in the, fir the other thing, in the first call to her mother, she said she wants to come home, but she doesn't know what to do with her stuff and the van. So that's an interesting point. Obviously, over the next four days, she cancels, calls for help, and cancels again. So she didn't pay for the parking at the hotel. At 7 a.m., she discovers this. And she, uh, so I guess she asks for another day. What does that do? How did, the van, how did the van go back to the parking lot? And did she pay for it? Because she didn't pay for the parking. And keep in mind, she has two to three grand in her, in her bank account. So at 6.10, the cab goes from the Harbor Air Terminal which is next to where she worked and two blocks from the 7-Eleven. Now, the Harbor Air only flies in the daytime. So on November 21st, the tow truck driver picked Emma up at the shelter, drove her to her van stored at West Coast Storage in Sook, then tows the van back to the Chateau Victoria Hotel Parkade in downtown Victoria. And this is the on this drive on November 21st is when Emma tells him she's planning to surprise her family by going home. The tow truck li driver later comments on her odd paranoid behavior more than once. Okay. And the the van was towed to the impound lot in Victoria. Cuz yeah, that's another point. How did Emma find out her van was towed unless unless she went there to get her stuff and it wasn't there and that's when that all occurred. So in late November, the last seaplane is at 3.15 p.m. and the last flight from Vancouver arrives at 4.15 p.m. So the fare from flying from Victoria Inner Harbor to the Victoria International Airport is $150. So did she buy that prepaid credit card to pay for that? And then she arrived at the terminal too late to catch that flight. And then that's why she was taking the cab to the YVR airport. Someone also found a discrepancy that the cab driver gave two different accounts. One, she said that the driver had no idea, that she said she had no idea where she was going. In the other account, he said she asked to be driven to the airport. Although that could be a poor interviewer when after she said she didn't have the fare, she had no idea where she was going and she just said, take her back to where you picked her up. I don't know. So this points to different things because if this is a functioning individual, adapting to changing in stressful situations with the addition of an even more stressful situation we don't know about, like a potential stalker, would someone with a severe mental illness be able to deal with, to be able to cope and make this many adjustments throughout one day? What do you think, Maxwell? Or, or were they, and then there was a breaking point at some, at some point in the day? Um, uh, I don't know. Maxwell Army. <laughs> We doing a podcast or what? I, I need to. I need to hear that question again. She's making a lot of adjustments, right? She's going. If she went to the harbor to catch a plane, it's too late. Now she's going. Now she needs a cab to go to the airport. Oh, but now she doesn't have the money or whatever it is. She doesn't want to pay for the money. So if she's making all these adjustments throughout the day, is this a fu is this a functioning individual able to make adjustments and deal with stressful situations? Or uh, I, see, I see what you I see. What, yeah, it's, it's, that's very functional and very uh, cog, cognizant. <laughs> Unlike Maxwell? <laughs> <laughs> uh, at this time, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And was there a breaking point? Like, she doesn't have the van. Her mom's coming. Her mom's not coming. She's being stalked. All, she's, she's, she missed. Because people snap when enough things get piled on. And then they, they, they miss, they're late for one thing, they miss another thing, and it's just, once the stack gets to a certain point, like, that's a breaking point. Is that what happened this day? I can see that happening. People snap, and then 
she must have done something drastic, but I don't know. Like she just just completely disappeared. So the last, so again, yeah, I mean, people discussing this timeline though. This, if she did take a bus out of the area that night, because some of the buses have a seven forty five p.m. departure. But then, what about the sighting, the new sighting, which puts her at five a.m. The five a.m. sighting, which still puts her in the Victoria area, going to Colwood. So then she didn't take a bus to an airport, if this is true. I mean, do we know with 100% certainty that he picked up Emma? Or was it someone he thought was Emma? I mean, it seems like it was Emma. So, yeah, she probably did not get out of that area. But they pro- they should have went over all the security footage. I mean, again, this is not, you know, early 2000s, 90s, 80s. There are security cameras all over the place. They need to do a thorough investigation. So there were so just to retrace her steps if she bought the fo- she bought the phone at the 711 she was in the store for about 5 minutes being paranoid then she walked a few blocks to where she, to her old workplace Harbor Air and if there's nothing going from there and it's too late she she hailed a cab and there would have been a lot of cabs in that area at that time of night so those would have been her steps up to that point her reported mental state from the Find Emma Facebook page was, quote, in emotional distress, fragile, and vulnerable, end quote. So she was, obviously, there were sightings in Vancouver, unconfirmed. And so did she get to Vancouver? But again, we have to go back to that 5 a.m. sighting, the 5 a.m. ride to Colwood. So, hmm. A lot of people, especially early on in the investigation, they were saying she would not get in a stranger's car or hitchhike or any of this stuff, but that's also that's also up for debate. Because if she did get in, if that 5 a.m. sighting is legit, that's exactly what she did. And according to that sighting, she felt perfectly fine while in the vehicle and not while outside of the vehicle. Other people also point to that she would have given the shelter the courtesy of saying that she was leaving because then they could free a space for someone else because they were expecting her to claim her bed. I don't know, but unless she was distressed. Okay, also, she did not get to the impound lot because it was still there when she went missing. Again, there's few conflicting reports on that. So her passport and laptop were in her van. So obviously, she probably would have taken those things if traveling. So if they were in the impound lot and she couldn't get it, then she wouldn't, she wouldn't be able to get it. Someone posted this theory online. Did she just give up out of frustration and walk away? She was having a rough day. Something may have happened at the shelter in addition to the van being towed and then the last interaction she had with law enforcement. I'm thinking the law enforcement talk may have been the last straw and she snapped. Also, if all this is that, so- that's, that's a pretty good theory because a lot of times like cops can be so confrontational. It could be, that could be it. Well, and also all the people overly concerned. She might be getting annoyed because Julian's like, yeah, are, you, are you okay? Do you need help? And then all these other friends, do you need a hug? Do you need help? Is everything okay? And then they're calling police on her. She might have just been pissed off. Because if she was in a certain state where she didn't realize like how that all looked and in her own head, she was perfectly fine and everything shouldn't have looked that way. That might have been very, very frustrating to deal with. Also, what if what's going on at the shelter? Because what if she didn't feel safe at the cell, at the shelter for a different reason other than her mother? And so she, is she really going to that friend's house in Colwood? Yeah. Some people also theorize, the, did the friend not come forward because something happened to the friend that nobody knows about? If there's an unrelated case with that person's murder or disappearance, there's another murder or disappearance that nobody can connect to this case. If it is connected... That person was never able to come forward to say, oh, yeah, Emma was planning to come visit me. Or they can have another situation where if they were involved in something illegal, they don't want to, you know, they don't want to draw attention to themselves. Not because they had anything to do with Emma or some mutual friend had something to do with Emma and the other friend is afraid of them. I mean, there's always obviously there's all these situations that can happen. We don't know. So she's she is a photographer. And she had her photos and her laptop, her laptop with her photos on there. So it seems like she really would want to get it. And the people that argue for the snap theory is that so much went wrong that she just didn't care about all that stuff anymore. Like once you hit a critical point, all that stuff becomes irrelevant. All right. You ready for the final mind shock of the episode, Maxwell? Sure. So again, Victoria PD refused to release the information 
but there were several possible sightings of Emma in the Slocan Valley and hitchhiking around the area where the original family homestead was at Shore Acres back in 2013. So is there some kind of a connection? So the Nelson Royal Canadian Mountain Police requested the transcripts of the interview with Emma, but they refused to share. Also, the Sandy Merriman shelter won't release any records in relation to Emma either. They won't release the records to police or family. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that is kind of weird. So, plenty more mind shocks to come in the Emma Filipov series, including new theories that have never been proposed before. We had to trace her steps again, and then we're also going to talk about even more sightings and scenarios to try to attempt to unravel this very mysterious disappearance. But there's definitely more than meets the eye here. So thanks again for joining us on another edition of Mindshock True Crime. Once again, if you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Make sure your device allows those notifications to come through. Any questions, comments, theories, leave them in the comments section. If you like the podcast, hit the like button. Feel free to share it across social media platforms. And make sure to like and follow our Facebook page for exclusive updates not posted anywhere else. And you can also check us out on Twitter, Reddit, and Patreon. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. And Vassal Powers. We'll catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mindshack True Crime. You are listening to the Emma Filipoff series. This is episode three, Sightings, where we will go over even more sightings of Emma Filipoff after her disappearance and everything that entails in this very mysterious case where nothing seems to add up, and every time you travel down some of these avenues and rabbit holes, you uncover even more, leading completely separate directions. So we are going to attempt to make heads and tails of all these different sightings after Emma's disappearance. Once again, if you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal to make sure we can keep bringing you all these different episodes in all these different series. Just check the link in the description. Make sure to subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. If you like the podcast, also make sure to hit that like button and share it across social media platforms. You could also check us out on Twitter, Reddit, and Patreon. Patrons do get priority in case an episode requests, and you could also pick your podcasters on that one. And also, make sure you like and follow our Facebook page for exclusive updates that will only be posted on Facebook. All right, Maxwell, now that we've reviewed the case yet again in the previous episode, we traced Emma Filipov's steps leading up to her disappearance. Now, there's quite a few things that jump out. Of course, out of all the days to buy a prepaid cell phone, she buys it on the one she goes missing. Out of all the days to run into Julian Hurd, her ex-boyfriend, with all these who coincidentally moved across the country to the same town she was in and spotted her the day she went missing, another coincidence. This is bizarre. She also bought a prepaid credit card, which, as far as we know, is not something she had done. All coincidental, Maxwell? Maybe. <laughs> Maxwell Powers, coincidence theorist extraordinaire. No matter how many coincidences, they can't ever be related no matter what. Right, Maxwell? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's, uh, let's look at what happened after her disappearance. So keep in mind, so November 28th, 2012, this is when Emma Filipoff went missing. So on the 29th, the Chateau Victoria Hotel arranged for always towing to tow Emma's van to their lot. Police found it there three hours later, containing all of her possessions, including her passport, laptop, journals, camera, and recently borrowed library books. They then have it towed to their lot, so the police have it towed to their Okay, so another interesting point is that she was this, uh, you know, she was a poet, a writer, she had a journal, she also was a photographer, so she has these personal effects in her van that mean a lot to her. 
Would she just abandon them? I mean, would something extreme had to have happened for her to abandon her passport, laptop, journals, and camera? No thoughts, Maxwell? Would she, would she what? Abandon her camera? I just said it twice. <laughs> the possessions in her van, her passport, laptop, journals, and camera. She was a poet. She wrote journals. She uh, and she was also a photographer. She took a lot of pictures. She has so she has her passport, laptop, journals, and camera for the fourth time in her van. Would something extreme had to have happened for her to abandon them? Oh yeah, definitely. So yeah, or again, if we're examining the angle that she had some kind of nutritional deficiency or some kind of medical concern, a medical condition that was becoming worse that impaired her thinking. So she either forgot about them or she was feeling so badly that she didn't keep them in mind. I mean, who knows what happened, but she was there the previous morning. She asked for an extra day, I mean, to, to you know, get the van situation settled. So it's, it's pretty bizarre. All right. So Shelly, her mother, visits the shelter during each shift change. And she was informed by staff that staff noticed Emma had become depressed, possibly suicidal. I don't know how they came, I don't know how they're telling her that based on what information, and had been growing more erratic, paranoid, and fearful in the two weeks leading up to her disappearance. They described the incident when Emma moved furniture outside, insisting the objects were talking to her. I'm not sure if that's true. I think she said they were loud. I don't know, as well as the fact that she was throwing away or donating many of her personal belongings. Now, is that in preparation for a trip back home because she wasn't planning on coming back to Victoria? I mean, we don't know. She learns about the call made to police weeks prior when they were told to call back if Emma's condition persisted or worsened. Staff informed Shelly that they never made that second call to police. November, okay, so that same day, November 29th, a witness reported seeing Emma at Lifestyle Market on Douglas Street in Victoria. The sighting is unconfirmed. On December 2nd, there's the unconfirmed sighting in the Inner Harbor after dark, which is this sighting with the, the young woman with the camera who asked her to repeat, and Emma supposedly asked her to repeat her own name three times and to, quote, to remember that name, end quote. Days later, the woman saw the news with Emma Filipov's photograph and realized it was her. Now, you know what's weird? So this is December 2nd. So uh, if we're to believe the most recent account that came out in 2018 that she hitched a ride north, would she have come back to the Inner Harbor on December 2nd? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know what happened. It's just, it's all very bizarre. Okay, on December 5th, 11.17 a.m., the $200 prepaid credit card Emma purchased on the 28th is flagged for use at a Petro-Canada station on Sook Road. The man who uses the card is cleared after being questioned and polygraphed by police. In news reports, police say he found the card on the side of the road near the Juan de Fuca Recreation Center and the Galloping Goose Trail in Colwood. Now, Colwood is where she was hitching to, okay? However, he later calls Shelly on three occasions to explain he was drinking on a daily basis at the time, and he was too drunk that night to remember where he found it. He knows it was still sealed and is certain he waited about a week to use it to buy a carton of cigarettes. He still claims he can only guess, based on his usual travel routes during that time, where he may have found the card. All right, what do you make of that, Maxwell? Because we've dis we discussed this on the first episode of this guy who said he just found the prepaid card. And if he was the one who did harm Emma and got rid of the body, let's say just for the sake of argument, would he be phoning her mother three times to explain that he was really drunk and he can't remember exactly, like trying to help her out? I mean, I don't know. That's pretty bizarre. What do you think? No thoughts, Maxwell? Um, yeah, it's pretty bizarre that... Um, I don't, I don't know. What you, I don't know what you said. Why don't you pay attention then? <laughs> Wait, say, say that again. This guy found out. How come you always listen on the second time, but never the first time? Every time you say you weren't paying attention, and I repeat it again, you seem to understand and respond perfectly fine. Why don't you just pretend you you didn't understand already and listen as if it was the second time? We might be able to save a lot of time that way. A two hundred dollar prepaid credit card 
that Emma purchased was flagged for use several days later at a Petro Canada station on Sook Road. Okay, so this is up north, not incredibly far from where she, from where she was dropped off after hitchhiking. But he called Shelly, Emma Filipov's mother, three different times to explain that he was drinking on a daily basis and was too drunk to remember where he found it. So I guess he guessed at where he found it. But what do you make of that? I don't know. If he harmed her, do you think he would be calling her mother multiple times to explain the situation? Yeah. He was also polygraphed and cleared by police. Obviously, we know that's not 100%, but that's just, you know, if you fail the polygraph, that doesn't mean you're guilty. But if you pass the polygraph, does that mean you're either innocent or you're calm enough? So would that suggest that if he is guilty, he's some kind of serial killer who's calm enough to pass a polygraph? And he's done this multiple times, and that's why he's so calm about it. If it was a one-off drunk guy, or did he just see her passed out and steal it from her? But would he have passed a polygraph if that were the case? Unless he was so blackout drunk, he can't remember anything anyway. So that's why he passed the polygraph. But wouldn't he be ner- I mean, I don't know. It's weird. If he really was innocent, I mean, I don't know. It's rough. So no thoughts from Maxwell Powers, the man, the myth, the legend, Maxwell Army. Uh, I'm good. <laughs> also, do you find it strange that a homeless guy would wait almost a whole week before using a prepaid credit card that he found. If he's homeless and broke, wouldn't he use the card right away? Especially if he's some, you know, a bumbling drunk that needs his alcohol. Don't those people usually use money once they get it right away? They don't wait. Could be a guilt thing too. I don't know. Like, like he's, he's feeling guilty and then, and then like he comes to a breaking point where he really needs to spend money to survive. Hmm. All right, so here's some information posted about him. The guy who found the card lived in a halfway house not far from where the card might have been found. He took the bus into town and would walk from the house to the bus exchange near the Juan de Fuca rec center. Says he didn't find it where the police say he did, but he can't remember where he found it. So how would he know he didn't find it where the police said he found it? This whole thing is bizarre. (laughs) So William, the new witness that came forward, he said he dropped Emma off early that morning. Did she walk to the unite? So she mentioned a female friend to William. So did she stay with that friend who has never been identified and then return to the harbor area? Because on December 2nd, that was the sighting that said with the woman who said that Emma Filipov helped her with the camera and asked her to repeat the name, you know, say her name and to remember the name. Okay. So Emma stayed at the Belkin house on Homer for at least a month in the previous spring summer. Also worked with a chef friend in White Rock who she met in Campbell River years prior. There was a young woman who worked at the Belkin house who said she and Emma got on really well and had hung out when Emma stayed there. Her name is unknown. And if you ask at Belkin, they politely ask you to leave and then escort you to the door. So these are these are researchers online that I guess have been trying to help out. And that's what happened. OK, in May 2014. So this is years later, Gastown, British Columbia, an agitated man was captured on surveillance at a clothing store downtown Vancouver with a crumbled up missing persons poster of Emma. He claimed Emma was his girlfriend and just wanted to be left alone. Despite the evidence of the grainy footage, which shows a man in a green shirt with a noticeable limp and sporting flame tattoos on his arm, no one has come forward with information and police have yet to identify him. Okay, so, and then of course they they searched the harbor. I mean, there were dive teams. I mean, there was a search for Emma. Hundreds of people have circulated posters, shared links, clues, and ideas. And then, of course, in 2014, CBC made the documentary The Fifth Estate, Finding Emma, and that is a good episode. Okay. So there were more unconfirmed sightings in Fernwood Square, Goldstream Park, and the Inner Harbor. A rumor circulated among friends that she was hitchhiking up and down the island and was doing well. So that's an interesting rumor. So there's... 
what are the possible scenarios of rumor like that could be spread? One, it was true, where someone hurt, really heard she was hitchhiking, whether she really did or not, or maybe she really did. And how would they hear that she was doing well? Or does that sound like a cover story by some circle of friends, someone in the circle of friends who knows what happened to her, either accidental death or something or whatever, someone was responsible that they're afraid of, and they don't want the heat on them. Would they start a rumor like that? What do you think? I can see that. Or just drunk people talking, someone just says that just for the sake of saying it as if it's a theory and it catches on and there and it just gets repeated as truth. So a lot of different scenarios where that could be possible. Okay. Two people claimed she was panhandling on commercial drive in Vancouver. Several witnesses reported her missing posters had been torn down in the downtown east side area. A source at one establishment in the area believes she saw Emma ripping her own poster off the wall. That's interesting, is it not? So she doesn't want people, if that really was her ripping down her own poster, she doesn't want anybody looking for her. This is, uh, this is bizarre. Staff at a hunting fishing store reported a woman resembling Emma asked how to disappear explaining she had a stalker who followed her from Ontario to Victoria, then to Vancouver. So is it possible all of these sightings are legitimate? Yeah, yeah, I think it's possible. What motive, again, what motivation would all these different people have? Because it's kind of hard to believe, unless, unless some, somebody's reporting all these things that aren't true, if these can all be independently verified that these random different business owners and witnesses, they all really saw what they said they saw, what is their motivation to lie? Again, unless someone is either paying them off or the police are saying they said something they didn't say to make it look like Emma disappeared due to her own, of her own accord. One individual who operates online under many pseudonyms described Emma as a junkie living in the DTES, the downtown east side. He boasted standing next to her as she tore down her own poster, but would not provide more details and expressed no interest in the reward. Okay, so a lot of problems here. It, so if this person is different than the other witnesses, than the other witness who said that, that uh, yeah, this looks different because this other witness was a woman. She said she saw... A source at one establishment, does that, so that means someone working in a business, a female, said she saw Emma ripping down her own poster. Now we have a different individual, unless, I mean, although this person is credited as a he in this description, however, if it's an online person as a pseudonym, I guess it could be a she, but if it is a different person and it is a he, this person is saying he was once next to her when she tore down her own poster. However, he's no interest in making $25,000. Is that weird? What do you think of that? It's not too bad. You don't think someone someone living, you know, the downtown east side, they don't have a lot of money, they wouldn't want to, to collect a $25,000 reward? Oh, yeah, yeah, I can see that. Or is this someone just that wants attention or just to trash Emma for the sake of trashing Emma Philippoff? There's a lot of weird people out there. We see this in almost every missing persons case. There are people online trashing the victim, victim blaming or just saying all these nasty things about a victim for no reason, basically. It's just, it's weird. But uh, we don't know. It's just all these things are very weird. Okay. Two separate tips originated in Nelson, British Columbia in early 2014. A hitchhiker matching Emma's description was seen on Highway 3 near the Philippoff family farm. The second sighting was up Slocan Valley, 30 minutes away, where another Philippoff family member resided. Nelson, British Columbia, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police followed up. The sightings remain unconfirmed. In early 2016, a friend reported seeing Emma sleeping on the steps of the Francophone Center in Kelowna, British Columbia. A volunteer team worked diligently with local police to follow up on the sighting. It, too, remains unconfirmed. All right, so we do have 
all of these unconfirmed sightings. Just so everybody gets an idea, so Nelson is closer to Victoria and Vancouver than it is. So she's from Perth, the other side of Canada. So Nelson is roughly 400 miles from Vancouver. And Vancouver is not that far from uh, Victoria. So if she did make it to Vancouver, if she hitched her way up there, she would have had to hitch or however you get there. But it's uh, it's about an hour plane ride or somewhere around seven and a half to eight hour car ride from Vancouver to Nelson. So apparently the Philippoffs had a family in Nelson. Are these sightings confirmed? If these sightings were confirmed, what does that mean? So these sightings are not officially confirmed. What do you think of all this? And this is 2014. So we're talking two years. I mean, this is early 2014. So we're talking about a year and a half or so after her disappearance, a hitchhiker matching Emma's description was seen Highway 3 near the Philippoff family farm. And then there's a second sighting up Slocan Valley, which is 30 minutes away, where another Philippoff family member resided. Do you find that coincidental or not? And the Royal Canadian Mounted Police followed up on these leads, and however, the sightings remain unconfirmed. What does that mean? They talked to people who said they saw her, but what are you going to do with that information? How is that, that, would that be confirmed or unconfirmed? Or is it a hearsay where a friend of a friend said they saw her, and then when asked again, they said they didn't because they got scared? Now, why did they get scared? Was that made up, or was it real, and Emma didn't want to be found, so she made them change the story? What, what do you make of all this, Maxwell? Is that, is that what's going on? They changed their story? I don't know. I'm telling you, what are, what are the possibilities that the police consider these sightings unconfirmed? Uh, I see. So I just went over the scenarios. Either either the person changed the story that originally reported her, or that report was from a second or third-hand report that couldn't be corroborated. Because otherwise, like, how would you confirm that sighting? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Um... I mean, what do you mean by confirm? I mean, it's just... Well, I just person. went over it three times. Yeah, but what I'm saying is, like, the person just has to say, yes, I did see her. That's confirmation, or...? I don't know. But if they didn't, if they're like, oh, this other person said they saw her, we know that's unconfirmed. And what if they said they saw her, one of her family members said they saw her, or someone, a friend of a family member, but then they couldn't find that friend who said they saw her, right? So then it's unconfirmed. I would say in order for it to be confirmed, it would have to have been someone who specifically knew her. And when the police show up with the picture, they're willing to sign some kind of statement that said that they saw her, right? I'm, I'm guessing that would be more in the confirmed realm. But how do you really confirm a sighting? Would you need video evidence? I mean, what, what, I, I don't know the threshold that would qualify as police confirming it. But we know it's not some kind of secondhand account would definitely be not confirmed, and someone changing their story would also definitely be not confirmed. That much we know. Everything else is just guessing. I mean, is it also coincidental that 2014 was when the surveillance video came out of the man in Gastown that was... Um, the, the guy with the uh, tattoos and uh, that was claiming that Irma was his girlfriend and she wanted to be left alone and police have not identified him. The guy with the limp and the tattoo. So this was also 2014. Coincidentally, when these sightings of Emma near some kind of family properties in Nelson happened. I mean, that's kind of... Is this also coincidental? I just, I really, I really don't know. It's, it's, it's just so bizarre. There's a lot more information here to work with than the peers on the surface, but it's all unconfirmed. So we can't really, there, there's really not, there's not a lot we could do with it. Yeah. Yeah. So someone posted this on Reddit. Don't know Emma personally, but helped Shelly in downtown Eastside with her search, May 2014. One of Emma's relatives was my neighbor, and strangely enough, a friend of mine owns part of the old family property near Nelson, British Columbia, where there was a possible sighting of her hitchhiking on the highway during the summer of 2013. Emma had a, so she's saying that that sighting was 2013 and not 2014. Emma had attended Shambhala Music Festival 
and stayed with a relative in Nelson a few years before she went missing. Her grandparents had lived in Nelson, so she was familiar with the area. The plot thickens, does it not, Maxwell? So this person who was alleging they helped with the search and their neighbor was one of Emma's relatives and they had a friend who owned... I mean, there's a lot of coincidences here for this individual, but if they're telling the truth, they're saying she not she lived, she stayed with a relative in Nelson years prior before she went missing and attended a music festival there, so she's familiar with the area and her grandparents also lived there. What do you make of it, Maxwell? Uh, very interesting. That's all you got? So far. Good thing you're doing a podcast on Emma Philippa. So the also this person also said that Emma's camera was found in her van in last year. Wow. So she posted this last year in 2018. And so she's saying t- last year. So 2017 is when the police forwarded a copy of her photos and journal on a hard drive to Shelly. I mean, that's that's what five, it takes five years to do that. The journal is thousands of pages and there are specific clues. But whether police are pursuing those leads is anybody's guess. They should be, as these clues might explain the green shirt guy and his reference to Emma as his girlfriend. Okay. Hmm. So someone also, oh, this person also said this. Emma scrubbed herself off the internet before she disappeared, so there appears to be nothing online that she uploaded. It was always stated that she never owned a cell phone. But if you take a screenshot at 1258 as she comes in the YMCA door, you will see that she has an electronic device in her hands, which is an iPod Touch, confirmed by the guy whose boat she stayed on. So she is keeping in touch with somebody via texting. Okay, the plot thickens even further. So she didn't have a cell phone, but she had an iPod Touch, and so she was texting somebody? So she was in contact with people. This is definitely a case that has so many avenues that have not been explored or investigated on. It seems like the police did not really do a proper investigation, and there's a lot more information to work with here. So, yeah, this is is all very, very bizarre. This is so bizarre. That also goes to the point that a lot of these, uh, these so the so called information that comes out early on, like she doesn't have a cell phone or whatever. If she had an iPod Touch and was texting people, that means they 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 should have known people that she texted, and they should be able to recover those texts, if not from the end of the iPod Touch of the people she was texting, if they were ever identified, if they ever came forward, if they're in the circle of friends that Emma Filipov had. You have no thoughts on this end of it. Um. I don't know. (laughs) Maxwell Army. There's also a famous photo that was taken in 2014 of people living on the streets in downtown Vancouver, which, of course, is a location where Emma was sighted unconfirmed as well. So nobody is convinced that it's Emma. I think her mother said that it was not her. But it's something that's been online, and it was... uh, She's wearing a similar bandana, headband, clothes style. I mean, she, it looks like she has a skateboard, though. So it's, yeah, I mean, it's just someone that looks kind of similar. And again, I mean, I don't know how it would be, it, unless she was found, whoever's in the photo was found to be confirmed 100%. We don't really know. Someone said that the photo was taken in a, in a part of Granville Street where they have backpackers and hostels and there's uh, young transient but not homeless people. So if she was living in the DTES area and involved with drugs, that's not specifically where she would be. But in general, I think most people agree that it is not her in this photograph. So another interesting point, we mentioned this briefly on the previous episode, the Nelson Royal County Mounted Police requested the transcripts of the internet with Emma in front of the Empress Hotel from the Victoria Police Department, but the Victoria Police Department refused to share the information. 
The Nelson Royal Canadian Mounted Police wanted background information, but Victoria Police Department did not provide it. Now, what could be the reason for that? It's just, I mean, it's kind of weird. If, like, the FBI asks a local police jurisdiction to share information, I mean, they'd probably do it. I think they have to do it, but it's just, it's really weird. So, it's almost, I mean... It's really bizarre. It's just, it's super, super bizarre. And there's all these unconfirmed sightings, which is a problem. But there's a lot of coincidences regarding the Nelson area sightings. I, I've heard of justifications where they are trying to protect, like, witnesses. Like, let's say someone was a witness to that. And, like, if you release that video, um, I don't know, the witness would be harassed by, depending on whose side they're on. I don't know. I heard something like that. Hmm. I wonder where there's not more information from these Nelson sightings. It's just, it's really weird. I don't know. All right, so yeah, still more to come and plenty more mind-shocking information to come on the upcoming episodes. We hope you enjoyed another edition of Mind Shock True Crime. If you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. You can check us out on Twitter, Reddit, and Patreon. Make sure to like and follow our Facebook page. Just check the description. And any questions, comments, theories, just leave them in the comments section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. And Maxwell Powers. We'll catch you guys next time. If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. You are listening to Mindshock True Crime. This is your host, Bruce McGuire. And this is the Emma Philippoff series, episode four, Behind the Scenes. So, in what is one of the most baffling missing persons, strange disappearance cases in history... That, of course, of Emma Philippoff. If you've listened to the past three episodes, we've gone deep through all of the available details, but there's more still. Now, there are certain cases with an underlying current of weirdness, of strangeness, of some kind of inexplicability that seems to dictate how the case was investigated, And I'm not necessarily saying this is the reason it's unsolved, but there are certain cases. When you've looked at missing persons cases, regardless of whether or not foul play was suspected, there are certain cases where it's, it seems like it's something more than just a botched investigation or just someone running off without leaving a trace. There seems to be a strange undercurrent surrounding certain cases. Now, on the surface, the Emma Filipov case does not seem to be one of those cases, whereas, obviously, a case like the Maura Murray case, obviously, that is. But what I have uncovered is something no documentaries have touched upon. For whatever reason, this is not being discussed. This behind-the-scenes aspect of the investigation and several different parties and authorities involved, this might be the reason the case is unsolved. And this is what we will be discussing today. As always, if you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Make sure your device allows your notifications to come through. Otherwise, you won't get them, as many are complaining about. If you like this particular podcast, hit the like button. Feel free to share it across social media platforms. Keep the awareness up because awareness is what gets cases solved or gets people to jog their memories or perhaps individuals might remember overhearing something from a different individual that they didn't think was related to or important to a particular case where maybe it was and podcasts documentaries websites anything that brings attention to missing persons or unsolved cold cases is beneficial in keeping that awareness up. Questions, comments, thoughts, theories, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings, leave them in the comment section. You can check us out on social media, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case and topic requests. 
I will try to get to all the cases that have been requested, of which there are dozens and dozens, but if you, if you want your case done within a short period of time, become a patron and support the podcast. We could also get out more episodes with more supporters. All right, so let's jump into this here. Obviously, I went over on how police are not revealing a lot about this case. Sandy Merriman, the shelter where MFL thought was staying, they're not releasing things. There seems to be some privacy issues, privacy laws, but we don't see this with other cases. That's that's the thing. Now, there's more to that. So, Sandy Merriman, of course, won't release confidential records in regards to Emma Filipov, not even to her family, which is, of course, problematic if she's an endangered person. Now, here's this is where it gets dicey, because if, let's say, theoretically, if she had an abusive family and she just wanted to escape, obviously a shelter should not be disclosing private information to possibly abusive family members. Now, in a case like this, where that doesn't seem to be the case, I mean, it's, it, yeah, it's, it's, it's really tough to criticize them. I'm going to go into other issues and legalities. So, do we know if Sandy Merriman shared information with the police? Because if they have a blanket privacy policy, whereas otherwise, if they did share info with the police, the police have more info, what's the deal there? Because the information that could have been released, which I'll be going into what some of that information could be or actually was, if certain individuals are to be believed, they might be operating for specific purposes. With, Of course, we see this in many, many cases where police withhold certain info on purpose, or if they do have a person of interest or a suspect... They want them behaving in a certain way, so they might actually release outright disinfo or just withhold information that they believe would compromise a criminal case or prosecution. So, of course, many, many online researchers, very astute, many believe that if all the information was revealed, not necessarily the public, but let's say a third-party investigative agency, like not necessarily a private eye hired by the family with private interest towards the family, but let's say some kind of objective third-party organization that's not connected to the family, they just want to solve cases, especially criminal cases. And if they make, they make certain determinations, they, don't, they wouldn't necessarily have to inform the family if whatever evidence leads them to believe that Emma did not want her family informed. I'm not saying that's the case here, but it would just... If that were the case, having some kind of a third-party agency specifically dedicated to disappearances or cold cases, I think that'd be beneficial for the public. So, obviously, I don't think many would argue that taxpayer money is not spent efficiently (laughs) in any country. But, um, yeah, I mean, obviously, if she was the victim of a violent crime, she deserves justice. So... What, what gets really, really strange is the conflicting information that police told Shelley, Emma Filipov's mother. So there were notes, and apparently they were spent 40, they spent 43 minutes questioning her. This is what they told Shelley. But they also told her that Emma was, quote, essentially non-communicative. So did they just berate her with questions for 43 minutes? That seems unlikely. So did Emma actually tell them certain things that uh, have not been publicly revealed? And do those certain tidbits of information, do they contain the keys to solving this mystery? So obviously her mental state has been the subject of much debate. I really don't understand why many people are dismissive of any kind of foul play because she was uh, in some kind of mental state. If anything, that would increase the possibility that she met with shady characters because looking to take advantage of her mental state because if she was disoriented, didn't know what's going on, as opposed to somebody completely oriented, completely sharp that might scream for help or get police or whatnot, we, you know, like, it, I don't know, it just, it seems weird to dismiss that people that, even if she's having a psychotic break, that that somehow lowers the chances of foul play. I will say this. I think it's either the chances either remain the same or increase the chances of foul play. 
if she's having a psychotic break, just my opinion. Obviously, that also increases the chance that she might have an accident. That doesn't, you know, that does increase those chances as opposed to somebody who's not having a psychotic break. But I wouldn't say outright that it decreases the chances that she met with foul play. So here are the possibilities. She told police she was going to someone's residence or apartment. Now, this prov provides another set of problems because she could be lying or she could be telling the truth. And why would this have taken 43 minutes? Another issue there. So, here's another thing I'm going to bring up. The library. So, we know Emma visited the library. So, we know that Emma, one of her favorite spots was reading in the children's section of the library. So, again, if she did have a stalker, that would be a good place because a stalker might be reticent to blatantly stalk someone in the children's section of the library because, I mean, that's pretty shady. So, I don't know how 100% corroborated this was, but according to the timeline that we went over and the official timeline, people place Emma at the library around noon. So, here's where it's going to get tricky. Because, supposedly, the library was not cooperative with Shelley either. What would a library have to hide from the mother of a missing woman? See, this is, this is, again, this this undercurrent, this thread of bizarre mystery. So, if there was some kind of upper agency involvement, did police or law enforcement of some agency tell the library not to cooperate with Emma's mother? Now, this, this can unfold many, many different ways. Do the police really believe Emma Filipov got away and she's safe and Emma either made up abusive stories about her mother or the stories are true and she somehow hinted that she didn't want her mother to know but would the police really go that far out of their way for the wishes of a woman who wanted to disappear of which they don't know if she successfully disappeared or not unless she has a friend in the department but we're about to go in a completely other direction in a moment because if there is certain information that could lead to solving the case, is there some kind of intentional subterfuge being promoted here in this city of Victoria? So here is a post by Shelley's mother. The Victoria Police Department tech department was sadly lacking. I convinced them to let me borrow it and took a friend who checked it thoroughly. It provided us with, I believe she's talking about the laptop here. It provided us with some names, emails, and numbers of friends and acquaintances. I got in touch with all of them without much success getting important information. The library was so uncooperative, rude, and unfriendly that it continues to boggle my mind. I was able to discover that she was researching Japan and had hopes of going. Also, the books most recently borrowed were children's books. I have those in my possession. It only tells me that she remained interested in writing children's books and have her dad illustrate them, or she was looking for a way to escape real life by enjoying the lyricism of these books. That was Shelley's post, March 20th, 2015. Although, I would, I mean, it could be a combination of, of the two of those things. So, yes, we do have the Japan trip that was supposedly coming up and all these things. This also points away from the people that say that she was just completely mentally disconnected from anything. And I mean, obviously, that doesn't really tell us anything. The human psyche is, is very complex, and obviously anyone anywhere within the spectrum of mental illness is... It's so large, it doesn't really tell us anything. But this is clearly not an open and shut case where you could just completely dismiss her as completely disconnected from the world. No friends, no dreams, no hope. Like, it's, it's clearly that's not her. There are other people that are like that, but that wasn't her. So we can rule that out. Uh, I'm going to read another post from a forum here. Shelley was also frustrated with Sandy Merriman. I can't believe what this woman has gone through in trying to find her daughter. Very good points raised. The shelter not only failed Emma morally, they failed her legally. 
They are bound by law to involve mental health professionals when serious concerns arise. They made the first phone call because of very unsettling behavior and were told to call back if the situation worsened, and it did, but they never made the second call. Negligence at its worst. Without divulging private info based on what they told me, they should have insisted on an evaluation at the time of the first call. I know now from personal experience that it is possible to remember things like your pin and still be in a state of perilous mental illness. Our brain fights to maintain, retrieve its power, its memory of highly important things. I often can't remember where I parked my car, who I last spoke with or about what, and yet despite suffering from PTSD and major depression disorder, I recall virtually every detail involving Emma. The brain is a complex piece of equipment and can kick into high gear when necessary. Emma's body language was strange in all the videos I watched, but not at all her usual not at all her usual demeanor. If she was running from something or someone, she could probably function well in order to escape her fears. It is hard to know why she would not have admitted to staying at the shelter other than the fact that the police might have insisted on taking her back. And again, based on what I was told by staff members, Emma no longer considered the shelter a safe haven. She started signs of severe paranoia approximately 10 to 14 days prior to her calling me. So this is a post, also another post by Shelley's mother. So here is another post, uh, another post on the matter by a different user. I'm wondering that too. Was it the shelter and people there itself that she didn't feel safe from, or was it a case of someone finding out she was there that made her not feel safe anymore? Shelley mentioned the shelter was concerned about her state and behavior approximately 10 to 14 days prior to her calling her mom. Since her records are sealed. No one knows why. It would be interesting to know if her change was brought on by mental health issues or by an outside source of distress. And I'm going to chime in here because who says it's not both? Why? I think people falling for black and white fallacies is, a, is why a lot of cases are still unsolved. Because if, she, if there are some possibly minor mental health issues, who said they weren't spawned from an outside source of distress and both were occurring simultaneously? Does that explain everything? I'll continue with the post here. The shelter must have a curfew for women to return by before they call police. It still boggles my mind, the timing of all these events. It's almost unbelievable the way this all happened. Emma's mom arriving unplanned all the way from Ontario within hours of the exact particular day Emma doesn't return to the shelter. And on the exact particular day, Emma purchases a cell phone and credit card out of character for her. And on the day, at least one concerned acquaintance calls police and they even speak to her, but she then slips through everyone's fingers. I can't imagine how frustrating this is for her friends and families. It's frustrating for me to even think about. So, of course, the coincidence theorists do have a lot to explain in that regard. Okay, Shelly also posted this. Just to clarify, Emma was not last seen on Burdett. That was a so-called error in the Victoria Police Department's first press release. To this day, I believe it was a deliberate lie created to exonerate the police for the mistake of misreading the obvious clues of Emma's distress and letting her go. She was last seen in front of the Empress Hotel blocks away from Burdett. Okay, so just to tie that in to with the uh, Sandy Merriman shelter, is this a case of both the shelter and the police basically wanting to protect their ego, wanting to protect some kind of malfeasance or irresponsibility that they exhibited either due to legal liability or just because they don't want to be viewed as incompetent? Does that explain everything? Or is there something far more sinister at work here? Big mind shock coming in a moment, but first, let me continue. Another post Shelley Philippoff made, March 21st, 2015. It appears that Emma confided in no one, not even her very best friends. She wrote thousands of pages in her journals, there exposing her fears, struggles, and grief. 
The little her friends knew of the hell she was living, they came upon it accidentally when Emma in their presence could no longer hold it together. Those instances were very few and far between. All of this was discovered after she went missing. Friends keep friends secrets, and they were begged not to tell us. I understand that kind of loyalty because you truly believe at the time that you are doing the right thing by respecting your friend's wishes. The shelter staff, however, had a legal obligation to help her, as did the police, and they did nothing despite the fact that they watched Emma descend into hell. Of course, these uh, posts are a bit difficult to read as they are written by her mother. Shelley posted this March 24th, 2015. All right, so let's look at more information here and get to the mind-shocking aspects of this, which, if true, make this truly one of the most disturbing missing persons cases ever. Apparently, Emma Filipoff was connected to certain individuals that were advocates for the homeless. Now, I don't know, some people use the word friend, other people use the word acquaintance, but apparently there's one particular woman who's an advocate for the homeless, and she met Emma previous to her disappearance, according to another friend of Emma's. Now, there were rumors that she saw Emma in the Fernwood area of Victoria, in 2013 with a male companion. Now, it's not really stated where in 2013. I guess, again, this is a rumor. I don't believe this has been confirmed. I'm talking about the statement. Obviously, there is no confirmed sighting. Was it confirmed that someone said they saw her? Is this some kind of secondhand information? We don't know. I'm only going through information posted on various forums by people who were assisting with the search and whatnot. So she went missing November 28th, 2012. She was seen that early morning, November 29th, which is, of course, the William witness who gave her a ride. He came forward in 2018. So, okay. So at some point in 2013, there was this rumored sighting from this homeless advocate. Now, of course, that could have been a mistake in sighting. She could have thought she saw Emma when she didn't, but we don't know. But apparently she was familiar with Emma. She had met her prior to the disappearance. All right, let's... I, I'm not sure if I went over this, but apparently Emma Filipoff lived with an individual who is listed here as Jay. She even lived in his hotel room at the Hotel 760 for an entire month. Apparently, she was good friends with this J individual. Okay, let's go through this tangled web of these unnamed individuals. There was also a K and a V. Okay, K was good friends with J. K and V happened to rent rooms on Pine Street next to the E and N trail, which goes out to Langford, where the credit card was supposedly found. Okay, does this mean that Emma was on her way to some of these friends and or acquaintances that she previously knew? The link here is that K was good friends with J, and K lives near the E and N trail, which goes to Langford, where the credit card was found, and of course the William Witness was giving her a ride in that direction. Emma had also met Kay prior. Okay. Jay told Kay that V had seen Emma in Fernwood with a boyfriend in 2013, and they were renting a room and a house there. V had also met Emma previously. So these are individuals that are all familiar with Emma who are saying they saw Emma. 
So this is very, very troubling because that means, th again, they're either, they're, they're probably not mistaken. So we're talking about either people who are definitely telling the truth or definitely lying. This is not, these are not individuals who only saw her on a poster well after she disappeared. These are individuals, friends and acquaintances that know exactly what she looks like. Now, what's strange is that they didn't name the boyfriend unless they did, and they just, this account does not have that. So, but these, one of these individuals is not far from where the credit card was supposedly found. Does that throw up red flags? What do the coincidence theorists say about this? These people are all lying. One of the theories is, of course, she either had an accidental death or she was killed by someone she knew, and these people are covering for that individual. That's always a theory in a missing persons case. Uh, obviously, most women in, in particularly are more likely to be killed by someone they know. So obviously, boyfriend is the number one culprit, but... If it's not a boyfriend or significant other, it's usually someone they know, friend, acquaintance. We cannot ignore these very, very definite FBI statistics that not only are undeniable on paper, but when going through all the cases, it seems like it really does play out like that. So it's not just a case of theory on paper. It seems most women really are harmed by people they know. If not, if not a boyfriend, someone they know. So, okay. I don't really know what to make of that. I can't dissect that too much. Obviously, the, this is all, these are a lot of different rumors. Are these people, I don't know these people, are they druggies and their sense of time can't be trusted? Perhaps Emma did have some kind of a boyfriend, but they place her in Fernwood, which happens to be where this Vicky woman, who's an advocate for the homeless, that she, apparently, Jay was familiar with Vicky, and Vicky had told him, because Jay told Kay that Vicky had seen Emma in Fernwood with a boyfriend in 2013, and they were renting a room in a house in Fernwood in 2013. Now, see, what, what makes skepticism jump out here is how did nobody else see her? If she's that close to where she went missing, I mean, there's people looking for her. There's people asking around. Or is she just staying shut in that room? Wouldn't the person who rented them the room, unless the boyfriend rented it, I don't know. It's, it's, it's bizarre. Obviously, theoretically, it's possible. It's possible. I mean, we do have cases where people specifically stay in the town they're supposed to be disappeared in because they figure nobody would look there. But clearly, they are looking there. So I really don't know what to make of that bit of information. So here's another very astute post, and we are going to get into... I mean, that wasn't even the mind shock. That's quite mind shocking, but that was not even the mind shock. I'm going to read this post from a very astute online researcher. In case she was really being stalked and people at the shelter knew about it, aren't they supposed to share that information with law enforcement? I understand that they're not supposed to speak about their customers, but I think that someone going missing after saying she was being stalked and acting like it should force them to speak. In case this was only paranoia induced by a mental illness or something else, then I think they're bound to keep the information private. But still, the way Emma's mother was treated by the staff from the shelter seems highly suspicious to me. Why not try and give the woman some support and comfort instead of acting like they did? Do they have something to hide? And the same goes with the public library staff. Is it simply a lack of empathy, or is there more to it? From what I gather, the issue of homelessness in Victoria is a sensitive one for many, and I get the impression that some people living there may be hasty to categorize and pick sides. Her living in the shelter would lead a lot of people to jump to conclusions, and they may not realize how harmful such judgmental behavior is. Furthermore, there seems to be a bit of a disconnect and clash between law enforcement and the shelters. There was, in 2008 anyway, during the right to sleep debate, 
don't know how it stands now. Emma Filipov knew people who were a thorn in law enforcement's and the city's side. This is very alarming. Is this why they didn't care about Emma or want to help? Is this some BS political posturing and vendettas? So before I unpack that mind shock there, before I unpack that, Let's let's go back to the issue of the shelter. It would be easier to write off, write this all off, if the shelter was simply simply wanted to shirk responsibility for Emma. So they're going to be rude to her mother, or who knows what what Emma told them? Either true or untrue, she might have told them things about her mother. We don't know. So they might have behaved in that way, or they simply didn't want to be looked at as irresponsible or wrong. They just wanted to sweep it all on the rug. That's a little easier to believe. But when you add the behavior of the library personnel and staff, see, that's where it becomes problematic. Because now we have the police, the shelter, and the library, which is in effect the city. It's, it's very, very perplexing and bizarre, and it's difficult to write all this off as coincidence. It, it's, it's very, very difficult. The other point I want to make about the shelter, is it possible her so-called stalker was a friend or a family member of someone who worked at the shelter. And maybe, I don't know, for whatever reason, they wanted to cover up that connection, and that explains all these things. I don't know. I'm just throwing that out there. This is mind shock. We have to explore every single avenue of investigation. Because if that's the case, and also particularly... It seems, if there was a law enforcement connection as well, that we don't see yet. But... Let's go to this citywide conspiracy. If Emma is friends with homeless advocates who are going up against the city, does this, I mean, in a lot of cases, cities do have lists of troublemakers. Did Emma make a particular list? And if she didn't, was her associate, like a known associate, this Vicky woman, it's, it's very, very strange. Did they want to downplay or not investigate? Or was someone actually directly involved in harming Emma that was also involved in the circle with the city? This, uh, this homeless, homelessness situation and, and homeless advocates, shelter, these individuals at shelters, associated with shelters, there definitely seems to be something that's missing in this case that's causing it to be unsolved. Is this the missing piece? I am not claiming to know that it's the missing piece, but it is interesting. I think, I, I do not think it would be reasonable to sweep this under the rug. But here is another poster commented on what kind of a city Victoria is for some more background information. So let's Look at this. Victoria is a polarizing city in a way. It's a university city and very progressive. I'd go as far to say one of the most progressive cities in Canada. But on the other side, there's a lot of old money and old English attitudes and some quite prejudicial undertones, especially towards First Nations and other ethnic cultural groups, such as East Indian or Asian. And probably more towards the drug addicts than the homeless. I've lived in both Vancouver and Victoria, and in Vancouver, everyone there is exposed to many cultures and people, and no one bats an eye. But Victoria still has this veal of ignorance attached to it. Somehow, for such a progressive city, it's strange. Also, Vancouver has a different type of crime. Victoria is a bicycle-friendly city, but notorious for bike theft and petty crime, mostly the addicts committing these crimes. Vancouver has the problem of the downtown east side in a small geographical radius, and Victoria has the same problem, but spread out in many pockets of the downtown core and the seeping into residential neighborhoods. The addicts and homeless of Victoria aren't segregated to a designated area like Vancouver where you can avoid it. They are all over, so locals and tourists can't avoid seeing it. You'll always see it downtown shopping at a high-end store. 
I've heard of locals who will never go to downtown Victoria, especially at night, because it's so wild. Sadly, I think most Victorians are just jaded from the constant sights and experiences, and many of the street people are probably judged, like you say. I fear for some of the people Emma may have encountered or possibly befriended. While there are good, healthy people living on the fringes who look after each other and share camaraderie and who choose to live there, there are also thieves, leeches, and users who will take from anyone generous or might have something they, that might have something they want. So, just a quick aside here. Is this some kind of an, a more innocent thread that's running through this whole case? Whereas, did police library officials. It still wouldn't explain the behavior at the shelter, but as far as the police and the library goes, and just this, the overall attitude in this investigation, was Emma Filipov deemed guilty by association with these drug addicts, hoodlums, whatever, criminals, and that's why the investigation was not handled the way it should have been. And, of course... Nobody wants that to be exposed, so they, it would, there would just be this ongoing roadblock in this case. I don't know, but let's continue here with the city. Supposedly, the friends and acquaintances that Emma had and stayed with were not users. But that's, of course, unknown. And this poster said, I think if someone was involved, they are intelligent and functioning in society. I don't think there was another street-type fringe person involved with Emma's disappearance. I'm hoping there was no one involved and she's just lost because of some mental health issues. Sorry for the long post. I'm just trying to give my experience with Victoria so that people can get a feel for the city Emma was living in. Okay. Was thinking today about all the tunnels and such storm drains, etc., that run under Victoria and couldn't help but think this could be a good place to get lost. So let's do a quick, we're going to do a quick aside here to unknown Victoria, unknownvictoria.blogspot.com. This was a post July 20th, 2006. Oh, tunnels. Monday Magazine did a series this week on exploring Victoria, including a bit with me about the much-rumored tunnels under the city. I'm flattered they considered me an expert on the subject. But the real pros hang out at the Urban Exploration Resource Forum. A lot of the stuff on the forum's Victoria thread is loony chat about how the city's storm drain network may have been used by satanic cults. But local UE folks have also done some serious exploring, especially the extraordinary Jay Peterman, and posted photos of their discoveries. As I mentioned in the book, a bona fide tunnel connects the Parliament building to the Douglas building at 617 Government Street. The UE guys got into it and took photos, you can see here. Although it's not long, there's also a passage under the Bay Street Bridge connecting the Raumax scrapyard on the north side to the cement works on the south. Purportedly, the remnant of a tunnel used by streetcars that came across the vanished Rock Bay Bridge and then looped up to Bay Street to cross over the Esquimalt. I suspect it's too new for that, but you can see for yourself here. A manhole near the Johnson Street Bridge leads into a flooded crawl space, which you can see here. Another crawl space under Craig Darach Castle is visible here. Since the city doesn't have many real tunnels... Urban explorers have been probing the city's sewers and storm drains. A dangerous hobby since they may trap carbon monoxide from the streets above. One of the largest is an egg-shaped brick sewer built around 1910, which followed the course of a stream draining from Fernwood's Harris Lake down today's Bay Street and out to Rock Bay. More storm drains also run out to Dallas Road near Mayfair Mall, and under the Ross Bay Cemetery, likely built to empty the swampland where Fairfield Plaza is today. And of course, there are the numerous culverts of Boker Creek, which runs all the way from Uvic to Oak Bay. An interesting political angle to the UE discussion is that many of the underground passages are being used by the homeless. 
because they're routinely kicked out of Victoria's public spaces. Last week, for example, the city rousted a dozen vagrants out of Beacon Hill Park. For all its apparent socialist tendencies, Canada has nothing like Sweden's Allemansrattar, a law entitling everyone the right to camp on any land for at least one night. So where are the homeless supposed to go? One solution was hinted at by a sympathetic letter writer to the Times colonist today who pointed out that Portland has a legal tent city named Dignity Village. If Victoria wised up, it would permit a similar encampment and dig some real tunnels to put the urban legends and amateur sewer inspections to rest. Some of these are really, really creepy, by the way. These crawl spaces and sewers. If someone was going to harm someone, these, these, I mean, this is right out of a horror movie. So in 2008, there was actually a short film, Under the Garden City, that was about these tunnels. And also on unknownvictoria.blogspot.com, there's a post here from January 30th, 2008. Tunnels exposed. This city pretends that things have been covered over and sealed up. John McFetrick says, pointing to the sidewalk. But they're still there. Standing in front of the Swans Hotel, you might think he's talking about its shuttered basement and its possible connection to the mythic tunnels of Victoria's Chinatown. But the 42-year-old filmmaker is also referring to the city's economic underclass, its homeless population. And as he sees it, both senses of the underground are intimately related. McFetrick explores this link in his short film Under the Garden City as part of the Victoria Film Festival. Tying Victoria's biggest social issue to its most popular urban legend might seem a stretch. Or at least it did until last December when several homeless people supposedly set a fire in the former Empress Hotel laundry tunnel under Douglas Street. To McFetrick, the incident proves his thesis. The fact is, there are spaces under Victoria, and they're being used by street people. And the city doesn't want to acknowledge those spaces or the people in them. And so the article goes on to say that some people say a lot of these tunnels don't exist. He's saying they do, but it's, it's all really bizarre. And that's actually... I don't see that talked about in the Emma Filipov case because there seem to be ties. If she's friendly, either a friend or an acquaintance with this Vicky woman who's an advocate of the homeless, she's got ties to the homeless community, homeless advocacy individuals who are at odds, butting heads with the city, which includes the police department, which includes libraries. And what does all this say about the investigation as a whole? Now, obviously, I don't think anybody's suggesting that they snuffed Emma Filipov out. Although, obviously, we cannot remove the possibility that maybe Emma found something out that she shouldn't have found out. And that goes for anything. That could be from a drug fr a friend of hers who might have been into drugs. She might have witnessed something. We don't know. But it, seem it does seem like they wouldn't necessarily be snuffing out Emma Filipov because she's associated with homeless advocacy individuals that would probably go after those individuals, especially if it was just an acquaintance and not a close friend, which is what it seems like, although I don't know. But has there ever been an official search in the tunnels or the sewers? Because some of these tunnels, the city claims they don't even exist, when clearly they do. I mean, there's these urban explorers going around getting photographs that are very, very creepy. It's just, it's, it's really bizarre. It's bizarre. Now, I, I haven't seen anything to suggest that Emma was familiar with the tunnels, but it seems like homeless people are, so she's familiar with homeless people. Would they necessarily know about the tunnels? And if this is all unrelated to the city or law enforcement, any of that, anything of that nature, if someone were to harm Emma and this, it was a homeless person that harmed her, could they have done it in one of these tunnels and would she have been found afterwards? People, so online commenters, do not believe that law enforcement have searched all these tunnels thoroughly, especially with some of these smaller crawl spaces, you would need, uh, you would need some kind of remote control. I mean, you wouldn't necessarily put humans down there. It's just, uh, yeah, it's rough.
another post relating to the credit card. The gentleman who claims to have found the card was staying in a Langford halfway house, but he claims he didn't find it where the police say on Goose Trail. So where did he find it? Did he actually find it? Or did Emma give it to him so he could buy cigarettes, which was what he was doing when the police were tipped that someone was trying to use the card which was flagged? Or did Emma sell him the card at a discount because she knew if she cashed it, she'd be located? The, f uh, the fellow has contacted Shelly and said he had nothing to do with Emma's disappearance. He claims he can't remember where he found the card, but then he contradicts himself by claiming it wasn't found where the police say it was. I mean, I'm not sure that's the biggest contradiction because you would notice if someone made an un like if someone said you said you found something somewhere, you might not know where you found it, but you would know whether or not you told someone, particularly the police, whether or not you found it in a particular place. So if you don't know where you found it, you would say you, you didn't tell the police that's where you found it because you don't know where you found it. I don't know. It's, yeah, we've, we've talked about this in previous episodes. I just wanted to add here that this guy was staying at a halfway house. So we have this common theme with the homeless and shelters. Is it just, is it coincidental that all of this is intersecting? I don't know, but it's just, it's really, really bizarre. And I hadn't considered the possibility, really, that if if he was a friend of Emma's and Emma wanted to disappear, I mean, I don't know, it, it doesn't make any sense any way around, because why is she buying a prepaid card if she wasn't going to use it? Here's another, uh, let me finish reading this post, because there's another piece of information here. If he can contact Shelly again and clarify how he came into possession of the card, that would go a long way to establishing whether Emma was actually in Langford. The police, of course, will reveal nothing, as it is an open file, which sits in a file cabinet until further tips come in, which unfortunately hasn't happened. Emma lived on the boat because the woman would see her crawling out in the morning from under the trees she was sleeping under, and so offered her space to sleep aboard the boat, which was very nice of her. So this is another witness who said that Emma Filipoff stayed on her boat and she also slept under trees. So we have multiple locations where Emma slept. So these are many different locations where she could have been noticed by someone, nefarious or not. But I still, for this, I st the, the homelessness thread here with homeless people, shelters, homeless advocates, is there something there? I really do believe that that lead needs to be followed up on and investigated thoroughly because there's something, something seems off about this case, and I don't know what it is, but is that the missing piece, just the attitudes of the city and police and the issue of homelessness. Is there something there? So there's a couple uh, th there's a couple more anomalies here that I will go over. It's just it's it's bizarre because either someone's playing a practical joke. I'm just going to go over whether or not if Emma ran away and she did not want to be found or were friends responsible or not friends and acquaintances, whoever was responsible, did they want to make it seem like Emma Filipoff was just a runaway and didn't want to be found? And is this the way to go about it? Because, of course, there were the reports that Emma Filipoff took down her own missing persons posters. So, again, how many missing persons cases do we have this happen in? In how many missing persons cases are there multiple reports of the missing, of allegedly the missing person tearing down their own poster. So, okay. The weed shop, the Blue Door, which is next to the Balmoral Hotel on Hastings, the guys in the Blue Door weed shop said they saw a woman matching Emma come into the store, took down the missing poster, she explained she didn't want the poster displayed. No confirmation it was Emma. My friend was friends with a couple of the employees of the Blue Door 
And they were the ones that explained what had happened with the poster we put up. That shop has since been sold. That's bizarre. Is, yeah, that, that's really, really bizarre. Because is there a tie-in with the green shirt man that was caught on camera? He claimed to be Emma's boyfriend and tore down her missing poster as well. Uh, these are discussion between these online researchers and people involved in the search. I am trying to pinpoint the name of the shop as well as the date that he did this. I am also curious if there were other posters placed in neighboring shops and if he tore those down as well. Why that specific shop? Could Emma have made a purchase earlier that day and she told him about the poster and he went to the shop to remove it? Was there footage from earlier on in that day? He walked into New World on Cordova with the poster in his hand. That's the video that the Fifth Estate used on Finding Emma Filipov on the Finding Emma program. He looked around the store at clothing and then left that store and went into Hit's boutique next door and gave the poster to the store owner to discard and claimed Emma was his girlfriend. I believe that was May 27th, 2014. Two years. Here's, okay. So here's the post on Facebook from May 27th, 2014. My wife and I, this from the store owner. My wife and I have a store in Gastown, Vancouver. So again, this is not Victoria. This is Gastown, Vancouver. And this afternoon we had an odd occurrence. We called the police right away and are still awaiting a visit from them to speak in person. The following is what we've shared on our personal Facebook pages. Urgent. Please, please, please keep your eyes open, Vancouver peeps. A guy was in our store and asked me to throw something into the trash. He handed me a poster that he had torn off a post that those searching for her obviously made and said, quote, It's one of those missing persons posters, except she's not missing. She's my girlfriend, and she ran away because she, expletive, hates her parents. I got a very creepy vibe from him as he looked around the shop, and after he left, I called the police right away. If anyone in the Gastown downtown commercial drive area today sees a guy looking like this, six foot white guy, short dark hair, bright neon green, quicksilver t-shirt, Long pants, jeans, bright neon, green canvas, converse high top sneakers, tattooed on both forearms, swirly outlines of flames. Call 911 right away. We truly hope your daughter is not in any danger and want you to know that we and our friends will do all we can to help you find her. We have acquired these photos from our neighborhoods, from our neighbor's security camera. We will be sharing these with the Vancouver police when they arrive to speak to us. Sorry they aren't the best of quality, but we hope they will help. All right, so let's back up a moment. So, Hits Boutique, which has since closed, the guys in the Blue Door Weed Shop next to the Balmoral Hotel on Hastings said a woman matching Emma came into the store and took down the missing poster that had been put up. All right. This is kind of weird, though. Why? He took down a poster, then he went next door and told the store owner to discard the poster. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 does that make any sense? I don't know if that makes any sense. All right. I don't know. Is this guy a disturbed individual? Who knows? That is kind of weird that he said that Emma hates her pa ran away because she hates her parents. Uh... This is two years after. I mean, did he know about the issues with her parents? Because Finding Emma did come out in 2013. I believe that's the most famous media regarding, uh, regarding the case. It aired huh, on cbc.ca. It says it will be aired Friday, November 7th, 2014. This incident occurred prior to that. This incident occurred May 27th, 2014. Mm. Just before the summer previous. Wikipedia says 
that The Fifth Estate was aired in 2013. However, when you go to the link in the Wikipedia, it takes you to the cbc.ca website, which says that it would be aired Friday, November 7th, 2014. So it looks like the Wikipedia obviously could be mistaken. It seems less likely that the official website of The Fifth Estate would be less likely to be mistaken about their own episode. So it looks like either this guy was following closely through news articles and whatnot. I don't know. It's, it's how did he know that she, it, that there were allegations of issues between her parents? I mean, I don't know. If he's written in newspaper articles, he could have known. Just a weird thing to say in relation to this case. I don't know. Then again, I guess most people who run away probably do run away because they hate their parents. But she was already across the country. So it's... I don't know, it's weird. There were also rumors that someone wrote found on the posters at the Greyhound station. At the Victoria Greyhound bus station. Not Vancouver, so back in Victoria at the Greyhound station in the early days of the search. Also, several witnesses reported her missing persons posters had been torn down in the downtown east side. A source at one establishment in the area believes she saw Emma ripping her own poster off the wall. Staff at a hunting fishing store reported a woman resembling Emma asked how to disappear, explaining she had a stalker who followed her from Ontario to Victoria, then Vancouver. Now that's a bizarre thing to say. That is indeed bizarre. Huh. One individual who operates online under many pseudonyms described Emma as a junkie living in the DTES, the downtown east side. He boasted standing next to her as she tore down her own poster, but would not provide more details and expressed no interest in the reward. It's two separate... Okay, this is, uh... Yeah. Two separate tips originated in Nelson, British Columbia, early in 2014. A hitchhiker matching Emma's description was seen on Highway 3 near the Philippoff family farm. The second sighting was Slocan Valley, 30 minutes away, where another Philippoff family member resided. And the sightings remain unconfirmed. I went over these on the previous episode, which was sightings. But, yeah, so... The, the tearing down of the posters and this, this guy with the tat- green shirt guy with the tattoos, yeah, I, it's, it's bizarre. But let me close this episode out with, of course, Emma's dog, Oscar. I don't know if I mentioned this bit before, but I'm going to do it again because it's very perplexing. Back when Emma called Shelly asking her to, co- to come get her, in attempts to keep Emma on the phone, Shelly had said, That's wonderful. When I get off the phone, I'll let Oscar know. Emma replied, Oh, that's okay, Mom. Oscar already knows I'm coming. Now, for whatever reason, that jumps out to me because if you're someone who's pretending to come home while you're making plans to disappear, are you really going to involve the beloved dog in it? Because why would you say that? That seems like a really odd statement if you're just simply lying about everything all the time or you're in a men- I mean, it's just... It seems odd to me. Oscar already knows I'm coming. So it seemed... Was she really planning to come home? And then, of course, the reason... The why reason from all this... Was it a stalker? Was it all these other issues? But it... Yeah, there's just so many loose ends and unexplained variables in this case. One of the most mind-shocking, I think, is her connection to these homeless advocates and the prevailing attitudes of city personnel. Can we just ignore that? Because, again, in other cities, you don't see this. And then, of course, we have the underground tunnels. We have all these different things that could possibly have played a role in her going missing, but as always, we don't know. And believe it or not, There is even more information in this case that we have not gone over that we will go over in the following episodes. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of Mindshack True Crime in the Emma Philippoff series. 
If you like the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell for notifications. Questions, comments, thoughts, theories, suggestions. Leave them in the comments section. You can check us out on Twitter, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for topic and case requests. And Facebook. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.
If you like audiobooks or audio shows, check out a free trial of Audible. Just click the link in the description. Welcome to Mind Shock True Crime. This is the Emma Filipoff series, episode 5, More Theories. We are going to examine even more theories in that mysterious Emma Filipoff case. And this is a disappearance that is, uh... Quite perplexing, for lack of a better word, and uh, like many other missing persons cases, of course, closure and resolution, obviously, for her family and for her, if she is indeed the victim of some kind of a crime, is, of course, uh, the goal in this case, as well as all missing persons cases and unsolved uh, cases. And we will be continuing the examination here in typical mind shock fashion with logic and reason at the forefront. I'm, of course, your host, Bruce McGuire. And if you want to help support the Mind Shock podcast, help get us, help get more mind shocking content out there and keep up awareness in all these types of cases, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You can also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube for access to exclusive streams and chats. Make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit that bell for notifications, like and share, Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Patrons do get priority for case topic, logical analysis, co-podcast or requests. You could also be a guest in the podcast depending on your tier. Questions, comments, theories, thoughts, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comments section. So I am actually going to go over some posts here by a PI just to set the stage here. Of course, if you haven't checked out the first four episodes, check those out because we lay the groundwork and go over all available information in this case. And now we are going to examine further still even more wrinkles in the case and other possibilities and clues not yet discussed in this case. So uh, Redditor by the name of Magnum posted this. I'm a former PI in Ontario. I have started investigating this case looking for anything that might have been missed. I'm doing this as a project in my spare time. Anything I find that may have been passed on or discovered yet to an acquaintance of the mother. I have passed on small things that I think might eventually be potentially important down the road. If anyone has anything that they want to know, please contact me. Want to let me know, please contact me. I have no interest in the reward. I just do this for two reasons. Just as a project, as I have an interest in missing persons cases, and I would like to see the family have answers to what happened to Emma. I am interested in any pictures, emails, and even hear about anything regarding her life and disappearance. I have been going through several videos, podcasts, and articles, all of which are very basic and repetitive. If anyone from the Victoria area has anything to add, please contact me. Thanks. So someone asked here, what what have others overlooked? Response, I've just looked at maps, possible paths or trails she may have taken. If she was the one, in fact, that dropped the prepaid Visa card. Been in the PI field and security industry, you also learn to read people's body language and behaviors. I pointed out that the bank card was found in an area across the road from a casino. I worked as security in a casino owned by the same company, Great Canadian Gaming Corporation. They often o offer free soda and coffee at their casinos. If they were open during the time Emma was in the area, she may have gone in to get a drink. Plus, they always have cameras inside and out. They may have caught her walking somewhere, confirming she was actually in this area, thus increasing the timeline and last known area of travel. However, it's up to Victoria PD to do this, but they are not very proactive in this case for some reason, and very reluctant to give or provide any details. And I actually went over this in the previous episodes, too, on how there's some shady business going on between certain groups in this area, the government, the police... I mean, there's a lot of shady business going on, and of course, that can uh, impede certain investigations, even if, um, again, I'm not claiming any government officials are responsible for disappearance, whether they are or they are not, even if they are not, there could still be some elements that just are not interested in pursuing this and will not allocate res resources to do such, possibly based on people Emma may have been affiliated with who had a pretty anti-government uh, slant or whatnot. Continuing on here, and I don't necessarily believe in the mental health breakdown. I believe that mercury poisoning could be a very strong possibility. 
I urged them to find hair samples in Emma's belongings and have them tested. The symptoms are very close to action signs and behaviors exhibited by Emma. By determining this could change the perspective of how people are looking at the case. And we addressed some of that as well in previous episodes. Another post here by Kay Ann. Hello, I live close to Emma's hometown. I don't have any info on the case except what is known by everyone else, but I am very interested in your theory and would love to know more if you are willing to share. I think you make some great points and I wish the Victoria PD would look into it more and take this case more seriously. I wonder why they are so closed about it and not willing to offer more information or help. Kind of odd to me. Also, going back to the casino angle, yeah, you would think of obviously any legitimate investigation would have checked the security uh, at the casino. But not just that, but also interview people at the casino because if they do give out free drinks and Emma may, I mean, just knowing whether Emma would have gone in there, even if it was a different day, just to kind of establish known paths of travel and move from there and then try to trace that timeline or if anything else just find more people that might have seen Emma either that day or previous days just again just for more information the more information you have the, the more you can investigate another post here I wonder if anyone else have, has been to Colwood and asked locals about Emma or if anyone there actually does know her and confirm that she was headed there Ah, uh, this case just drives me nuts. I think the casino theory is very interesting and could very well be possible. I wish I had means to get to Victoria, and I would honestly do some of my own investigating. The cadaver dogs got nothing on the most recent search. However, another one is due this spring, I believe. I would love to get out there and help. And these are old posts, so not recent. Magnum responded, if you do a search for Emma, I have posted quite a bit, plus I have offered a few theories. I don't publicly release all information I come across as I don't want to steer possible scenarios in the wrong direction until I can confirm and research many of my own findings. When I do find something or I have a sound theory, I notify the Find Emma Instagram page. Okay. So another poster wrote this, uh, user right place, W-R-I-T-E. The privacy laws have been a stumbling block for sure, but I can see how important they are, especially in this case. There is info that just can't be released for Emma's sake. There are clues in the journal, which the search team was privy to, specifically a page labeled first day of spring 2012. It's a massive clue. Not sure who are you referring to that lives in Victoria and knows her. Chances are the search team has spoken with him. It should be noted that before Emma went missing, she lived in Campbell River, but also Karema, Karemos and spent a brief time in Nelson, British Columbia, where she attended Shambhala. She had relatives there and several reports of a hitchhiker matching her description reported to RCMP summer 2013. She could be anywhere, especially if the green shirt guy does know her and he has status. She has a serious interest in native culture. So... I don't know if we talked about that extensively, the interest in native culture and how that might affect if she did make it out of the area and where she would be staying after all of this. Is there a native connection we don't know about or other native friends? And she might even possibly be staying uh, on a res reservation or something like that. Now, I couldn't really find any info on Native American connections, but if she is happy and living on on some kind of Native American reservation, or was for a period of time, and then, you know, got in a certain position or place where she could have moved on again, all according to her own will. Perhaps it's all by design, and she asked for those, you know, the people that helped her, if, again, this was connected to some kind of Native American angle, to not reveal this information. So, if that's the case, I mean, that could possibly explain that. But here's something we haven't talked about, and this has actually bothered me for... Uh, for quite some time, there's there's a there's a timeline issue here. So, I've talked about the van, and I I do think that figuring out the van situation is critical in the timeline. Again, whether she disappeared of her own volition or something bad happened to her, or again the theory that she did disappear of her own free will, everything was fine, and then however whatever period of time later, if she was harmed, it was way 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 later, months later. So it has nothing to do with the specific uh, instances in the time immediately preceding her disappearance. Although again, I wouldn't. Bet on it again i'm not claiming anything is true or untrue this is mind shock where the only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure but emma Philipoff 
has technically been missing since November 28th, 2012, from the front of the Empress Hotel in Victoria, British Columbia. November 28th, 2012. So, in her possessions, in the van, is her Canon 40D, a semi-pro DSLR that was a gift from her mother. On the camera card, several por several portraits. So the last ones were taken in spring 2012. So she hadn't used it since spring. So she goes missing November 28th. These portraits taken, uh, actually the latest one, supposedly June 3rd, 2012. If the data is accurate here. We have May 16th and June 3rd. And then nothing for months. So it's kind of, I don't know. That, that, that seems to be a little bit of an issue. Now, did she have another camera? Or this was the nice camera, but why? So it's in her van. Would she really leave without her possessions? That's another issue there. Or was she just so frustrated she couldn't get the van back? There was a tow situation. We went over all these uh, possibilities. She's trying to get the van back. I mean, we went over this in the previous episode, so check those out. There could be issues there. But, yeah, there's, there's a little bit more info here on this November 28th, 2020 article on VancouverIsland.ctvnews.ca. Uh, Have you seen Emma Filipov? New photos released on eight-year anniversary of her disappearance. And also, Ontario cold case search spans the country for missing Emma Filipov, Orangeville.com. This is from September 5th, 2019. Some excerpts here. In the days leading up to Emma's disappearance, Kimberly learned a lot of her movements, including one of her last entries in Emma's journal dated November 23rd, 2012. Sleep deep hurts. Checked myself out. Mom is coming. It's November 23rd. Have to get home before dad goes. I want to call dad. You're going home tomorrow. According to Shelley, Emma's father, James Philippoff, an artist, keeps to himself and hasn't talked to anyone about the search for his daughter after a CBC Fifth Estate episode, which aired December 23rd, 2014. He doesn't want to talk about it, Shelley said. And again, before people jump on that, like maybe he does know what happened and Emma left of her own free will and he knows that, whatever, or again, if this affected him that deeply, he doesn't want to talk about it. I mean, both scenarios are clearly very plausible. I mean, and you see both in missing persons cases, so. James did say on the television broadcast that whatever happened to Emma, he hoped it was her choice. And again, so he didn't completely never talk to anybody ever. He did make that statement. It's also possible she might have contacted, if she, disapp if she disappeared of her own free will, uh, she may have contacted him since then, after, 20, after his appearance on the Fifth Estate. So, or these interviews, wherever these quotes are taken from. So these, uh, that's a possibility as well, and he didn't want to talk after she had contacted him and told him not to talk about it. So again, we have many different possible scenarios here. Emma's possessions. So... In the original search of Emma's van, found her camera, a Canon 40D semi-pro DSLR that was given from her mother. On the camera card were several self-portraits, the latest ones taken in spring 2012, which have been used in media releases and newscasts. She was a very adept photographer, Shelley said. She studied photojournalism before she studied culinary arts. She was working as a chef slash cook in Campbell River for three years. The only reason she stopped is because she has a congenital knee disorder and it was bothering her back, her back a lot. A chef is on her feet all day long. She terminated her employment to come home and see our orthopedic surgeon in 2011 and then headed back out west in September 2011. She hasn't been home since. Okay, so this little detail, I actually don't remember going over that. So here we do have... So we have a history here. So she wasn't afraid to come home. She had she had went home unless uh, unless some people the people that say that she had issues with the family, et cetera, et cetera. Unless some more issues happened when she went home then, but clearly at that time in September 2011, if this is all verified, she actually so she left her job. So she has a congenital knee disorder, and it bothers her back. 
So for the so what's with all of so again after she got this uh, so she went to see the orthopedic surgeon. What happened with the orthopedic surgeon? I mean, did they do something? Did they fix that issue? And then she was able to walk all this time after that. And if they didn't fix that issue, I mean, because supposedly she takes all these long walks. So I mean, these are critical details as well. Okay, another critical detail here. I don't know if they're reading from the diary entry that that PI referred to, but this is right at the beginning of Emma Filipov, the fifth estate. Her life is about to change forever. 26-year-old Emma Filipov is seen here on the store's surveillance camera. She comes in to buy a cell phone, but watch her. She's in no rush to leave the store. Pacing back and forth to the door, looking out. What is out there? Is she hiding from someone? Or is it all in her mind? Her journal entries reveal her growing fear. I feel like there's someone following me. A car on the hill when I rose and then drove as I walked by and paused in the street. I feel weird sometimes. I feel like I'm being stalked. So she feels like she's being followed and stalked. Now, here's the thing. A lot of coincidence theorists and these just weak-minded, illogical people, they think there's some kind of magical Dungeons & Dragons spell that protects people that might be having mental issues or drug issues from any kind of foul play in the universe. Like, somehow, all serial killers or people who are willing to assault criminal-minded individuals, ex-boyfriends, whatever, somehow there's some kind of magical spell that if she is having some kind of paranoid delusions or mental health issues, that somehow, magically, she would not be harmed. I mean, I don't know where this comes from. You see this in the true crime community. There's like, you know, a certain, uh, a certain Dunning-Kruger crowd that kind of facilitates these explanations where they're like, oh, no, no, she wasn't harmed because she's having mental health issues or drug issues. Like, if anything, that would increase her chances of being met by foul play. Because some of these criminal scumbags, they, they like weaker targets. So if they know that the gullible goofs will easily dismiss this case by saying, oh, it was a drug or mental health issue and not investigate, they know that there's a lot of clueless goofs out there. So it's kind of like the same thing how murderers stage suicides. They know a lot of the clueless goof bereft of logic and reason crowd. They'll just write it off. Oh, suicide, suicide, no need for investigation. Just like in cases where people might ha be having mental health or drug issues, which again, I'm not convinced that Emma Filipov was. And neither is this PI. Neither are a lot of people. But even if she was, does that increase the likelihood that she would be met with foul play at the hands of some scumbag? So if these, it, there's no date here on these journal entries that they're going over, but she feels like she's being followed and stalked. Now, she, she did happen to have this guy move across the country, coincidentally, who also happened to see her three times the day she disappeared. I mean, I don't know what everybody makes of that. We went over him extensively, this Julian character. Uh, we're not going to go into him again, but yeah, just if she is feeling like she's being stalked, whether she is or she isn't, there could be some kind of foundation there and not just hallucinations. Maybe they're just unwanted advances by certain individuals, Julian or otherwise, or others. Maybe there's more than one person following her around. Maybe one of them might possibly do her harm, the other might not, but she gets more and more aware. You know, what was that quote from Stephen King? Perfect paranoia is perfect awareness. So if there's one or two or three people following her, maybe not even really following her, but if she keeps seeing them, I mean, that would make anybody kind of seem suspicious. And then when there's a car or whatever she might just assume it's all the same guy and there could be two or three guys and one or two of them might be totally innocent per se or at least wouldn't harm her but the other one maybe not or even if they're all relatively innocent and they wouldn't harm her that could get her thinking this way and then someone else harmed her either way i mean that is very very curious and we do have to keep that in mind so there is an interview here. This was a uh, nighttime podcast, March 11th, 2021, episode 10, The Shelter. And in this episode, they interviewed Patty, a woman who stayed at the shelter and knew Emma Philippa. Hi, Patty. Hi, how are you? 
how are you? Good, how are you? This is like uh, returning back to 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 a lot of things. Yeah, well, let's say... So, I, want, I publicly want to apologize for insulting you yesterday so much. That's, that's okay. I have a, a what they call a thick skin. And I, I know that uh, I know it wasn't anything personal. It's a, this is a sensitive story and a sensitive topic. I was really insulting you. <laughs> I was very upset because I find some people that are doing videos about Emma. Hmm. And I got to you. That's how I, uh, and again, but you know me from a long time ago already, actually. Yeah, we've, we've spoke before a, f a few years ago when I was really researching Emma's story. I, I tried to, to contact you, but I think I think at that point you were um, just in the middle of moving, I believe. There was something going on. I know you're not originally from Victoria. How did you end up in Victoria back, back then? What, what brought you to Victoria? Well, my husband is from Canada. Um... Our children are half Canadian, half Spanish. Ended up in the shelter because he already had a car accident, so he had something in the mind to like distortions. I called the Ministry of Children to help me because the father was saying certain things, and then the father he acted like a gentleman so they took the children away from me and gave it to him for this six months period uh, when i was in the shelter and um i went um later they took it from him and because they realized from many people that uh, he ha he's not a bad person he just had a car accident and david would be normal and then he would have what they call it an episode every six months of doing this, right? Mm -hmm. like, beautiful man, normal, right? I, my family on that time was not like, like, oh, just get back together or just try to solve it. First of all, the Sandy Merriman was donated from a drug addict woman that owned that house. Okay. To the government, to shelter women she knew she already sheltered women she was a very friendly woman and I, so i was really like oh my god like like coming from spain like really uh <laughs> in so, spain you work or you die yeah. basically okay. <laughs> that's it <laughs> like that, that, that that's it in spain like in many countries the the shelters, they are, of course, they are shelters, but not like this. Mm -hmm. Some women live there two years, <laughs> coming in and out. Oh, wow. Okay. Like, in the attic is the woman that sleep in the night, the woman that are not insulting or that, and they want to recover, get another job. Um, I was thinking after talking to you that all the women in St. Mary men, you know, you know, we might have... Whatever, many reasons, mental illness, drug addiction, uh, severe mental illness, whatever, it can be many reasons, but we all have one thing in common, and that's that relationship with men. Okay? Okay. <laughs> so, um, maybe because of all this, or, or whatever reason, um, it's always that giggling of, of female girls sitting in the... Um, in the attic because the, the the ladies the ladies in Canada are so nice you know they're so nice like um, that shelter ha people that have really really problems with whatever their attitude but in the attic you had that jolly feeling when somebody came so they feel at home and talking what happened to you and they were really open you know Okay, first of all, Emma is not a girl that goes into shelters like all her life. I was first in the shelter. She was the most educated girl, maybe not only the shelter, but Victoria. Like, like she never hung out with the homeless in the streets. People come from Canada to, 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 to smoke meth 
and they're in the streets because of the weather. It's a nice weather. So, and you, I don't, I've never seen Emma. She would never be with anyone, basically. That's from the shelter. She so she was very shy. She was the proper girl that is very like conservative, you know. Like she's she has her life. You have yours, you know. Like those are private things. And she wouldn't say that, mm -hmm. but you know, it's like I I, I guess would be ashamed to just say it, mm -hmm. coming from where she's coming from. Hmm. So. I spoke about my life and I was really, really like trying to make her see or laugh about my situations. Maybe she tells me, and I do remember very well that she was coming because her. I, I asked Emma, why are you here? I don't remember. She said her boyfriend or, or I think it was her boyfriend, mm. but I, I, uh, someone was talking her and, and made her uh, stop. Uh, so that way she had to stop working hmm. she came I don't think she said stalking uh, but it was bothering her I don't remember the words I think she said my boyfriend or uh, I wish I remember well but it, it had something to do with a guy just, or, that she that she would, had a bad relationship in some context I think it was, she said it was her boyfriend was following her and bothering her and she had to stop working. Wow. She, she was there because of that. I don't know, the police must have access to the files because they ask us why we come in the shelter. Uh, and what kind of relationship did you have with Emma? So you, you mentioned you were like in the attic, was, it seemed like more mature kind of women living there and more stable. You met Emma there. What kind of relationship did you have? Would you consider her your friend? A friend, not even an acquaintance. Because uh, I mean, I had a connection with her because I'm also vegetarian, turning into vegan, went very hard. <laughs> and she was exceptionally beautiful. So uh, you don't need to be an artist to recognize beauty, like. Um, and all the girls too, like in the kitchen when they're, they're eating and then Emma comes to make her rice and her food and we would just look at her like, what are you doing in here? You come from a fairy tale because she has that like whimsical something about her that's very like, I mean, in the scenario, especially of the shelter because the, the, the woman there. 80% look very ugly, like non-care, they, they just gave up, whatever. She had the thing that was like, here I am, well, and they're up here, but you know, it's, you know, you're humans too. Something like that. She wouldn't say it, but you could see her goodness in, in her. People calling her hippie and all this, like, no, Emma was not a hippie. Like, she looked like a lady that could be married today. What, like as far as the way Emma was, what was your impression about her lifestyle? Like you had told me, you don't believe she was living a life of homelessness. Did you have any sense of what her life was like outside of the interactions you'd have with her in the shelter? She absolutely looked like someone who was running away. She, she, you know, more or less you could tell by the the, the characteristics. But she, she was very like afraid that's not no she's not the girl that you would see in a shelter at all okay and you had explained to me um you felt like this was a vulnerable time in emma's life is when you say that is there any particular thing about her that you felt made her vulnerable like uh some people would say that that believe emma was mentally ill would say she was vulnerable because of you know, illness. Um, but I know you don't I'm believe. I'm not a psychiatrist. To... I'm not a psychiatrist. I hope you find a psychiatrist to give you more or less an idea mm -hmm. of what the picture was. Yeah. Did you feel like she was someone that maybe was not safe for, for some reason? I'm not saying Emma had mental illness because what she was put through, let's see who would end up with fear. Yeah. 
So, um, it's like you're going to see a movie, a horror movie, and then you, the woman is uh, whatever, looks crazy, right? And now everyone's saying that, the, you know, like, the, that woman is crazy. Mm -hmm. That woman in Canada, no, I don't know, in Victoria, everybody says that people have mental illness like it's normal. In Spain, only a doctor says that. Mm -hmm. Like, people don't say that about anyone. Yeah, I, we're naturally crazy also, so we allowed our part of ourselves to be in the to, to talk nonsense in our arts. So we have sympathy about letting ourselves be loose. In Canada, in Canada, it's like everyone has to be really nice, and and then you have if somebody is looking at the stars or pushing the lifts in the fall because they love nature. Like, I really want to be here just to say how much I hate Canadians for that. Yeah. And now, Americans in YouTube. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. Calling Can this beautiful, innocent girl, like, oh, this is Italy. Oh, yeah, because, oh, like, oh. But, like, what is that? Mm -hmm. It's so disgusting. Yeah, and that's something you made really clear to me from the beginning is you don't believe that Emma was suffering from any kind of me mental illness. Um, I, but you also mentioned I think to me, she had her reasons to be suffering or, mm -hmm. you know, like. You know, there, there's an, a part of Emma's story that you were involved in and you were there for that I really want to hear you talk about. And that is that in the days just prior to Emma's disappearance, it seemed like she was considering going home to her mom in Ontario. And then there was her, the plan for her mom to come and get her. There was some, there's some debate about whether Emma knew that her mother was coming and if she did know how she yeah, found Emma out. Yeah, Emma knew she was coming. Emma knew, okay. I was, I was, I was worried for Emma because I could see her state was, I don't know, like Jesus. <laughs> Let, let's say what Jesus says, I'm not of this, my kingdom is not of this world. Something like that. Emma was somewhere else. Emma was in another world, okay? She was taking the sunshine. I do meditation, okay? Mm -hmm. I've been in India, I've done meditation for 40 years. I could be then four hours in silence. And I know she was not in this world. You know, I'm coming with my files, like if I'm uh, trying to get my kids and she's taking the sun. I'm not going to say that's mental illness to be in another world. She's, she's enjoying the sun. She was with no drug addicts, never hanging out with anyone. Talk, she, that was natural. Maybe created by the mind <laughs> or lack of, I don't know. She slept always in the shelter world. Okay. Mm -hmm. What takes to the man to flip is all those triggers. Putting her in the streets, she is being followed by someone. She, she, she. The, you know what happens when if I'm screaming and threatening to you, that, that stays here. Mm -hmm. That stays here, again and again. So a way to to sometimes avoid crisis is just to disconnect, man. You know. Just, huh. Uh, go try to be positive. Well, look at the sunshine. I didn't know anything. I just really thought um, this is the, the tree in front of the courthouse and you cross the street and there is Sunday Merriman and there is Emma sitting in the sunshine like a little Buddha, you know. The volunteers call her the golden girl. Um... She was, you, you could see her, her face totally delighted. She w we would share words because, you know, I would perceive her, you know, you, you just don't approach someone like that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you don't know if the person maybe, you know, is reading a book or it wants to be in conversation or stop the book or she wants to stop the sunshine. She was not reading it, but what I mean is that so there is a little bit of movement and then you know if there is a gesture i say hello so it w that was always like that you know when you're walking and you feel someone behind yeah some people do some don't emma would okay. all right <laughs> emma would so we have an instinct and um 
I told Emma to look for the library, to reach her family. I miss my family so much. As you try, you know, to redirect. I miss my family so much. I mean, they're so annoying, you know, like, because I could tell, like, uh, you know, like, she has to, you know, we're so different, my family, you know, things like that, because I, I know your pride when you are doing your life. You're young. <laughs> it's like, so you can imagine. Right? I have something dark. All right? I don't have any evidence. This is nothing she told me. I only told Shelly this and uh, some volunteers. Cause it's, it, this is talking crazy. Like, it's crazy shit. Mm -hmm, that's okay. All right? She, she had something that... I cannot talk about this because it's... She, she, I could see it. I could see it. I cannot talk because it's, it's not reasonable, you know. But she, when she was sitting there, I saw her, like, like, this is really, this is in slow motion. This, all this information can happen in three seconds, all right? But as I approach, but I'm telling you this, this is dark, okay? It's hard to say, but okay. So I, I felt like her body was, or soul was just not really like in this realm, right? Like this, uh, you know, like uh, she was disattached and she never has ever said anything crazy. Okay, what I'm telling you is my own uh, impression. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you that I have seen it not like a, like a person, but I have saw it like a force. And, she, and then she recognized she's blind, but she can't she can run away from it. Like she she's just is all, always there. And um, just, this is creepy. Okay, she look at me. Now she look at me like you know. Then I surrender, and I'm gonna be famous. Okay, this is creepy, but this, uh, Shelly, uh, Shelly, uh, Shelly has her, I mean, she, she, she says, yeah, Emma has that side of her, but I'm not saying it's mental illness, okay? I'm really telling you that's uh, like uh, something, uh, something, mm -hmm. and she could, uh, it was like she could uh, escape from it. In the day of her disappearance, like that morning or the night before, she was aware her mother was coming, as you mentioned. Did she seem like she was panicked or upset about her mom coming? Or did she communicate any of anything she about was, that? She was both. She loved the idea of her mother coming. You could see she had a good childhood and connection with her mother. And then she, like, skipped her eyes away, like, you know, but she, she never talked about, about anyone. Mm -hmm. But you could only catch by her facial expression. By then, she... By then, the change, like, all the... By then, her change, it was drastic. Like, the Emma uh, standing straight, she would be more like this. Yeah? Her physical position, like this... And she, she would have forgotten some things. Like she forgot that I lived in the shelter because I told her I could help you and take you with me. And she like kind of hung to my arm. I don't know if I took her, by, but she, I remember. But her physical position changed. She was looking for help. And she was not them. She, she started to talk, walk with plastic bags. Uh, up and down from the street of the shelter. They were worried about her. Mm -hmm. So she didn't remember in her mind state then, she didn't remember that I am also in the shelter, that I don't have nowhere to take her. That So she told me, yeah, can I go with you? Like, like, like she thought I had a home. You have one week emergency bed every three months, regardless if you're coming in or out, every month, 
I think you have to be out for one month. Uh, I don't know. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. But I know every month your bed is taken out. You have to go out. The other shelter is full of man, drug addicts, and, and it's, hor it's horrendous. Because they look like zombies. Mm -hmm. and they, uh, nobody cares. Was one person telling me, yeah, we're calling the mother, but this is out of the book. Because they, they shouldn't reach. I explain the Look, you have to get... I can't explain this well. I need to take some, some, some medication to relax my anxiety for this interview. It's okay. When, when I ask them for the bed, they say they're going to give her the bed, and I, I push forward. I said, she only needs food space to relax and recover. Like this, she could she she could not return. People like this could not. The mind could get stuck there, not return. She she was not talking crazy things. She was not. Uh, she was. I I know something in her mind because she didn't remember that I don't have a house to bring her. Mm -hmm. I understand. So, and her body and. I mean, uh, okay, they're calling her mother, but they're not giving her a bed. Like, what kind of protocol is that, right? So, okay, I come again with Emma. We are sitting the stairs that go up. The attic is the third floor. But we're sitting on the stairs that is in front of the office that is in the entrance because they said we have to wait. That I don't remember her name. She was chubby in her 30s. She was really like, maybe she was the one trying. And they had like something going on. But they make this way in the stairs, sitting there. And Emma was starting to retract more and more. When you and her are, are waiting on the stairs, how, how did it end? I understand. That was she... a scenario. And another one coming in, maybe, you know, like a, you know, like a rack, tra white trash. And maybe she has so many men and drugs. That that's just another ordinary day there to go there and complain to the office and then a third we're sitting there in the stairs waiting for what an emergency bed that they're going to kick her out in one week anyways mm -hmm. the fear was great you could feel the fear in emma and i was really like i'm um, how i'm going to do because i was also starting to feel afraid you know because uh, i don't want to lose her but at that moment, I, I could feel her fear because she was already, like, uh, retracting, all right? Emma didn't grow up in an aggressive environment to to deal through that, <laughs> okay? Which most of the girls in the environment were prepared to just be there. And, you know, you, you come from another environment as well. How, how safe do you feel? So, so tell me about Emma running out of the shelter. I've, I've always known this story of her running out and you chasing after her, but I've never heard it in any detail. Can you tell me about when she gave up waiting for an emergency bed and fled? So she runs out. I run after because I was sharing the fear of Emma. I was sharing the fear of Emma. I don't know why, but nobody was watching. No one, no one cared. So she runs out, I run after, you know, there's this gap of grass. Victoria has this beautiful grass that goes along with the walking street. I mean, in Europe, that's a luxury. <laughs> so I just, I just stop because I am really like, so I stop and here's in the environment. There is the walk, the, all this grass. The courthouse is here, and she's running straight towards the hotel where I didn't know she had her van or car. I didn't know she had one. Well, I was running after her, but I was, what am going to do? I wanted to take her, you know? I wanted to take her and just bring her back. But, you know, I'm a Spanish person. I'm not, I'm like an immigrant. I, I, I don't want problems with the police. And even it's illegal to take someone like that against their will. Mm -hmm. So she, she will return tomorrow, I guess, you know. Mm -hmm. 
but it was the fall so it was for me it was a moment also this moment that the time goes very slow and it creeped me again because it was like a movie i told you that was like she she had a uh, light uh, coloring clothes i don't know I don't know, gray, but with her blonde hair, she she didn't have a braid with all the shoes. So it looked like, you know, it was dark, the darkness of the night. She didn't look to the sides to cross the street, running without shoes. So she looked like a soul. <laughs> hmm. I mean, she looked like a ghost or someone that's not of this world i really remember like oh this is creepy you know like uh, she's beautiful um, I, I was like i know you will return and she she was like no <laughs> hey that but that was that was an impression like an impression she didn't say no i didn't hear no but i did think you know, like you will return, like. But what's the the thing? I think in her mind, she she, okay, the the social workers not taking care of me when I need it. I still today feel her fear from that moment. Do you How did you find out she was missing? Did you remember learning that she hadn't? Come you know, next day was the police there and the mother. <laughs> mm -hmm. It was the daytime. Uh, mm -hmm. and, uh, so I come, I think I came to eat because I would go there to eat. There was the police and there was the, the, the oh no, yeah, because she was moving things. No, no, like really, really. And I'm like, really? Of course, her mother was would be there. She would have taken her, like, you know, she would have even maybe taking her to a new place if she didn't want to go home, you know, or make her life, you know. The police is there. I was a woman from a shelter and a Spanish person. Mm. So it doesn't matter what, you know, it doesn't matter. The police never took my report. The mother at the time was kind of like shocked that her daughter was in a shelter. So I was another woman from a shelter. But uh, the, 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 the issue here is that the shelter lied about Emma moving things. Mm -hmm. They put her in the streets. They didn't give her a bed when she had the right to have an emergency bed immediately. Because mm -hmm. she was vulnerable. Why was she vulnerable? Because she's been stuck. She told me she's, she, she, that's why she was there. She left her job and everything because of that. The, the police believe the shelter because they work for the government. They believe the reports of the shelter. So they're they are looking at a woman that, you know, that, that it changes the world picture. Oh. The, the, this is a lie. The shelter did a big mistake here and the police has to know. The police has to know the real situation of Emma Filippo. This was not Emma. I think she had the right to be afraid. And fear doesn't let you think well, I guess, you know. Let me ask, like, as much as you know about Emma in her time just prior to her disappearance, have you ever come up with any opinion on where you think she is or what may have happened? Do you have any idea? <laughs> of course I know. I don't know, only have an idea. I will only need the evidence to take me there. So what is it? Well, I, I wish the police and the investigation follow the clues. It's too easy to see that. <laughs> it's very easy, even if you were not there. So, you know. Yeah, this was this has been amazing. You you answered a lot of the questions that I had I about about that period of time in Emma's life. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's my obsession. Well, there's no question that you were there at some pivotal moments, and 
you, you did the right thing by trying to get help for Emma. Thank you. Anyways, to Cindy Merriman, who gave me shelter. Um, thank you to the people in Canada. Thank you to the volunteers who are still there. Um, thanks to you, really. And for Julian. I don't know. Whoa. What? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. The you could be you could be so much to the world in this plane. I thank you for talking to me. Bye. Hold what? Hold on. What? Mm, yeah. What her exact yeah. words were? And I'm sorry to Julian. I'm sorry you could be so much in this plane. That's what that's Wait, what she said. is that what she said? Have you listened to that several times? Yeah. And it's when you it's it may have seemed like when you listen there that I kind of like jumped I just heard in thank you to up. Julian. Like I didn't really hear the I'll play the final part can again. You play, but, can you play that? Can you just play that again? Yeah, it, and it sounds a bit like I'm jumping in, but what ended up happening was there was a big long silence that I clipped out of there. Um, yeah. And it was to me, I felt like at this part of the conversation, it was over. It was over, but she was very clearly, like cautiously choosing her words. So I like I can only, th- in my mind, absolutely, she has something she wanted to say that didn't come out because it was okay well let's can can yeah. you footnote that because i want to come back to that earlier in the 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 clips too yeah cool so let's listen this to fucking that. I'm wild gonna, bird my french Jeez. i'm gonna listen to that part one more time yeah i want to hear that again play it again Love. Oh, okay one sec where we go even if you were not there so you know yeah, this was this has been amazing. You you answered a lot of the questions that I had I about about that period of time in Emma's life. So maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's my obsession. Well, there's no question that you were there at some pivotal moments, and you you did the right thing by trying to get help for Emma. Thank you. Anyways, to Cindy Merriman who gave me shelter. Um, That's so bizarre. Thank you to the people in Canada. Thank you to the volunteers who are still there. Here it comes. Um, thanks to you, really, and okay. for Julian. Okay, so did you know. ask her? Did you not follow up? Did you not ask her why? Thank I you, Julian. I'm like, sorry. Because no. that that sounds like a a. a uh, an acceptance speech like that's very much like okay so you did you ask her about that at all after like why you know how did you how did you know julian at least i did um she and where did it go from there she knew she knew who he was she knew the story um and i and i asked her if she was why she mentioned him when she was giving her thanks and she didn't answer that question like, did uh, she just totally skirt it or did she just go on? Talked about other unrelated things. Um, and I asked several times. And at this point, our reception was getting as bad as it was. And well, you're she like two was, and a half hours in. And like, we, okay. were, we were an hour and 40 minutes into a what was supposed to be a 45-minute talk. Um, but that was like a mm. really important part. So I, I, um, I tried to get more out of her. But really, like what you hear there is the the best that i had okay so from this interview with patty here we learn a bit we learned so patty stated she knew her mother was coming and that she had mixed feelings about it so she liked it and was excited on one side and then there was also some reservation patty also clearly stated that there's a or the general after the the interviewers that are interviewing her, there's no sense that Emma Filipov was having a mental breakdown or there were any mental issues 
specifically in that direction because, again, that's what it's been painted at from the outside. And a lot of people kind of latched on to that. But again, I never really bought that from the beginning. Now, again, I'm not saying that there wasn't a mental health issue. I'm just not, I'm just saying I don't see any conclusive evidence of that. So there's, there's no real reason to believe that. Again, the burden of proof is always on the positive claims. I mean, it's logic 101. Yeah, anybody could be having a mental breakdown at any time. I'm not denying that. I'm not saying anyone is or isn't. But if you're going to believe the positive, if you're going to, that positive claim, she's having mental health issues, she's paranoid, etc. Maybe, maybe not. But th there's just not enough evidence to definitively believe that. And it seems like every single person that's been coming out has been corroborating that. And the other issue here, so she's being kicked out of the shelter. That's pretty alarming. Is this part of the reason the shelter doesn't want to say anything? I mean, she's using the main office for various phone calls, Emma Filipov is. And so that's the reason she went out and got the burner phone. I mean, it's starting to make more sense now. She's being kicked out of the shelter here for these various issues. Now, again, Patty's English is not perfect, so some of it is a little bit difficult, and her level of understanding of all these things and, and being able to clearly elucidate her ideas and everything she knows. And again, we don't really know Patty's history. She seems like she's trying to be honest, though. So, I mean, again, as far as I can tell, it's just there's certain, obviously, roadblocks in that direction. She also, I mean, it's kind of heartbreaking to even listen to this interview on how scared Emma was. Like, she could feel her fear and that's uh i mean this is scary stuff this is scary stuff and so she's clearly distraught on on a certain level regarding this and there also seems to be something going on in the background that patty picked up on but we don't have exact details here because emma again she she's a private person uh, as described by many people so she's not just going to tell everybody her business so there's something going on in the background and it's very clear a lot of people do not believe it is a mental health issue so the burner phone that she's getting, or, you know, not burner phone, the phone she's getting so she could make phone calls because she's getting kicked out of the shelter, allegedly, if this is what is going on here. Now, on the Nighttime Podcast YouTube regarding this episode with Patty, there are some interesting comments here by Ian W., I think we have to take what Patty says with a grain of salt and understand that she may have negative experiences with the shelter, and so she may have a motive to dispute their narrative. That being said, I do believe her in that regard, because if she had a negative experiences with the shelter, it makes me believe that some shady stuff was happening there. It makes perfect sense to me that they made Emma look disruptive via moving furniture out into the street as a means to justify giving her the boot. And, I mean, that's really messed up. Someone should dig into their policy surrounding disruption. In terms of after she fled, to me it's a no-brainer why she picked up a prepaid credit card and burner phone. She obviously didn't want her movement to be traced electronically, but also because she no longer could use the office phone at the shelter. The bigger question is, who would have access to her accounts to see where purchases were made? It's not uncommon for millennials to be supported by their parents late into their 20s, and given her lifestyle, I imagine her parents supported her financially to some degree. Perhaps she didn't want her parents tracking her whereabouts throughout her credit card statement. Since she had no address, the bill may have been sent to her parents. All signs point to her avoiding her parents in my mind. She knew her mother was coming to pick her up. I personally believe she was like, okay, I'm going to go get a room at a hostel or hotel for the night, and she wanted to use an alias. I'm reaching, maybe, but that's what I think. There's nothing there to suggest she didn't anticipate being around anymore. She borrowed library books, meaning she intended to read them and return them. She left her personal belongings in her van and bought a phone, obviously, for future use. I wonder if the phone was ever used. Now, Miss Bean respond or uh, M Bean responded here. She picked up the credit card and prepaid phone before trying to get a bed at the shelter. The prepaid phone has never been used. They investigated that. It's only the credit card that supposedly an alcoholic used some days later, who first claimed to have found it at the Wand Center and then said he had no idea how he got it. So there, some people are disputing this because, yeah, I mean, we really don't know the timeline of the shelter, though. Did she really pick up the uh, prepaid card and phone before the issues at the shelter? But we really don't know. 
I mean, I just another heartbreaking comment here from Suzanne. She tried to call her mom for help a few times. Even though she tried to fix her problems herself, she seemed to be in that place that she could not get around the fact that she needed help. I think she purchased the phone so that she could contact help, her mom, whenever it would get too bad. Unfortunately, it seems she never got the chance to call for help. And after learning that her mom was coming, she was relieved, but maybe her irritation came from the fact that she was worried about someone hurting her mom. And thus, she planned to leave somewhere safe and then calling her mom. And that's, I mean, yeah, that that's a crazy theory. And, and th thus, even more heartbreaking on how, if that's true, that means Emma Filipov was, of course, thinking of the needs of others ahead of her own. And also that there may have been someone in her life or more than one someone who was stalking her or possibly trying to harm her. Or at least she thought that that was the case, even if it wasn't. Huh. Pamela has a comment here. She was very frugal, hence she would never spend hundreds of dollars on a hotel room. It's most likely the reason that she stayed at the shelter. I have a friend with over 400000 in her bank account, and she will sleep in her car while traveling. Interesting comment there from Pamela. Angie posted that Patty is suspicious. Again, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's a lot of issues here. The shelter does seem to be pretty shady. I'm going to go over another issue here. This is uh, also from Reddit several years ago. Someone posted this. Wasn't there talk of her working for an escort agency or taking an interest in that kind of work around the time she went missing? Also, someone mentioned her seeing her in Spain with the exact location. That information has been quickly removed, but why? Again, I'm not claiming any of this is true or untrue. These are just posts on Reddit. Renee posted this. Yes, Charlie's Angels Escort Service. There was mention that she may have been in contact with this place or people the afternoon of her disappearance. Also, Charlie's Angels was mentioned in her emails and or journals. And is this... One of, the sm uh, one of the smoking gun pieces of evidence the PI was referring to. And, and yes, there are many things that suddenly go missing from the Facebook page, Help Find Emma, if people ask too many questions. If they have theories that do not coincide with what the mother wants to portray of Emma. All I am saying is that there is a lot of very important information being hidden, which is absolutely crazy. This information could be the key to finding Emma. Many people from many walks of life involved in different ways. All these people putting their thoughts together and bumping ideas uh, off one another is fabulous. Unfortunately, it isn't allowed to happen. Only if you agree with what the mother wants are you allowed to make comments. The mother is hiding information and trying to control how Emma is seen and what information is out there. She pushes mental illness and a loving relationship. Emma left home at 16. Her and her mother have not seen each other in person for well over a year. They hadn't even spoke on the phone for over a year up until days prior to the disappearance. The mother is making it out to be that the family was all butterflies and roses. It was dysfunctional. The brother was involved in heavy-duty drugs and the drugs being hidden in the mother's home without her knowing? Question mark. The father marrying a girl younger than Emma. Is that true? There are so many possibilities, so many hidden secrets. It is unfortunate when hundreds of, if not more, people have dedicated years or months to Emma's search only to be told partial truth. It is a waste of people's precious time. If Emma is to be found, the mother is the key. She needs to let out the truth and trying to control what people think of Emma. Emma was an artsy, creative, wandering soul, not a family-oriented person, as the mother says. And where was the family? Why have the siblings, father, or extended family ever helped with search efforts? Question mark. And do we know that they haven't? I mean, I don't know. It would be curious to get more information from other friends and relatives of Emma back home and if they, you know, what they say. Here's another cryptic post on the Help Find Emma Filipoff page. This was posted in 2014. I was in the shell I was there in the shelter and I have tried much to bring consciousness about her state. She had a mental breakdown and day by day more paranoia. If the other is aware if the way she truly wanted to run away and was so afraid, she wanted her mother to come and in a second she was very afraid. And it is the truth no one has listened to me. She would not go to a male's shelter, she avoided men. She was running away for her freedom, running away from something, and I will bring 
discrimination for the system and the way mental health, social workers, and even parents don't find healthy solutions to people who are touched by a certain divine or they are much different and possible to control, caregivers and institutions make it worse. I was enchanted by the beauty of this girl and wished to care so much for her and no one listened. Perhaps so difficult to understand. Emma did not belong to this earth, social reality. She was in a realm of sunshine, taking sunshine under the tree before that breakdown. Emma did not consume any drugs and never hung out with anyone that did. She went to the gym as I had told her to go. I did not wish her to be among the people in the shelter. Now the mother asked for her daughter, I asked for truth, and to advocate for new laws in the system so people like her don't have to end in this way. When she vanished running before my eyes, I could not believe what I had been seeing, but I had been seeing an angel, an angel tortured by something against her nature, and she would not give her nature away. All my respect and wishes of glory to see her reunited with such a beautiful daughter, I could tell she was a very well-educated young female and came from much love. I'm sorry, I'm so sorry to not know where she is. And thank you for this space. The ladies from the shelter wanted to reunite every month before the Empress just to pray for her return. I was helping to organize this event, but I'm not in Victoria now. Okay, so it doesn't seem like English is this person's first language. So she was at the shelter, but she didn't want Emma to be among the ladies in the shelter because some, I mean, why? Was something weird going on in the shelter? But then again, or by the people who run the shelter and not the people staying at the shelter. Is that what that means? Because she's saying that she helped organize events from the ladies from the shelter that reunited. So is did she mean that the people running the shelter are the people that she didn't want Emma to be part of or around? What does that mean? So, okay, this is mind shock. So I am going to float this last dark theory here. Is it possible that one individual, or possibly more than one, at the women's shelter was possibly procuring women for the escort service? Or served as some kind of liaison? Not necessarily against their will, but just offered options for money, which is, of course, I mean, I don't know, that's probably not a good thing to do to people who are you know, in that state in their life, because, I mean, I don't know, it's just, it's so weird, the whole thing's so weird, or were they coerced into some kind of escort services, and for the, for the, for the people, for the women who were staying at the shelter that possibly know of this link, if there is a link, again, I'm not alleging there is or isn't a link here, but if there is, or maybe possibly Emma was considering it, ultimately refused whatever, which caused some issues, and then they wanted to harm her because of that. Or maybe they were just trying to strong-arm her in the first place into this line of work that she didn't want to be in. Is that a possibility? Or did she unknowingly find something out about the shelter and their connections to something possibly criminal, or if not criminal, at the very least shady? Is that a possibility? And they used any excuse they could to just kick her out of the shelter at that point. I, and how much do we really know of, of, like, all these activities at the shelter at all in the first place? I mean, it's just, th this is such a major question mark, and the fact that investigation wasn't done. Now, if you want to go really crazy on the corruption conspiracy angle, if the police know about it and they're getting kickbacks, of course they're not going to investigate this. Now, to all the coincidence theorists that say that would never happen, I mean, come on. <laughs> Unfortunately, there is corruption within police and government agencies, and it does involve human trafficking. Again, in the post-Epstein era... The post Jeffrey Epstein, Jill Zane Maxwell era, coincidence theorists really don't have a leg to stand on while trying to pretend and hallucinate that this kind of corruption can't and doesn't exist. So if there is some kind of shady corruption situation with shelters, not just that one, but other shelters and possibly the police and possibly, I mean, this is like, this is just like a really, really scary conspiratorial movie because the police that talk to Emma... So they never released that, in, they don't want to release any information on Emma or that case. Is that because there was some kind of situation between the shelter and possibly an escort agency and possibly some kind of connections to crime which may or may not intersect uh, political areas? Is that a possibility? This is mind shock. The only thing we know for sure is that we don't know anything for sure and the truth is not afraid of investigation. So I'm going to leave everyone with those thoughts to ponder on just more theories. 
on what could have happened. And I still, I, I think the shelter and the van and the situation with the van and her belongings in the van, I think those are the two critical pieces. I mean, there's many others, obviously the friends, friends she might have stayed with and apartments and some of their stories don't make sense. I went over that in the previous episodes. There's a lot of weird stuff going on in the case. Now, and I'm not saying the weird stuff is directly connected to disappearance. I'm, I'm saying it's difficult to know which weird stuff would be connected. It's kind of hard to say none of the weird stuff in any of these issues are connected. I mean, it's, it would seem at least one of them would be the avenue that would be connected to her disappearance. And, uh, yeah, so I'm going to leave you guys with that. Hope you guys enjoyed another edition of the Mind Shock podcast in the Emma Philippoff series. If you enjoy the podcast, you can donate to our PayPal. Just check the link in the description. You could also become a YouTube member right here on YouTube. Help support the channel that way. Make sure you subscribe, like, and share to Twitter, Facebook, Reddit, Patreon. Questions, comments, do stuff, suggestions, rebuttals, debunkings of any kind, leave them in the comment section. This is Bruce McGuire signing off. Catch you guys next time.